Good morning and welcome to the third hearing of Portfolio Committee Number 8, Customer Service for the Inquiry into Budget Estimates 2024-2025. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the land on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. My name is Emma Hurst and I am Chair of the Committee. I welcome Minister Chantavong and accompanying officials to this hearing. Today the Committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolio of better regulation of fair trading, industry and trade, innovation, science and technology, building and corrections. I ask everyone in the room to please put their mobile phones to silent. <coughs> Parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses in relation to the evidence they give today. However, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of the hearing. I urge witnesses to be careful about making comments to the media or to others after completing their evidence. In addition, the Legislative Council has adopted rules to provide procedural fairness for inquiry <coughs> participants. I encourage committee members and witnesses to be mindful of these procedures. Welcome and thank you for making the time to give evidence today. All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Minister, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you have already sworn an oath to your office as a Member of Parliament. And Mr Head, I will also remind you that you have already been sworn before this committee during this inquiry and therefore do not need to be sworn again. For all other witnesses, could I ask you to please state your name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation. And I'll begin um, on my far left. Thank you. So I am Natasha Mann, the Deputy Secretary of Fair Trading and Regulatory <laughs> Services and also the New South Wales Fair Trading Commissioner. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I'm Matt Press, the Acting New South Wales Building Commissioner. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Rebecca McPhee, Deputy Secretary, Investment New South Wales in the Premier's Department. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Michael Tipp, or Secretary, Department of Communities uh, and Justice. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, Leon Taylor, Acting Commissioner, Corrective Services, New South Wales. I swear the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Um, I'll now call up the other witnesses if they could just come to the spare microphone um, on the corner there. Uh, Dr. Anne Marie Martin. <coughs> Dr. Anne Marie Martin, Deputy Commissioner, Security and Custody. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Golosis. Jennifer Galuzis, Acting Deputy Commissioner, Strategy and Governance, Corrective Services, New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Professor Durant White. I'm Professor Hugh Durant White. I'm the Chief Scientist and Engineer for this uh, proceedings. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Ms Noonan. I'm Liza Noonan, Executive Director of the Fostering Innovation Branch at Investment New South Wales as part of the Premier's Department. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Ms Jones. Good morning. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Trina Jones, Rental Commissioner. Thank you. Mr Minns. Uh, uh, 
My understanding is that the committee was advised that Mr Minns won't be in attendance uh, today and I'm happy to take questions about that once proceedings okay. Thank started. you. Sorry, he was still on the list. Thank you. Um, so I think then we just have uh, Dr Rupiger. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Bernard Ritberger. I'm the Acting Deputy Commissioner of Community Industry and Capacity and Corrective Services, okay. New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, today's hearing will be conducted from 9.15 to 5.30. We are joined by the Minister for the morning session from 9.15 to 1pm with a 15 minute break at 11am. In the afternoon we will hear from departmental witnesses from 2pm to 5.30pm with a 15 minute break at 3.30pm. During these sessions there will be questions from the opposition and crossbench members only and then 15 minutes allocated for government questions at 10.45am, 12.45pm and 5.15pm. Uh, we'll begin with questions uh, from the crossbench. So I might start myself. Good morning, Minister. How are you? Morning, Chair. Um, Minister, as you know, there's a lot of people um, within the community who are eager to know about what the New South Wales government is doing to fulfil its election commitment to allow animals in rentals. Um, is there any update that you can give us on this today? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. As uh, members were well aware, the government has a commitment to modernise and to make sure that our rental laws uh, actually meet the needs of the growing community, which we know one in three people rent in New South Wales. Indeed, in some close areas, it's actually one in two. Now, I can advise the committee that the um, government's draft bill is currently out for targeted consultation, and it would cover uh, the, those that have been announced and other aspects of the government's rental uh, reforms. Um, thanks, Minister. Is there anything you're able to share with us today about the next steps and the plans going forward um, in regards to the passage of that bill? Yeah, look, so uh, it's out for targeted consultation at the moment. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing the feedback from our stakeholders because what the government wants to do uh, is to modernise, to so making sure that our rental laws are contemporary. Um, it's such rent now is... Uh, at a, a form of living arrangements for so many people in our community, given housing affordability issues as well. So we need to make sure that uh, our rental laws meet the needs of so many different sectors of the community. So it's not just young university students who rent now, it's young families, it's across different income bands, different life stages. So what we want to do with our rental laws is to give certainty <laughs> and clarity for both tenants and also uh, the property industry as well. I think the clarity in the rules, the certainty in the rules, actually helps the sector in general. And so once that feedback is received from um, the stakeholders over the ensuing weeks, other department will then uh, review those comments and whether we need to make uh, further changes before uh, we actually table in the parliament. But the principle is we want to get it through as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Um, Minister, are you aware of the issues with the Design and Building Practitioners Act 2020 and the exclusion of interior designers? Uh, yeah, yes, look, I've had a meeting with the, uh, the interior designers uh, regarding this particular issue. You, uh, members and Chair, you'd also be well aware that at the moment the building bill is out for uh, consultation with the industry and this will be a part of all the broader discussions as well. Um, so, and was that the meeting you had with the Design Institute of Australia on the 16th of May? Look, I can't recall the exact name, but I do know there are a number of attendees at that particular meeting. I they'll obviously disclose appropriately, but certainly uh, some of the issues that were raised um, regarding um, some some of the concerns about uh, the TP, DPB Act and the uh, associated regulations as well. Um, have you asked your department for a briefing on this um, and how the oversight and the legislation occurred in the first place? Uh, look, the, 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 we are going through the process of reform of the whole building uh, regulations at the moment. So the feedback that we hope to get from industry, I think, will inform how we actually take the, um, the building regulatory standards in going forward, which I um, suspect this aspect of it will be part of the discussions as well. And what's the timeline of that um, process? Well, it's, it's actually quite a significant piece of building 
uh, a reform uh, chair. I think mm -hmm. um, there's over 600 pages of legislation and that's why we want to sincerely and genuinely engage given the size and the complexity of some of our regulatory standards. So I said the principle really is we want to get moving on our reforms as quickly as possible. But bearing in mind, we understand and we are sensitive to the significant challenges, um, uh, to the significant challenge within the sector at the moment. Um, by listening and engaging with industry, we've also extended the time frame for consultation, uh, which is a way to make sure that the government continues to listen um, to the sector, um, to all stakeholders, so that we can actually get a, um, a draft bill that actually can really provide long-term stability and clarity for the sector. Uh, and, and it sounds like there's a, there's a fair bit of work to do in that and it might be quite, um, it, it might take some time given the complexity of that entire review. Um, my concern is that um, we've got interior designers that have essentially sort of been knocked out almost entirely and, the, and a lot of these interior designers are n no longer able to actually work in the field at all because of um, the mistake of leaving them out of the legislation. Um, I know an upper house inquiry in 2022 um, made a recommendation um, to ensure that there is a c category created for registration of the Design and Building Practitioners Act for interior designers and that recommendation was supported by Labor. Um, why has it then sort of been put into this larger review which is obviously going to then create a long time delay before this is fixed? Yep. Um, and it could mean, you know, that this whole sort of industry collapses, essentially. Well, I, I suppose part of the government's building form was to actually try to centralise um, all the different pieces of legislation into the building bill. Now, um, good policy and good legislation does take time, and sincerely hearing and genuinely engaging with stakeholders makes sure that we have a bill that is generally accepted by all sectors and so that uh, we want to prevent um, situations where you table a piece of legislation and, and make it pass and, and Minister, sorry to interrupt, and, and I totally agree with you on that. I, I totally agree that you need to take your time on, on the bill overall um, and because there's a lot to look into. Mm -hmm. What I'm concerned about is that if this one small aspect gets sort of swept up in that, and, you know, my understanding was that it was an oversight that they were excluded <coughs> from the bill in the first place. Um, that, to me, would be an easy fix. Um, whereas if we sort of wrap it up into this larger project, which could take months to complete, um, that that could potentially destroy the industry in, in the meantime. Um, I don't think that it needs to sort of go into that sort of much bigger piece when it could be done as its own separate thing because, I, you know, as I said, Labor had already agreed to that as a recommendation and inquiry. Um, there has been some recognition, I believe, that it was an oversight that they were left out. Um, and I don't think it needs to compromise good policy and legislation. Um, I think that could be done as a separate piece so that, you know, this doesn't continue for many months. Look, I suppose the first thing um, that I would say, Chair, is that now I would encourage uh, the association to make the submission as part of our consultation process. I am <coughs> mindful of um, that because it's a sector within the broader industry, it's better, I think, to really consolidate into one rather than do small uh, piecemeal changes without understanding uh, or maybe appreciating the broader impacts that you might have. So look, it's not, we, we, we want to hear from the Interior Designers Association. We encourage them to make a submission. Um, we really do want to genuinely hear from them. Um, and I think it's always better um, not to do um, single issue legislation, but actually look at the sector as a whole, because sometimes they, there are interdependencies um, between the different sectors and parts of the legislation. Um, but certainly we're happy to take, take, take that on board of their, their, their thoughts. Uh, I mean, I guess one other sort of thing that sort of really frustrated me was that, you know, the majority of interior designers are female, the majority of architects are male. Um, this piece of legislation, and, and I understand it wasn't your legislation mm -hmm. minister, I, I, I know <coughs> that um, uh, you didn't write that legislation or push it through, um, but essentially it pushed out 
the female dominated <coughs> industry. Um, and this industry no longer has a pathway to be no. able to do their work properly. Um, this is a big problem. It's not sort of a piecemeal piece of legislation to go back and correct a mistake that was made previously. It's just correcting that mistake rather than, I, I, and I don't see how it would have broader impacts to correct a mistake and just allow this industry to have a pathway to, to, to do the work that you know they're qualified to do. Well, look, certainly, Chair, I'm very happy to um, consider uh, the issues further. I am mindful of the, as you mentioned, the gender difference between the <coughs> sectors. But nevertheless, I really generally want to hear, um, or the department really wants to hear from the Interior to Design Association and other sectors as well, because long term uh, legislative and policy stability actually gives the se sector clarity and actually allows them to forward plan mm. uh, so much better, I think. So I, I do mm. take your point um, about um, some of the issues uh, currently within the interior designers, but what we're doing doesn't necessarily prevent uh, the mm. current activities that the association is, or the members are able to do, but we certainly uh, want to find ways to My understanding is they've almost it. been entirely pushed out of being able to do the work that, well, that, that they were doing previously before so, the so legislation I, passed. Yeah, certainly, I think this is actually about mm. uh, so hearing from the association. And we, generally do want to hear from them um, so that we yeah, can actually develop a so set of policy and regulatory frameworks, yeah. which is actually, I think, quite, quite useful. Um, yeah. one of the yeah. uh, Ms. Uh, morning, Minister. Morning, Ms. Fenn. Minister, why did it take an extensive ABC investigation to reveal the fact that the Strata Commissioner held extensive financial assets in a major real estate <coughs> and strata services company? Uh, look, uh, Ms. Fenn, thank you uh, for your question. Like all senior, all public servants uh, need to abide by the code of conduct and that there's an expectation from myself and from the Secretary that all those disclosures are actually made. Uh, as you'd be well aware, um, a formal process is currently Were underway. Were you aware of uh, the uh, shares that the Strata Commissioner uh, had held? Well, I said all public servants need to abide by the code of kind of to disclose any peculiar interests. Um, the Strata and Property Services Commissioner is a GSC um, employee and therefore the relationship is between the Secretary and the Property Service. And I'm happy to ask the Secretary um, to um, provide so, further So he disclosed, uh, which has been reported, I'm aware, that he did, uh, Mr Minns did disclose uh, that at the time to the current Secretary at the time, the is that correct? So um, the former secretary, sorry, Mr. Head, uh, Ms. Uh, Hogan, and it was made very, very clear at all stages, he says, within the New South Wales government. So uh, why has he stood aside now then if he disclosed it at the time and it seemed to be okay at the time, apparently, for the government? Look, so uh, when I was made aware of this issue that was raised, I sought urgent advice from the secretary and for the appropriate action for him to take um, as, his, as the Secretary is the Stratum Property Services Commissioner's employer, um, all actions are, are best uh, managed and um, uh, managed by the Secretary. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so just to be, and I can come back yes, to you, Mr Head. So just in terms of when you found out, yes. was it uh, the ABC investigation, the interview that was aired last night on Four Corners, uh, did the uh, Strata Commissioner, I assume, uh, let you know about uh, that interview before it was aired? And then did you request him to stand down or did he stand down voluntarily? Uh, the, the employer functions with the Secretary or uh, processes regarding the Strata Property Association is a matter for the Secretary to um, manage. Mr program. Head, did you request him to stand down or did he stand down voluntarily? Uh, I stood Mr Minns down in, uh, in line with the relevant provisions of the GSE Act to allow me to undertake a proper examination of the range of issues that were raised, uh, some of which related to disclosures but others uh, related to the veracity of statements that uh, were made on the website. So there are a number of issues to be tested and a standard uh, investigation of uh, potential breaches of the code is what's underway so at the moment. So that's going on at the moment. Is he still being paid? Uh, yes, as uh, is generally the case when people are stood aside. The default position is that they're stood aside on pay unless there are 
typically serious criminal allegations which would uh, which would cause okay. you to not make that decision, and that is standard with uh, GSE misconduct Thank investigations. Thank you. And um, what salary is Mr Minns uh, on? Uh, I'd need to take the specifics on notice. He is a band two. If you could do so. that, salary and allowances. Thank you. Um, moving on to the uh, net strata investigation. Um, uh, so I understand, of course, that the uh, New South Wales uh, Fair Trading uh, launched <coughs> that investigation. I think it's one of the reasons the legislation is before um, the Upper House Minister. Um, firstly, in terms of that investigation into net strata, why does it take media investigations like what we're seeing by Linton Besser at the ABC in Four Corners <coughs> last night before your department takes significant action to do anything in terms of the strata issues going on in this state? Well, look, certainly the strata issues that have been raised by the ABC um, over the last few months is concerning for us. But I'd also make the point, I did watch the Four Corners um, investigation last night, but Mr Besser also clearly says that New South Wales is actually leading the nation when it comes to strata reform. That means in terms of the laws, but I think he also made the point that they're just not enforced. Isn't, well, that, isn't that correct as well? Well, well I said the government um, is, is understands the need for strata reform, and that's why, in all fairness, in, since coming to government, we've actually acted on a quite significant pieces of reform. Uh, last year, as uh, members will be well aware, we passed the first phase of the statutory review um, regarding strata reform. We have currently um, the strata legislation before, yeah, which deals you. with some of the issues that were raised, yes. and we are currently out in phase two yes, of the, the next transfer So I do the have questions on. And can, we, I, can I ask, yes, though, with, the, with the getting back to the net strata investigation, so you commissioned uh, McGrath Nickel. I understand the department commissioned McGrath Nickel to undertake that investigation. Is that because there's no resources within uh, New South Wales Fair Trading to undertake an investigation uh, of that nature uh, by itself? No, so, so Fair Trading uh, used its powers under the undertaking powers um, to, uh, 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 I guess, begin this investigation. Um, it's was it jointly with McGrath Nickel? Well, it, it's not uncommon under the undertaking powers that fair training is actually used um, to go down this path. McGrath Nickel is an independent examiner mm -hmm. of this particular issue. Could you please provide uh, the cost of that uh, investigation by McGrath Nickel, please? Uh, has that investigation been completed? Uh, I understand that the investigation is still ongoing, but I'm happy to ask the Fair Trading Commissioner uh, to provide more information on that um, current investigation. Thank you, Minister. So, uh, Ms Vermin, to your first question around the costs of that investigation, uh, the total cost is $450,000, and those costs are being borne by the regulated entity uh, rather than the taxpayer. Um, the by net strata, just to be clear, is that what you mean when you're saying the regulated That's correct. entity? Thank so um, <coughs> this yeah. is a common regulatory okay, tool, great. Yep. Um, and so that is that's the instance in this case. Um, so is it complete? Sorry, I just need very short uh, responses. Yeah, of course. <coughs> so um, the draft report was delivered to our legal team late last week. Late last mm -hmm. week. So that draft report, are we going to see, is that going to be released publicly? So one of the things that we wanted to make sure of was that there was transparency around the findings of that report. So we have undertaken to release the findings and recommendations publicly. Um, has there been, in terms of the uh, McGrath Nickel report, in terms of what was provided, uh, have there been various drafts of that report between the um, between Fair Trading and McGrath Nickel? Firstly. Uh, so the draft, the, the first draft report was delivered late last week. Uh, to fair trading. Has Net Strata been involved in that report as well? They have not. Um, has there been, uh, between McGrath, Nicole and the agency, have there been various iterations of that report? Uh, no, there have not. I had a meeting with my team and my legal team with McGrath, Nicole some weeks ago where we discussed the scope of the report, but the first draft report, as I said, was delivered to the legal team in fair trading late last week. Minister, is there a reason why the full report won't be released? Uh, well, the, the, you mean the net strata That's report? That's right. Well, I, I suppose we've got the draft report at the moment. Let's uh, examine that findings from that and whether 
the next appropriate action to actually take? Yes, yeah, so the findings are going to be released publicly, we've just heard, but the entire report uh, is not, which of course uh, for uh, members of the community who are very concerned about strata, and clearly there are thousands, tens of thousands yeah. of them, uh, being able to look at the reasons why uh, those findings um, uh, were, were um, uh, gotten to uh, is important. Minister, why won't you commit to releasing that report so the stakeholders can see it? Well, the, the, the summary of the report uh, is being considered for publication by Fair Trading. Yeah, I know. I'm asking you a question why you won't consider releasing the full report. Well, I, I, I'm happy to take that in consideration. You, you're trying um, to keep um, certain things about the investigation secret well, from the well, public? I, I, Ms Fenner, I haven't seen the contents of the report as yet, <coughs> and given it was only provided to the Fair Trading Commissioner late last week. So I don't want to preempt anything I haven't seen okay. um, until I get the uh, proper advice. And So you um, haven't seen any of it yet? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, Minister, the uh, Strata Hub, the issue with the Strata Hub and the fact that, again, the ABC investigation has re uncovered that um, via this scheme, uh, one of the uh, people who are running that business, Tony Irving, <coughs> Irvine, uh, has been charging additional fees, so much so, uh, to administer that scheme, uh, that he said on a webinar he'd like to thank the New South Wales Government for the Strata Hub because that bought me a brand new ute. Yes, so that was good of them. Uh, Minister, do you think something is going terribly wrong uh, with Strata Hub and the way in which the Government is managing that? Well, look, look, the government is committed to the strata reform and this will look at examine all aspects of the strata industry. Like we were mindful and we know as more and more um, people in our community live in strata living arrangements, we need to modernise and contemporise our legal and regulatory framework. And in all fairness, we did inherit a system that didn't do much reform over 12 years and in the first 12 months of government, We've gone through phase one. We've got a bill before the parliament at the moment, and we're now moving towards stage two or phase two of the um, um, of the strata reforms. These are important reforms. We understand that, and that's why we're going on this journey uh, with the stakeholders. Thank you, uh, Honourable Sarah Mitchell. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Ms. Mitchell. Um, Minister, can you tell me what free trade agreements Australia currently has under negotiation? Uh, all national free trade agreements are a matter for the Commonwealth. But as the State Minister for Trade, do you know what current negotiations are taking place? Well, all, all negotiations on national free trade agreements are a matter for the Commonwealth. And we want to do, in our trade space, we want to make sure that we continue to push um, opportunities uh, for our industries. Okay. Um, according to the Investment New South Wales website, Japan ranked as the second largest source of foreign investment for New South Wales in 21-22 at $33.2 billion, and Korea ranked fourth, valued at $15.1 billion. Um, Minister, have you met with Jetro this year? Have I met with, sorry, who? Jetro. Uh, Jetro, I've, made all, I've met with a number of our um, uh, Japanese and Korean industry representatives and their associations. Now, I make all my disclosures um, with um, um, with relevant parties as required. Okay, so but have you met with with Jetro? Well, I, specifically, I can't recall, but I do know okay. I've had a number of actually meetings um, with our trade counterparts, I suppose, from um, from um, from across the globe. Sure. Um, you just mentioned Korea as well. Have you met with Cotra? Who was that? Sorry. The Korean Trade Investment Promotion Agency. Uh, look, I said I disclose all my uh, meetings as required under disclosure rules. Okay. Could you maybe take on notice whether you've met with Jetro and Cotra since you've been Minister? Well, I said, look, I've, I've disclosed all my meetings with all my counterparts and certainly okay. um, I'm happy to take that on notice. Okay. Um, can you tell me the largest single private customer for Australian exports? Uh, coal to Japan. Okay. Um, you also have... Um, I think five five portfolios. You've got quite an extensive um, ministerial uh, brief that you you have to cover. How many staff do you have in your office, Minister? Uh, seven FTEs. Okay. And do you have staff who have experience in industry and trade? 
uh, well, I suppose it depends on how you find what industry and trade is, yeah. but certainly I think the skills that are actually required in any political office is actually good fundamental research analysis skills, um, critical thinking skills, and good engagement um, with stakeholders and the ability to communicate those things. And frankly, I have all those skills in the office. Okay, so I guess just in terms of specifics though in the policy space, um, your director of policy, for instance, or your policy advisors, do they have any industry and trade experience prior to coming to work in your office? Well, I said that the, 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 the skills that are required to work in any political office is one of critical thinking, good research analysis, good communication skills, and I'm very, I'd have to say I'm very uh, fortunate to have very good committed staff. Yeah, I'm sure you do. I'm just wondering whether any of them have, have trade experience prior to working for well, you. And if not, that's, that's well, fine. Well, it's just well I, I, yeah. I, I, I think the, the important skills that people need are actually fundamental skills that are transferable across any sector. Okay. Uh, that is good critical thinking, uh, good communication skills, uh, I think professional experience in, in a range of industries. I, I don't think you can just um, uh, silo one particular skill and somehow assume that it's not transferable to other aspects of the, um, of, of the skill set that you've got. So with the recruitment process for your staff, did you look to anyone who might have had previous experience in, in any of the portfolios that you're responsible for, including trade? I look for intelligence, I look for good communication skills, I look for critical thinking, um, I look for ability to uh, communicate, to engage with people. I think the core fundamental skills of any public servant, or of any individual, is actually about the foundations of their intellects, of their ability to engage, and their ability to communicate. Uh, no one person in this world will have uh, the skills across every sector, but if you have the fundamental skills and the intellectual thinking and the intellectual curiosity, then that's the most important aspect of any office, whether it's my office, the public service office, or any sure. other office. Thanks. Well, indeed, I mean, your office, no doubt. Yeah, I have look, no I've doubt. just, I, I, I thought maybe perhaps some, some policy experience might have been, been part of it, but that, that's fine. Um, I want to take you now to New South Wales coal exports. You'd no doubt be aware <laughs> that in 2022-23, coal exports topped 55 billion. Um, but I'm curious to know, as a government, what other products are you looking at in terms of international exports um, in the coming years? Well, look, look, look certainly, uh, um, you know. Uh, the New South Wales economy, I think in all fairness over the past years, is highly concentrated um, and highly concentrated in coal, as you'd be well aware. Mm -hmm. Ms Mitchell, it's one third of our exports, mm -hmm. which, make, which exposes the New South Wales economy yes. uh, to significant concentration risks. But that's why uh, I think, you know, um, our trade focus, in particular our opportunities to work on Mr Moore's report to the growing, fastest growing economic region on our borders in Southeast Asia. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a four trillion economic prize mm -hmm. that the New South Wales government cannot miss. Sure. We need to push uh, industries that will, I believe, mm -hmm. match the rising affluence of the consumerisms in that part of the world. You know, Australia as a nation since World War II has always benefited from rising Asian economies, whether mm -hmm. it's Japan, mm -hmm the Republic of Korea, and now this particular block is such a big <coughs> economic price that we can't miss. And, and sure, I, and I agree, but I'm just curious then, Minister, and I agree with, with your sentiments, what are some of the export industries or that you're looking to invest in? What are the priorities yeah, look, look, beyond certainly. coal? Look, look the, the, the fundamental principle here is about uh, economic diversification. Mm -hmm. So we have some great industries here in New South Wales. Some of those in actually regional communities. Consumerism, and that is food and beverages, mm -hmm. is a really strong point for us because I do know in having engagements with our representatives and our industries that as consumers rise in affluence and their ability in income and their prosperity, they will want actually the same living standards or the same level of consumption. So high quality food and beverages, I mean, healthcare, mm -hmm. um, international education, mm -hmm. um, where we're rolling out an offshore model as an innovative way to ensure that we continue to connect with um, the rising uh, economies of, of Southeast Asia. Sure. Um, just, I guess, in terms in, of the energy space, is hydrogen an option that you're looking at? We have really done a lot of work in this space. Uh, we've been encouraging, in particular, 
uh, with our North Asian mm -hmm. uh, trading partners who are very keen on energy supply. We've had a number of delegations who have come to visit uh, New South Wales and investment in New South Wales worked very hard mm -hmm. to continue um, to uh, engage with potential investors mm -hmm. and of course suppliers. And on top of that, um, I've initiated with investment in New South Wales. We held a the first of, course, of many engagements uh, we did a round table with our Japanese uh, representatives and companies here mm -hmm. um, in, in this very building um, about trying to understand how we actually um, encourage them to actually invest in this particular industry for okay. our, our own development, but also for their own energy security sure. so as well. So just speaking of, of different companies and um, delegations, uh, I understand that the Australian Managing Director of SMBC visited the Port of Newcastle yesterday as part of the Jetro hydrogen mission to Australia. Were you there, Minister, by any chance? Uh, yesterday, no, I wasn't, okay. but I do know that and we've, we've um, supported and, and actually guided a number of delegations, not only to the Hunter, I might say, but also down to the Illawarra as well. Sure. So I'm just more, I guess, focused on this, this visit yesterday, and I understand if you weren't there, but did any senior government representatives attend that you're aware of? I, I might refer that to the um, uh, Deputy Secretary. I'll have to take that okay. question and try and bring you an answer this afternoon. Sure, thank you. Um, my understanding is that, that that particular company have already invested, I think it's about $40 billion in Australia and want to double that. I guess I'm just concerned if, if you're not there and if no one from the agencies are there, is that another missed opportunity for your government? Not, not at all. I think we've been very proactive in our engagements with our trading partners on the energy front. Um, in actual fact, in the round table um, that we... Uh, conducted here in this very building. When was that round table, Minister? Oh, well, I can't give you that. It was only, only in the last, a month, the last few okay. months or so. So what that shows, not only was I there, uh, Minister Scully and Minister Sharp were also there, just to really signify that this is a whole of government approach to encourage and engage investment in this particular sector mm -hmm. for our benefit, but also for the benefit of our trading partners as well. Um, can you tell me which is the only car company that's currently headquartered here in New South Wales? Do you know? Uh, well, I'll have, I'll have to take that on notice. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think it's Hyundai's, the motor, <coughs> their, their global chair, CEO uh, and COO, I'm told, requested to meet with both yourself and the Premier in January this year to discuss a billion dollar battery manufacturing opportunity. Do you recall that meeting or meeting request? Uh, look, I, I can't recall every meeting request that comes through, but I do know that all meetings that I have are, are, are disclosed appropriately. I, I appreciate that, Minister, but it's a billion dollar manufacturing opportunity with Hyundai. Have you met with them? Do you recall meeting with them? Oh, requesting look, I, said, that I, I disclose all my meetings as required, but you know, the proactive engagements we've had with our um, industries or company representatives here, whether it's, I said, through the age. JBCC or our Korean representatives is ongoing and it's actually quite proactive. So, look, I will always consider any meeting requests that come through which aim to deliver great economic outcomes for yeah, the people I mean, of a, a billion dollars is a fairly big economic opportunity. Um, my understanding is that, that that meeting didn't go ahead despite requests um, and that they actually met with the Victorian Premier and Government instead. Again, is that another Missed opportunity yeah, look, for the state because the, the you didn't New South organise Wales a government and means trade that we are continuing to push to diversify our economy. Now, all meeting requests that are sent to me, um, if you're saying if it's in, in January early this year, mm. well, I, I said I might have been on leave, on personal leave. Well, so I, 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 look, and but, look, you know, I'm not begrudging your personal leave, but my issue is that you had a, a billion dollar opportunity with a major global company for this state who then went and met with Victoria because they couldn't get a meeting with you. Like, that is not, I well, think, what the taxpayers of well, New South Wales would be expecting from well, you as like trade minister, well, with respect. All media requests that said through me, of that side, of course I would consider it and, and, and meet with them. But, you know, so, I, okay. I, I can't recall every single request that comes through, but I do know that I and the New South Wales government is committed to diversifying our economy and to engaging with our international investors, but also their foreign representatives here too. You know, I, I think we need to use all the networks that we can, but I do know, um, in one sense, um, that uh, I'm a little advised that, you know, perhaps the uh, former government could have also done a bit more in actually connecting well, with I, some respect, of our Minister, we're um, here foreign to, I'm, I'm asking you here. about a, a request in January from a major global organisation that had a billion dollar manufacturing opportunity for this state. 
and that meeting didn't happen and they went to Victoria instead. And so I think, um, you know, while you might be, be saying the right things in terms of engagement, if that's not actually what's happening with some of these major corporations, I do think that's a problem for, for New South Wales. Um, I wanted to ask you just finally before I hand to my colleague, um, in the last estimates hearing in March you said that you were walking away from the previous government's trade statement. Is that still your position? Well, we are going to do a trade statement which fits the new economy. We're not going to have um, old policies for a new economy. The New South Wales government is looking to diversify our economy. We are looking to access our growing markets and that trade statement has to reflect that. It'll be part of an integrated policy development. Um, um, yes, I acknowledge uh, the trade survey that was done by the former government, but that's in a different time. Sure. That was during COVID. We've had a new economy. We've got some different um, economic situations which are much more different when that policy statement was actually developed. So, you Minister, can't have I, old policy for a new economy. Well, uh, and I just want to take you to that. You're talking about old policies in the old um, statement during COVID. I actually Googled New South Wales trade statement this morning, and it's still the former government's statement, which was released in October 2021. It's on the Investment New South Wales website. Can you understand how that could be misleading for uh, potential investors or overseas organisations to hear you say, no, we're walking away from that, but the old statement continues to be what's promoted on the government website. Well, we, we are developing a new trade and investment strategy and policy that meets the needs of a newer economy, accessing newer markets and diversifying our front. I, 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 it can be on the website. And that's, that's, and I that's what that. people will look well, at. No, what people will look at is the work that the New South Wales government is doing to ensure that we really have our foothold in this four trillion economic block, um, all right beyond it, right be up the north of our borders, and this is too big of an opportunity for us to miss. Now, the trade policy statement um, of the former government is for an old economy and for an old times. We need to make sure that we make ours contemporary and we're going through But with process. respect, Minister, it's on a current website, so, so that rhetoric doesn't actually really play into well, well, the Well, it does, um, because what we're doing is actually really diversifying our economy. Uh, we're not, we understand that the concentration of coal in our trade um, makeup is a real concern for, for myself and for the government. We know where the energy transition is moving to, but what we want to do is make sure that we develop a policy that really takes <coughs> advantage of um, a growing markets within our region. Mm -hmm. I think my colleague's got some follow-on from that. So. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning. So 18 months we are through your term. Where is the trade statement? It was due in June and it was supposed to be implemented by now. Look, the government is working through an integrated uh, uh, policy, industry policy for which the trade and investment policy Australia will actually play a part in that. Okay. I said we, we are going through a good policy development process, which um, will require course, collection of quality and quantitative data right. and careful analysis through that front. Okay, so is it true that you took a trade and investment strategy to Cabinet earlier this year, but it was rejected? I, I don't um, discuss Cabinet uh, meetings in public. So why hasn't the timeline that was set out for a trade and investment strategy being met. It was supposed to go to cabinet meeting in May, supposed to have a release in June and then be implemented by July. We're, we're now into September. So what is the reason for the delay? The government is working through a careful long-term trade and investment policy to have it integrated with our industry industry policy. But why, why, haven't you Wales, met, why haven't you met the milestones that so, you had well, set for yourself? Th th they, aren't, they, they aren't my deadlines. Whose I deadlines well, are well, they? They're not mine. Well, what's what your deadline, Minister? Do, what, what, we're going to what do, is your deadline? What we're going to do is uh, develop a trade and investment policy that actually delivers clarity and long-term uh, clarity for the sector, diversifying our economy, and well, making Minister, sure, uh, making you, you sure. You talk about diversification, and you talk about ASEAN a lot, which is very interesting. What proportion of New South Wales exports do you expect to go to ASEAN? Well, it's a four trillion dollar economic. I know, prize. I know, but what what well, proportion well, of exports it, it from is, New South a, Wales a are you expecting to have that? It's a four trillion dollar economic prize, right. and New that. South Wales government is not going to miss 
this opportunity. But, but what's the target? Well, because a point you've of got... Here. Sorry, there's been a point of order, yes. Um, if Ms Munro wants to ask a question, it's only courteous that she allows the minister the appropriate time to answer before going on to yeah, the next question. No, thank you. I, and I do uphold the point of order this time. I was paying close attention and I think you weren't giving the minister enough time to provide um, okay. an appropriate amount of answer. Thank well, you. Well, if I might say, Minister, you don't need to repeat the points that you've already made to this point of order, Chair. Yeah. Yes, there's been a point of order taken. Yeah. Point of order, Chair. It's not for Ms Munro to lecture the Minister on how he can or cannot answer the question. It's not appropriate and it's not in line with our uh, resolution of fairness. Yeah, look, I, I do uphold the point of order. I think we can keep the commentary as well. Minister, what proportion of exports from New South Wales do you expect to be part of the ASEAN trade um, well, strategy? I, I said we are going through the strategy at the moment. We are trying to diversify our economy. As you would be well aware, um, some of our um, three of our top ten export destinations are in Southeast Asia. That is in Thailand, Vietnam, and Singapore, and we're looking forward to growing those um, um, uh, uh, markets even more, and other growing markets as well. So, Minister, you you actually went on a, a trade mission to Thailand, Vietnam, and Singapore earlier in the year. Did the department suggest that you go to those countries? Did they oh, advise look, this you is, this to This is part countries? of the fastest growing economic block in the world. Um, certainly, if we are to obtain the economic and the employment opportunities and benefits for the people of New South Wales and to diversify, uh, certainly. But did you get departmental advice to go to those countries? Well, we, 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 will, I, we will look at the markets that are the fastest growing area in the region. And we, of course, will consult with the department. But, but you know, this is an economic prize the New South Wales government and the New South Wales economy cannot miss. So, Minister, if you have policy uh, people in your, in your own ministerial office who don't have trade experience and you're not confirming that the department actually advised you to go to these countries, how are you making these decisions? Well, I'm sorry, no. Uh, we receive advice from the department. We engage with the department. But you but know, did, did this, you, this is but this is. Did you receive advice to go to these particular well, countries, well, well, or did they actually advise you not to go? Look, this is the fastest economic growing region in that. the world, and we are going to ensure that we push our industries, engage with government to government, government to business. You know, I would also say this: um, if you may be, I'm sure you'd be all aware. In the valedictory speech of the former Premier, Mr. Uh, the member for Epping, he made this point that uh, we need to make sure we are connecting and pushing our trade opportunities in, in, in Asia. Okay, so did you have any KPIs for that trip? Well, th this is about engagement, this is about pushing our industries. So were um, there KPIs uh, that we can refer this, to, Minister? This is about engagement. This is about pushing our industries, understanding. Did you do any business deals from that trip? What, what, Did you get any point of order, Chair? Yes, that's no, point I think of the order. No. I know we're at the end of the, the session, but perhaps for, for next time we we might consider Miss Munro not speaking over and peppering the minister with questions before he gets a chance to answer. Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I remind both the minister and the member as well as of course, to be mindful of hindsight as well when everyone's talking over the top of each other, it becomes very difficult. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we now go to crossbench questions. Um, I think I'll take the first ten and then I'll go to Mr Higginson. You, um, uh, Minister, where is the government up to um, um, in terms of its response to the 31 recommendations um, of the Special Commission of Inquiry um, into offending by the former corrections officer, uh, Mr Astell? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, as members would well, be well aware, um, uh, the offences of the former corrections officer was really deplorable and inexcusable. Uh, the government commissioned um, Judge McClellan, one of the most eminent jurists in the country, to conduct a special commission of inquiry. Um, as you know, he, the, the um, commissioner handed down his report early this year and the government has formally responded to that um, and that we're also attaching um, um, uh, $30 million as an initial investment to address some of the issues that were identified in uh, uh, Mr McClellan's report. Uh, thank you. And where are you up to actually implementing the 31 recommendations themselves? Uh, yes, so, so uh, the government has already made a number of um, responses to that. So the things we can do quickly, we have done. We've mm -hmm. actually improved the number of CCTV cameras at Dewinia. We now have a standalone governor 
um, at Duwina and custodial officers at Duwina are all required now to wear body warm cameras. So these are the things that we're making um, that we've already implemented, but there are, we understand and we acknowledge there are other um, uh, other actions we need to do, but that will require a much more medium to long term um, engagement. But if you're keen, uh, Chair, I'd be happy to share some of the government's thinking around that with you. Thank you. Um, and in respect to the CCTV cameras, um, the inquiry specifically recommended that CCTV cameras um, be installed in all offices where officers potentially meet alone with inmates um, and in corridors leading su to such of offices um, and consideration given to CCTV in all correctional centres being retained for a minimum of 90 days before being overwritten. Um, have those specific CCTV um, camera changes been implemented as yeah, well? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we've actually allocated $5.8 million um, so far for the retention of CCTV footage uh, for 90 days at all our correctional centres statewide. Great. And what about the other part, the um, the CCTV for um, officers where they may potentially meet alone and the corridors leading to those offices as well? Is that um, a, a recommendation you're currently implementing? Yeah, well, look, the government is going through all the recommendations from a Judge McClellan's report. Um, this, is, this is a long journey. Um, which uh, the government is committed to reform. You know, as people, uh, as members were well aware, the um, offences of uh, the former corrections have happened between 2016 to 2019. Um, he was charged in 2019. He was convicted in 2022. Um, but it has taken this government to instigate the Astor inquiry with Judge McClellan and to find out the way forward. Now, the government is committed to reform. Um, we've uh, allocated um, a number of uh, um, uh, uh, resources uh, to that, um, including, as I said, CCTV uh, funding details. Yeah. And we are investing yeah. in CCTV. We understand uh, the role that it plays to um, improve and to bring trust and confidence back to the system. Thank you. And, and, sorry, and so will some of that in, um, investment into the CCTV cameras um, be specifically earmarked for those offices where they might potentially meet inmates alone or to the corridors leading to those offices? Uh, look, the, 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 I said we, we've allocated 5.8 for the mm. CCTV footage and also additional cameras at yep. Duwini, which is at the female um, yep. correctional facility. Yep. Um, and, and we'll continue, and I said we've also <laughs> um, done some uh, additional investment in the AVL suites, yep. uh, which gives uh, inmates greater privacy as they're actually corresponding with um, with others. Um, and so, sorry, so by that, can I take it that you either haven't made a decision yet on the recommendation in regards to having CCTV in offices where they're potentially meeting alone um, or in the corridors leading to those offices? Like that specific recommendation um, outside of the... I, I, I understand yeah. it. I appreciate that you're, you're doing a lot of stuff into CCTVs and you've got the 90 days yeah. and that's great. I'm just wondering about that very specific no. section, whether that's something yeah. you're, you're looking to implement no. or that's yeah. not something look, look, on the table. Uh, Chair, thank you. Absolutely we have and we will, but in terms of specific programs we've done, I'm, I'm going to ask the Acting Commissioner to provide more details because I, I know this is important work mm -hmm. and the Department and, and the Government is committed to actually improving um, from what has been an embedded system that we've inherited. Great. Acting Commissioner. So, Chair, Thanks. the 33 cameras you referred to, those cameras went in, actually started going in during the inquiry before the, the hearings had finished and obviously before the recommendations came in. So. Those cameras went into the areas where Mr. Axtell committed his crimes. Um, so there are other areas that are meeting areas where inmates um, may meet with staff that will be captured with the new funding. So we have covered a lot of the areas, all of the areas where the criminal activity occurred, um, and there are further areas that meet that definition mm -hmm. that will be prioritised under the funding the government's now approved. Great. So there was sort of a focus on the, those um, uh, places where the offending occurred yes. as, as a matter of urgency, um, and now we're and moving with into we the recommendations. And we can finish the job, and also the important um, additional storage up to 90 days for the footage um, Great. out of those cameras. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Minister, will the government be issuing a formal response to each of the 31 <coughs> recommendations? 
Uh, yes, uh, Chair, I can inform the committee that the government is addressing each one of those uh, recommendations. Um, it is a 2011 split. There are 31 recommendations. 20 of those we accept and 11 of those will accept in principle. Not that we disagree with the intention of the recommendation, but actually how it actually works in practice. So finding a way that it can actually be implemented from a practical basis, not disagreeing with the recommendations that are actually being made. Um, and when can we expect to see that formal response public? Uh, the, the government is looking forward to, um, is looking to table the response shortly. Okay. Um, and you previously announced that there would be a task force set up to fix the culture and um, procedures in corrective services. Can you give us an update on that task force? Uh, absolutely, Chair. Um, we've actually uh, created a three-tier level task force within DCJ, which has representatives from across uh, the network to ensure that we, we, um, in, we, we follow the recommendations, um, we ensure that it actually works. And I'm happy to ask the secretary, um, who chairs the, um, one of the um, more senior advisory task forces, to ensure that the recommendations from this very important inquiry uh, and makes progress to bring trust and confidence back to the system. Uh, Secretary? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I chair the task force. The task force is part of a, uh, a three-tiered uh, body. It is utterly and absolutely focused on the implementation of the 31 recommendations, but also with reference to looking at those 804 pages and the narrative uh, through there, so things which are not strictly are covered in the recommendations, such as reporting of complaints to the Secretary to ensure that there is um, an arm's length uh, arrangement and a degree of independence. That is being implemented. And as well, the recent machinery of government change, whereby there is now a common uh, reporting uh, line, so the Minister holding at the employer function of the Commissioner, but also having the power to direct, rather that, than that being split between the uh, Minister and the Secretary can allow the Secretary to focus on uh, independently, when needed, briefing to the Minister on professional misconduct uh, and other matters and ensuring that there is a line of distance and uh, internal within government, but uh, internal independence of oversight. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Chair, can I also just yeah. um, clarify um, that the government did issue a formal response last Friday mm -hmm. outlining um, our response to the recommendations. As I said, it's a 2011 split, um, 20 accepted and 11 in principle, working through their practical details and how best to implement those uh, recommendations. Thank you. Apologies. I missed that on That's Friday. Okay. <laughs> um, if, you know, if I may just add, yeah, if I may, of yes, course, sure. in relation to uh, 10 recommendations were accepted in principle, the sort of thing that uh, we are seeking to do is, in important areas, consult uh, with staff. Mm -hmm. So, for example, rotation of staff, uh, which uh, is dealt with in the McClellan report, clearly that has implications on Correctional officers, you know, who are mm -hmm. who are hard-working people, they have families, they work in local mm -hmm. communities. So, working through those issues consultatively will actually be important. Thank you, um, and Mr. Tibble, can I ask as well if there's any specific um, representatives on the task force that to represent certain demographics or groups? The task force at high level uh, is essentially myself, uh, the commissioner, the uh, PSA. Uh, is present and it co can co-opt uh, other people beneath that, the two next levels <coughs> down, effectively go to working groups uh, where experts are co-opted in and there is scope absolutely for relevant stakeholders to be engaged. Great. Thank you. Ms Sue Higginson. Thank you. Um, morning all. I just want to, just following on from the Chair and um, the recommendations, very interestingly and I think it's something really just to let you know and I'm curious as to whether you are already aware, but I've actually received reports from inmates that the issue of the safe reporting line is actually, there's problems with that, in the recommendation 1516 reporting line, and that um, as we understand it, issues are meant to be escalated outside of the prison. However, some inmates that have been, that have used the service have had operators who have refused to do this and have actually said, um, the inmate issue will go to the governor and um, 
that the line's already possibly not working accordingly. So it might be something for you to look at in terms of, I can talk to the staff a bit later, the departmental mm -hmm. officers a bit later about what those concerns are. But um, I mean, I suppose anything that we start up has periods mm -hmm. of, um, trial and tribulation and error and failure, but I think it's important that these systems um, are done well. Um, Minister, I just wanted to talk to you about something we spoke about at the last estimates in relation to phone calls. Yes. Um, I can't underestimate the, what the research mm -hmm. says about phone calls and access that inmates can have um, and the benefits. The last time we spoke, um, you said that you would look into the issue of free phone calls in New South Wales correction centres. Is there anything that you have um, availed yourself of that would make you, like me, an advocate for free phone calls within prisons? Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Susan, for, for the question. Yes, we did, I recall, we did have a conversation about um, phone calls, but you know, I acknowledge, and I think the government acknowledges that interaction um, inmates to their social network is an important part of um, their rehabilitation. Um, and I've, I've already uh, requested the acting commissioner to investigate um, the phone calls and how, if there are pricing changes, what impact that would actually be. Because I can also say that um, Corrections New South Wales absorbs all the costs regarding phone calls and that if there were to be changes on that, that would obviously have an impact to our budget and how best we can um, manage um, the financial impact of that um, to ensure that we continue to provide not only um, phone calls but other um, rehabilitation programs that corrections actually um, uh, Deploys. So just on phone calls, Minister, in June 2023, the cost of a 10-minute phone call rose from 30 cents to $2.60. I've also heard various other um, iterations of that, but it, 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 our understanding is the price has risen uh, for phone calls. I also understand that under the operating procedures, um, inmates are supposed to have one free phone call a week. but. The information that we get, and I've got some centres, for example, Lithgow, there's prisoners who haven't had access to a free phone call for over two years. Mm. Um, are you aware of this? Well, look, sir, sir I, I wouldn't be able to call every single um, instance, but certainly that would be of uh, concern to me that if inmates who are entitled to a phone call, that is those on remand, are entitled to a um, three phone calls a week and um, free phone calls, that is, and, and those were sentenced at one week. So certainly instances There's, where... We've got 12,000, some, something like 12,000 people in prison and they just want to stay connected. Yep. Um, I'm not going to table it, but I'm just going to let you know that um, I have a petition here that was literally a 10-day only petition across 10 correctional centres in the state there's over 1,100 1, signatures, and those inmates are literally just begging to be able to make free phone calls and mm -hmm. to be able to have access yeah. and connection yeah. to the people that they love and that they need in order to one day come out and be connected. I'd also say, I suppose... Why can't we just give them... Why can't we just do free phone calls in prisons? I, I suppose the... the broader conversation, Ms Higginson, on this, whether it's phone calls, it's actually about connections um, from inmates to their... OK, well, let's talk about network. that. If you're not... Are you committed? Would you give... Like, can you look at how we can just provide free phone calls? I've instructed the uh, acting committee to really uh, take a review on the financial impacts if we were to change the pricing uh, mechanisms for phone calls. But I'd also add, uh, Ms Higginson, that... Um, phone calls are not the only way inmates are connect with. Well, let's their talk solution. about that. Can we talk about the um, video phone call, the video calls? Um, what are we doing? Can I ask you what what do you know uh, is the status of the um, research and evaluation strategy for the transformation of prisoner rehabilitation through digital technology? Um, are you aware of that strategic document? That uh, I, I, I don't recall that specific document as, as such at this stage. There's a note coming. Thank um, you. But, but certainly, um, you know, the digital service that we provide... On I, the I, to I read this a little while ago, and it's an incredibly impressive document, mm -hmm. and clearly a lot of work has gone into it. And as I understand, there was an expression of interest for some of the programs within this document 
that closed in June last year. One of the things, as I understand it, is there is such a clear connection that if inmates can have access to free video phone calls from tablets, from in their cells, from outside the operating hours that AVLs work, um, the benefits to those inmates in terms of their well-being and their connection, going to your yes. principal point of connection, is untold. The evidence is overwhelming. Um, can we do that, Minister? Yeah, look, 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 I, said, I acknowledge, and I think the Department acknowledges that connection for inmates is an important part of their journey towards rehabilitation. And I'd also add that we've got 13,300 uh, uh, tablets which are accessible under... Can I just read you this, Minister? This course, is from an inmate at Cooma, and it was only on the 11th of August. Um, our main one is lack of video visits. We have two tablets, iPads, for 170 inmates and can only have visits on the weekends, meaning a lot of inmates miss out. This is somebody who would love to have contact with their children in um, Cooma. So I understand that on paper, apparently we have tablets and we have iPads, but the reality is inmates are just not accessing these devices in order to have the connection. There's a condition that prisoners refer to themselves as having uh, disconnection disorder. They can't connect to the people they love and need to in order to improve their well-being. Look, look, I said, I said, I, I, no one would deny that the connection is important and uh, corrections um, will always uh, investigate new ways to allow those connections to be had um, from inmates to their broader social network. Um, I said, we do have, I said, on top of the 13,300 tablets, there was also 800 um, internet protocol TVs, or IPTVs, um, and, you know, there have been 14.7 million phone calls um, that have been made to approve friends and family legal contacts. So, um, look, we acknowledge their value. Um, yes, uh, is there potential room to review these things? O of course there is. Will you have what a look, Minister? Will you undertake to have a, a, a deeper look and try and commit to having some more trust and faith in, and confidence in the fact that what the material shows is there was a study in Minnesota literally that showed one video phone call a week resulted in a 22% decrease in recidivism. Like the importance of this connection, and I know you understand mm. it, but the reality is we're just not mm. doing it. We're not helping people inside and we're not doing it. Are you, will you commit to looking yeah, look, into I, I, why I, and how sure. we can change it? Look, we, we always want our policy uh, regimes to actually work and I, I acknowledge and, and no one would deny that connection um, from uh, from inmates to their broader social and their professional work in terms of their legal contact is an important part. Um, where perhaps the program could be improved, that, that is something corrections will certainly um, continue to review. I might even ask the Acting Commissioner to maybe... I'm provide. going to come back to the okay, Acting sure. Commissioner because you know how my time runs okay, out, course, unfortunately. Can I just ask, though, in terms of the work that you've asked to be undertaken mm -hmm. around free phone calls. When do you expect that work to be returned to you? Uh, well, look, I said, I've instructed that work to uh, already take place. And, and as I said earlier, um, corrections does absorb all the costs mm -hmm. under contract um, with, um, with the provider. And, in, and there's been yes, no... Yes, in inmates are paying for phone calls look, as well. Said, there, like there's the been, yeah, there's been also no ch increase in the cost of phone call charges since 2018. Um, but I, I acknowledge the importance of connection. I'm just not sure that's correct, Minister. Uh, well, I mean, I'll take it up with sure. the staff later, sure. with the officers later, but I just don't think that's quite correct. Yeah, and so that's certainly not what the inmates and the governors of the centres are telling yeah. us. Well, I, Can I just ask you yes, one thing before, we, um, before my time finishes? As far as I'm concerned, from everything I have seen, everything I've read, mm -hmm. everything I've heard, um, I would strongly suggest that right now, Kelly Lane, who is an inmate, is literally being tortured by Corrections Services New South Wales, including through the Serious Offenders Review Council. What can you say to me to tell me that she is not literally being tortured by the system right now? Well, look, I, I'm reluctant to talk about specific cases. Um, I think however, we need to talk know, about Kelly Lane. But, but, but certainly um, all inmates are, are treated with uh, the level of uh, care, mindful of their 
um, welfare and well-being. She was due for so probation. I, I, There's now re retrospective laws applying to her, some yeah. nobody, no parole. Yeah. She literally has just been held in a maximum security prison yes. after having done and served her time mm -hmm. for a very small error of no consequence and of no ill intention of her own. She has only just been re-released back out of maximum security and she's been told that she will not be able to undertake any work release program for at least six months. How can that possibly be sensible, reasonable or fair? Well, look, I think the no body, no parole legislation, which was passed by the parliament um, last term, um, the SPA, which is the State uh, Parole Authority, which is so an will independent we just authority. To her? Well, the State Parole Authority, which is an independent statutory authority, uh, will make the, these decisions on our parole list, but also taking advice from uh, the New South Wales Police Commissioner uh, in making its deliberations. Thank you. I'll come back to that. Thank you. I'll now hand to Ms Munro. Thank you, Chair. Minister, by how many homes will your government miss its five-year housing target, according to yesterday's news? Yeah, look, the, 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 the uh, government um, has a housing target of 377,000 uh, dwellings uh, uh, over a five-year period. Um, certainly, it is a, a challenging time for the construction industry at present, um, and we'll continue to pull all levers uh, that we can um, to make sure that we build as many homes as we can. Okay, but it's um, seven. It's seventy-four thousand, according to the Master Builders Association. So, they they believe that the target is going to be missed by a very large proportion. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, well, I think on the current uh, economic settings, yes, it, it, it's 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 been debated in. Um, the public domain, but you know we have an actually an ambitious target, and we want to encourage all levers of government and all sectors of the economy. But y you know what, what we've done is from multi prong, both in obviously liberalising the uh, planning reforms to ensure that more uh, homes Minister, or dwellings can be built. Minister, with all due respect, I didn't, as, I didn't ask that question. Well, if if I can move on to ask a question. Uh, you, you spoke earlier, actually, about the building, the draft building bill. You said it's a significant piece of building reform. You said you wanted to genuinely engage, yet the former New South Wales state architect, Chris Johnson, said it was a shock proposal. Were you aware that your government only allowed stakeholders 17 days to give feedback on a 591-page document? Uh, we've extended that consultation by two months to I ensure understand. that stakeholders actually have the opportunity to engage with the government. But were you aware that it was originally a 17-day feedback um, timeline? Well, the, the government has been engaging on its reforms for more than that period. We've been engaging with this process for quite some time. Um, upon uh, uh, engaging and listening with two stakeholders, we've decided to extend that extension by two months, which but, is what's been requested. But if you were, if you say you're engaging with stakeholders previously, and you approved a 17-day feedback timeline, and then you're saying that actually we need now not just over two weeks, but actually over two months for people to give feedback, did you agree to the original 17-day well, timeline? Uh, uh, we are engaging and listening to stakeholders. Uh, you're criticising. <laughs> me for yes. engaging with stakeholders and I want to hear their views, I want to uh, gain their input. Uh, this is about good policy reform which requires engagement and interaction with stakeholders. Well, isn't this an admission that actually you couldn't undertake the genuine engagement that you spoke about in 17 business days and that you needed to extend that significantly because you hadn't actually grasped the um, feeling of many, many stakeholder sectors in the first place. Uh, we've listened and engaged with stakeholder feedback. It's what good <coughs> governments actually do. Have, uh, 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 this but, is but, how... But your government gave 17 business days. So did you approve that? We engage, we'll always engage with industry stakeholders um, to ensure that we deliver policy reform that provides long-term stability and clarity. Okay, and listening about, and engaging with stakeholders as an important journey, as an important step in that journey. How about I put it this way? Um, 
at what point did you realise that 17 business days was not enough and in fact over two months was required for stakeholders to respond to 591 pages? Uh, engaging with stakeholders is part of what good governance do. I'm delighted that we So why uh, did you engage. only have 17 business days originally? I, I'm delighted with the feedback that we've had from the industry and we've actually uh, agreed to extend the timeline so that industry can have a proper uh, analysis uh, on, on the reforms. And we, but, we encourage their feedback. why did you feedback. choose 17 business days originally? That's that's really what I'm trying to get to. What, how did that misunderstanding occur? Well, the, the government is always engaging with industry stakeholders to ensure that we continue to hear their thoughts and their feedback. The construction industry, as all would know, is going through uh, significant challenges and the reforms that we want to do are aimed at building quality housing, or dwellings and housing, for the people of New South Wales and that requires input from the sector. Okay, well how about we talk about some of those challenges. Uh, what steps is the government taking to address the delays, the significant delays, and we've got reports of $23 billion lost in major infrastructure projects caused by ongoing industrial action by the ETU? Well, the industrial actions of the ETU is actually between a, a, um, a, a, a company and its workforce. Of course, the government would actually be able to do more if the former government hadn't actually privatised these uh, particular companies. This is now a private industrial dispute between a company the former government privatised and its workforce. This is about a whole workforce that has significant influence on your party and I'm wondering if you've actually assessed the economic impact of what these um, delays will cost given the ETU's industrial action? Well, I said the ETU's industrial actions are with a company that the former government privatised. Um, that's a dispute, as an, a specific dispute between its workforce and the company. So are you um, saying that, <laughs> are you saying that uh, government related sectors and unions are not causing significant disruptions at the moment? Is that well, what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is that the dispute with ETU is between a privatised company with the former government pri privatised from public ownership and that all matters of industrial relations are best directed to the Minister of Industrial Relations. So you haven't uh, tried to calculate the impact of these disputes on the building and construction industry? Uh, all matters of industrial relations disputes are a matter for the Minister of Industrial Relations. Okay, so you're, you're just relying on public reports to understand how these ETU actions are actually significantly delaying construction, not just on infrastructure projects, but housing, which is obviously uh, part of what you've just said your government's goal is. So you're telling me that you haven't looked at any impact that the ETU is having on the building and construction sector? I'm telling you that the government is committed to ensure that we build quality housing for the people of New South Wales. And what actually really helps us is to ensure that the opposition doesn't table legislation that blocks a Todd development in around significant public infrastructure. I mean, did you vote for that bill, Ms Munro? We're actually the one that talking about the, well, your well, actions as a government well, because you're responsible for the delivery of a goal that your government has set and you're not meeting it. So I, I would that, say we, that's we are, actually up to you, Minister. I say we are all given responsible your in power. to ensure that we deliver quality housing for the people of New South Wales. And what doesn't help is when we have a blocking opposition or interested in nimbism or interested in politics... <laughs> Minister, supporting we're talking about in your the government's parliament. actions. Well, I, so I, I, let, let's go back to the building bill if you actually want to talk about stakeholder engagement and the, um, the outrage that so many industries have expressed because they haven't been consulted. Obviously, the chair earlier spoke about interior designers... Can you tell me what a designer is or what a building design is? Well, like I said, we are encouraging engaging with, um, uh, with stakeholders from across the sector for their input. But don't uh, you think, do, do you know, what, this do, is do you know how you would define this is those an, things? This is an important part of ensuring that we engage with all sectors of the economy. And what helps us, what helps us is ensure that we don't have an opposition that's playing political games putting um, um, legislation in the parliament that blocks building uh, construction. Minister, from we're talking about your bill. Could you tell me who's qualified to undertake unrestricted building design work? Well, uh, I said uh, the, 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 
The work of the government is to ensure we continue to engage with all stakeholders to help pull every single lever that we can. And what we don't need and what we don't want is oppositionist political game playing, I'm not, which prevents... I'm not game playing. I'm prevents, asking about your responsibilities as prevents, Minister. Which prevents... Uh, uh, construction of dwellings that New South Wales economy Okay, needs. but what you've told me so far is that you have actually had to delay this building bill because your uh, consultation process in the beginning wasn't sufficient and had to be addressed because stakeholders weren't happy about it. So in your bill, what would you say is a qualification to undertake unrestricted building design well, work. But this is the point of the consultation, where we get feedback. But what's your intention? And specific, the specific consult. Sorry, the specific Mr. there's been a point of order taken. Thank you. Chair, I have refrained from seeking a point of order, but I would just ask that the courtesy requirements of the procedural fairness resolution are upheld and the minister be given an adequate time to answer his question without interruption. Yeah, look, I, I would say that we're skating close again, and I would just remind um, the Honourable Jackie Munro um, I know it's frustrating when there's points of order constantly taken, um, but there is a really good way to avoid that, and that's just to listen to the points of order that are being taken and just to keep them in mind while asking questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Well, how about I ask this question? Could you please elaborate on how your bill distinguishes between the roles and responsibilities of architects and building designers under the new unrestricted classification? Well, this is the exact point of the consultation, where the details will be fine-tuned uh, from the stakeholders to determine what uh, is the best regulation. That's why we do consultation. We're not afraid of it, and we want to hear from industry. We want to engage, and we want to continue to refine uh, the proposed legislation, which delivers more housing, more quality housing, for the people of New South Wales. Okay, but if you wanted that extensive consultation, why did you agree to give 17 business days for stakeholders to respond to a 591-page oh, document? I'm proud to extend the consultation period to ensure that, that we get the question. finer details right, um, hearing from stakeholders from the sector to refine a significant piece of reform um, that the government is committed to delivering uh, to ensure we have quality houses for the people of New South Wales. Have you read the 591 pages, Minister? Well, the current bill is actually going out to consultation yeah. um, at the moment. So when we... But have you uh, read the, that? Well, well the, the bill is currently out for consultation and we'll continue to engage with this sector and it, it determine what the final bill will be. Can I take it from your answer, Minister, that you have not read the bill or the 591 pages? Well, like I said, the bill is currently out for consultation. It's important for us to hear from stakeholders uh, to ensure that we get the feedback to provide clarity, certainty and policy stability for the sector. Minister, how do you know what questions to ask when you're consulting with stakeholders if you haven't read the document yourself? Well, the government is consulting on a significant piece of reform and will continue to engage with stakeholders to get their feedback, to get their um, input and to ensure that any finer details of the proposed bill will actually be um, refined to deliver policy stability. So what questions would you ask, Minister? Uh, the Building Commission is leading the consultation on this front um, to ensure that we get um, policy stability, clarity and input from the sector and also to um, 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 maybe rectify any um, aspects in the sector that actually will prevent um, uh, if I'm saying it is appropriate how for the department to engage with the sector uh, on this matter. How can stakeholders have confidence in this process when the minister responsible for the legislation hasn't actually read this 591 page document that you expected stakeholders to respond to in 17 business days? Building trust and confidence, that's no pun intended, trust and confidence in the building sector is what this government has been doing since coming to office. We've done significant legislation to the building reforms, we're moving towards strata, and we're doing rental reform. Uh, I mean, but, we've but inherited read a legacy issue. Sorry, a legacy Minister, you've, you've just told the committee that this is a signature reform of yours as a minister, and... You're now saying to me that you, well, I presume, I have to assume because you haven't said that you have read it, that you haven't read this document. So what actually, 
what, what leadership are you showing as the minister to ensure that this bill is passed by your government? Well, when the bill is finalised, further details will be provided. So you're the ready building commission, The building commission is leading and appropriately leading the consultation with this sector to ensure we get the feedback, we get the um, input, and we get the level of engagement that will determine uh, what the final uh, bill will be and, and any specific issues that I'll raise, I'll continue to get advice as is appropriate. So given the extensive education and professional standards required for architects, how does the government plan to ensure that these standards remain high when building designers who may have varying qualifications are classified similarly under the unrestricted licence? Uh, this will, as part of the, it is part of the consultation process. So do you expect that this will be changed? Uh, this will be part of the consultation process and we're looking forward to the feedback from industry. But were you not aware of this in the previous mm -hmm. consultation that you said you did prior to the release of this 591 page document? Well the consultation process is about engaging and receiving feedback from particular associations and from the sector to ensure that we deliver on the government's commitment. So do you think it will be important to have measures implemented that prevent the dilution of professional standards? Uh, this will be part of the consultation process. But just as an opinion minister, do you think that that's important? Uh, it's important that we continue to engage with stakeholders and to gather their input. But do you have an idea of what you want out of this? The engagement process is being led by the Building Commission and we look forward and I encourage, I'm, I really encourage all stakeholders to provide their input representing their associations to determine what would be a, uh, what would be uh, the, some of the biggest building reforms that we've done in the last decade. So Minister, what do you think your role is in this? You are the Minister and yet you're sort of telling me that you weren't responsible for the 17 days. Um, you haven't read the document. You're not telling me your opinion on what you see as a, a kind of vision for this bill. So what do you think your role actually is? My role is to fix up the trust, the loss of trust and confidence that we inherited from your government. And that's what um, you where think that's doing that, now. This is, we, that's why our building reforms, our legislative program is, to build, read. Order, is to build high quality Sorry, homes. Sorry, Minister, there's been a point of order taken. Chair, the Minister asked what his vision was and he was given about five seconds in which to answer it. I just Not asked either. that the courtesy requirements be extended to, to him. Maybe yeah, I'll allow the question. Minister some time to answer the question. Yeah, well I said what the government wants is quality and quantity in parallel. We are not going to sacrifice uh, quality for quantity, which is what we inherited as a legacy issue with a lack of oversight, poor regulatory standards and no reform agenda. Quality homes is what we want to deliver for the people of New South Wales. And it also helps us when we don't have uh, opposition bills which block, which block, which deliberately block uh, development of our dwellings from happening. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that you talk about wanting more homes and then you support a bill that prevents homes from being built. Oh, Minister. I might... Um jump in there. So I might just turn to Fair Trading Minister yes, if, if you, you could. Yep. So can, um, can you provide the details on the number of qualified supervisors disciplined <coughs> under the Home Building Act during the financial years 22-23 and 23-24 for improper conduct? Um, specifically, how many cases involve spe specialists in the fields of electrical wiring, refrigeration, air conditioning, plumbing, gas fitting and LP gas fitting? Well, there, there, there are a number of questions um, um, yeah. in that, uh, uh, Ms McDonald, but I do appreciate your, your interest in that. But I do know um, that, you know, so far in this particular 23-24 year, we've had about 44,000 uh, complaints. Um, we've done over 11,437 inspections um, and, and you know, part of the compliance and enforcement, I might even ask the Fair Trading Commissioner if she's able to, um, or the Building Committee is able to further provide specific, because they were quite specific, four decimal point uh, uh, questions, and I might ask the Acting Building Commissioner to um, provide further details. Thank you, Minister. Yes, I can help with some of that. So I think your question was around um, qualified supervisors in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to get that for you on notice, but of the decisions that we've done under the Home Building Act, I could say uh, proportionally about 80% um, are related to builders. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be a subset of those. I think it'd be your, in your 
in your okay, answer. So I, might, I might do that on notice then, yeah, so that sure. you get, you've got the um, the specifics of that question. And then as a follow up on notice, um, what steps is the department taking to enhance that detection and handling of improper conduct among specialists to prevent um, further consumer harms? So I'll, I'll do that one on notice as well, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just as a, a follow-up to you, Minister, sure. um, how many electrical contractors were disciplined under the home building, I think I said that, uh, uh, during 22-23 and, and 24 for improper conduct related to, and this is different, non-compliance with their duties under the WHS Act regulations, particularly concerning... Um, Oh, look, that, that's a very specific question. I, I'm happy to take that one on notice. But, on or notice. I may even ask the Acting Commissioner if he has that specific statistic might, on Because I've only on got data. 19 seconds, I might say take that one on notice. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that. That's fine. Well, right. I, I could say in that electrical space, if this helps, that we've issued 607 written direction notices. How many, sorry? 607 yep. written direction notices. Um, I don't have on hand how many um, of those activities are related in disciplinary action. Thank you. Um, are there any government questions? No, we're very happy with the Minister's answers. Thank you. In that case, then we go to morning tea break um, and we'll be back at 11.15. Thank you very much.
What does that mean for us? Thank you, and welcome back. <coughs> um, we will begin with questions from the crossbench. I'll throw to Ms Abigail Boyd. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, Minister, and good morning, to all Ms. the Boyd. officials. Good morning to you. Um, I wanted to start, I was listening um, when you were talking about uh, New South Wales's, I guess, reliance <coughs> on coal as mm -hmm. an export um, yes. and what you were doing to, to try and change yes. that mix. Um, given the um, announcement of a new missiles manufacturer opening up in Newcastle, um, is the intention to turn Newcastle into an exporter of weapons to replace the coal export? Well, new, the Newcastle economy, well, thank you, uh, Ms. Boyd. The new South, Newcastle economy, as it transitions away from coal, has gone through a, a quite, I would say, quite a successful journey. Um, the biggest employers in Newcastle, as I recall, mm. is actually education and health, mm. um, and we can see that in its workforce. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, those regions, particularly those coal-dependent regions, mm. actually have a very strong manufacturing and skill set base, which can be applied across all different sectors. Yep. There seems to be um, growing awareness of a conflict or a, a competition for skills and labour across the sort of renewable um, green energy <coughs> sector and the now growing weapons manufacture um, sector in New South Wales. Does that concern you? And does the government have plans to redirect people into um, green energy as a preference over weapons manufacture? Well, the government, um, as you rightly say, and as I said earlier this morning, diversification of our economy keeps our economy resilient, it's agile, and actually provides employment and income opportunities, in particular for our regional communities. I think the journey of urbanisation, those who have studied, has seen a lot of our regional communities not perhaps benefit as much from the economic transition. So that's why, um, um, I suppose, differences in what were old coal mining communities like the mm -hmm. Illawarra and like Newcastle have really transferred in the mm. services sector, like yep. in health and education, but also they have such strong physical manufacturing skill set base, mm -hmm. which can be used in areas like uh, clean energy, which the government mm -hmm. is totally committed to as one of our uh, strategic priorities, yep. um, and which was certainly encouraging greater investment and great opportunities for, for When you're for planning, people. like we're looking to government to, to go, okay, what is the ideal industry mix here? Um, what percentage are you anticipating that in, you know, 10 years time we're going to have in weapons manufacture versus green energy? Well, look, I think what we want to, um, um, I suppose concentration risk um, in any economy is mm. very, it's very, it's very risky. Um, because it means your economy is unable to absorb or adjust to shocks that are beyond your control. Mm. So what you need to do is grow as many sectors as you can. Things like medtech are very significant in New South What about when they're in competition, though, with each other? So if you've got the urgent need to get renewables online as quickly as possible, we've got a certain... Mm -hmm. um, uh, set of skills coming out, of, particularly out of that um, coal industry and out of the fossil fuel industry, that could be deployed readily into green technology, or they could get sort of, you know, <coughs> siphoned off by the big weapons manufacturers. What are you doing to ensure that we're prioritising renewable energy over yeah. weapons manufacturing? The government has made no secret that renewable energies and the transition to net zero is an important mm -hmm. strategic objective, not only environmentally, mm -hmm. but also economically as well. Now, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge and recognise that skill sets are actually not um, specific to any particular industry. So, no. so when we talk about manufacturing, it's mm. actually not a sector, it's actually a skill set, mm -hmm. which can be easily transferable between and deployed different, into different industries. Well, and, and, mm -hmm. that, and that's why investing in our skill set. I know yep. my colleague, Minister Wan, yep. uh, is making a significant policy reform and investment in TAFE-free education. Okay. With our respect, tapes, Minister, yep. though, the question was, what percentage of industry mix do you think should be renewables? And how much do you think should be weapons well, manufacturing in New South Wales? I would say what the ultimate goal in any economic restructuring is ensure that we don't have concentration risk. I, I don't think 
um, you know, industries will emerge and mm. also be disrupted, uh, but it's just important that we have a, the greatest spread as we can okay. to keep our um, economic base resilient. If I put it another way then, how much weapons manufacture is too much weapons manufacture in New South Wales? Well, I, I said, look, I, 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 look, I understand that um, you uh, 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 personally, and, and that's that obviously has some thoughts about the defence issue, but I can also say that, you know, um, 40% of Australia's uh, defence and space mm. industry does mm. happen in New South Wales. So I think there's defence. I think when people talk about defence, people think of our defence force and protecting mm. Australia. And then we have weapons manufacture. Um, what we have mm. at the moment, and most of that gets exported to other countries and used potentially against civilians, as we've seen recently. Mm. Um, given the agreements that have been made with these really large weapons manufacturers around Western Sydney Airport, given the news about a missile factory now around Newcastle Airport, is there a plan by this government to replace coal export with weapons export? We, we, we want to replace coal as it's, everybody knows the trajectory of fossil fuels, and we want to replace it with many different sectors as possible. Okay, but to, weapons? What, what I said, the defence manufacturing has already existed in New South Wales for quite a long time. Yep. Um, and and it, it, need, it, it is part of the broader mix yep. of our economy. So things like medtech are significant. Yep. Agritech is also significant. Given the ethical concerns with a lot of that weapons manufacture, what um, limits has New South Wales put on the type of weapons that could be manufactured in New South Wales? Are we going to be seeing, um, you know, more of this uh, drone technology coming out of here? Are we going to see AI being used to, um, you know, selectively target more civilians in order to shoot them down? Like, what is, at what point does the government say, actually, this type of weapons manufacturer is perhaps not ethical? Are there rules in place? Are you well, setting up restrictions? Look, 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 sir. My job as the Minister for Industry and Trade mm. is to try to encourage new and emerging industries to Regardless replace... Regardless of the ethics? ..to, to replace um, the coal industry mm. to ensure that we have a diversified economy mm -hmm. and actually a very strong skill set base that is easily transferable from one sector to the other. So, so Minister, you've met with a concerning number of weapons manufacturing companies in the last... Well, since you were appointed. Um, from everything from the very large ones to the um, to the companies that are um, involved in in producing, um, you know, the sort of I guess the technical aspects mm -hmm. of other people's weapons. There's a whole bunch of different yeah. manufacturers, and you've met with a, a really huge number of those, um, and not very many um, energy sector companies. Um, is it your focus as Minister for Industry and Trade to um, effectively make New South Wales's economy reliant on the manufacture of weapons? No, look, as I said, uh, I will meet with um, anyone that seeks to mm -hmm. create employment and economic opportunity mm. uh, for the people in this, as we diversify so, our economy and, okay. and re request, I suspect that the the, um, the number of differences you've got. I, I suspect mm. a lot of um, energy companies might first go first towards Minister Sharp as the first point right. of court, but of course, but when I'd we're be looking open at these, we're looking at the AE systems, Lockheed Martin, um, a whole bunch of um, weapons manufacturers, really big global manufacturers, that we know their weapons are being used to target civilians in different wars around the world. At what point does New South Wales say, actually, we don't want to be an exporter of that kind of weapon, and we're going to put some limits on it. Are there going to be ever yeah, any limits, so, so or it's just we increase, we're just getting as much money as we can I out suppose of this industry? I suppose I make a couple of points because there are a few questions in that. The first yeah. point is around export of mm -hmm. um, um, defence equipment. Now that's a matter weapons. for the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and determine what you know, comes out of the country. Yeah. Um, are you getting also, pressure from the federal government to try and meet this AUKUS agreement by producing more? complicated and nasty weapons out of New South Wales? Well, no, no I'm not getting any pressure from our, my Commonwealth colleagues. My job is to ensure that we um, put uh, engagement and policies in place to diversify our economy. I can say you, you, you um, earlier this morning, um, is as a demonstration of the government's commitment yeah. to cleaner energy, um, myself, 
Okay. Minister Scully and Minister Sharp sure. held Where are a the... hydrogen roundtable. Okay, with but I'm a... talking about weapons. Yeah. Where are the limits that New South Wales... At what point do you go... Because you consult all of these um, weapons manufacturers. At what point do you consult with the people of New South Wales and say, do you want these weapons made in New South Wales well, being used against civilians? Because, Where's uh, that consultation being, well, Minister? I, I suppose I'd, you also have to recognise too, uh, Ms Boyd, that um, the, the sector... Uh, does employ over 22,000 people yeah. in New South Wales. What I'm hearing from you is there is no ethical yeah. limit. There is no point at which you go, actually, New South Wales doesn't want to be involved well, in look, that kind I, of weapons manufacturing. Yeah, look, I, I, I accept you have a position um, uh, which is different to mine on the defence and aerospace it's industry. I, I want to ensure that as the Minister for Industry and Trade mm. to push the government's agenda when it comes to skilling our people when it comes to creating the capability and the capacity to move from one sector to another. Right. And that so it's the government's agenda people. not to have any ethics when it comes well, to weapons It's the government's agenda to Got always it. continue to find ways to provide economic and employment opportunity mm. for the people Regardless of New South of Wales. The industry and the ethics. Mr Higginson. Thank you. Um, Minister, I just want to briefly revisit um, the situation of Kelly Lane yes. at the moment. I'm not sure if you've been briefed, but I just want to go back to my original proposition. Why is it that the system is currently torturing Kelly Lane? And that's my view. I'm the one who has formed that view based on everything I've seen and I've read and what I understand. And acknowledging that right now, her mental condition is in serious risk of harm um, and she is really suffering. Look, uh, firstly, can I um, uh, say, look, I, I really acknowledge your interest in Ms Lane. Um, I said I am reluctant to um, make specific comments about um, any particular inmate, um, but all allocation of inmates are done operationally by the Acting Commission in terms of their risk classification. And I will speak, I will speak with um, Acting yes. Commissioner Taylor later, but I'm just concerned, Minister, are you concerned that there are people in the system that the objective view is that they are actually being tortured. This is not punishment. Uh, this is like we are torturing somebody. Uh, Does it concern you? Well, I said corrective services um, ensures that um, inmates are risk allocated appropriately and obviously get the level She's of... She's been a model inmate. She's provided support mm -hmm. for all of her inmate fellow inmates. She provided serious evidence and testimony in the Astal inquiry. She's an impacted female inmate. She has done her time. She has literally made one small error that she had no idea was an error while she was on work leave. She's been held in maximum security since that event. She has just been released out of maximum security and told she can't have any day leave visits for at least six months. And this is not on parity with any other prisoner. Like, why are we doing this to her? I said all risk classification matters are um, um, undertaken operationally by the Acting Commissioner. For your um, um, uh, information, uh, Ms Higginson, I've actually spoken to the Acting Commissioner during the break and I've asked for specific advice regarding um, uh, Ms Lane. Thank you very and much. And we can certainly um, Thank have you. future conversations uh, about that once I get that advice. Thank you. I'm very grateful. There are people seriously concerned about her wellbeing right now. Um, can I just talk to you briefly, Minister, about the education access for inmates yes. in prisons? Um, again, I know you and I have spoken yes. about this, and I know that we have that you are absolutely cognizant of the impacts in terms of health and well-being and the reduction of recidivism when inmates have access to education. Um, are you aware of? Cody Ward, who is, again, this is an individual circumstance, yes. and the reason I say this is because I know that he has written to you um, with multiple times and has been advocating fiercely to go to university. Um, he's been approved to attend study on campus, but is currently being blocked from this opportunity because he cannot gain access to a secure computer while he's in prison. His future is currently being put on a very cruel hold 
because of this. Will you help him? Oh, look, I, I am aware of the complaints from um, the particular inmate. I said I'm really um, reluctant, as a general rule, to talk about specific mm. inmates, namely also for their privacy as well. Um, but certainly, I don't think you and I, or you know, I, just, I hope, that many would disagree that access to education and training does is an important part of so, the Minister, rehabilitation on that, and journey. I do know that you believe this, and I do know you understand this, but both you and the Acting Commissioner have responded, assuring them that he's free to pursue this study. But you just know, because of the technical limit, li techn technology limitations, he just can't. And the reason I speak yeah. his name is because he is one of so many that contact mm. my office. They are ready, they're willing, they're able. Many mm. inmates actually commence their education. They commence their study mm. and then they're cut off because of the technology limitations <coughs> of being able to continue. Yeah. I'm not sure there's much worse. Mm. Somebody has a start, they get a start up and then they're stopped. It's more than cruel. And this is the state that is doing this. So what, what can we do, Minister? Yeah, well, well, certainly, um, as I said, no one would disagree that education and training is in a very critical part of the rehabilitation journey. Um, in terms of um, unlimited access to technology, we, there are security issues involved and we just need to be mindful of those uh, issues and we need to balance the, both the needs of um, inmates who are seeking to uh, be rehabilitated through education and training, um, but also mind security it has for the whole system. If I can, um, uh, if I can just share with you and share with the committee also about the importance of this. I visited one of our facilities and I met a, uh, a young inmate who was only in his early 20s and he was almost um, about to be released. And he'd actually worked on some um, a, a, a construction of 20 new beds at our, one of our facilities, and he actually obtained his plumbing um, experience and qualification as part whilst he's in, uh, whilst he's been an inmate. And that journey for him um, has been quite transformative, and they're the sort of stories that Corrections um, wants to do more of, um, bearing in mind the different, I suppose, risk classification, because no two inmates would have almost identical circumstances. So what we need to do is to ensure that those who are seeking to change their lives have access to those resources. I can also let the um, community know there are 100, we, we employ over 100 full-time employees who are dedicated <coughs> to education and training for our inmates as part of the rehabilitation journey. That's right, Minister, but we are also talking about university education and there <coughs> seems to be, there seems to be, and absolutely the trades are incredibly important and it is good that there are a few good stories, and they really are only a few, unfortunately. But why are we, why are we not <coughs> enabling and assisting inmates who want to access university tertiary education? Why are we not helping them? Why is it like they don't deserve to attend those courses? Well, well, I, I don't think. I share that conclusion that they don't deserve it. Like then there's, but there's all these arbitrary policies that just stop inmates from being able to do this? I, I suppose um, specifically the operations of the programs of accessing in particular to technology, the balance between security <coughs> risk for the inmates themselves and also for the officers at our facilities needs to be balanced as well. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to defer to the Acting Commissioner on specific technological access for higher education, um, because as I said, I don't think we disagree. But so you're aware role. that the secure technology exists. It's all there. Something is happening within the system that is denying the individuals who are ready, willing and able, and some of them already participating. So the, there are systems to let this and make this happen, but we're not getting the support for these people in the system. Something is going very wrong. Look, look. I said, no one would disagree um, where we try to provide as many training opportunities as we can and skills. And that's only in vocation. No, and what I mean, sorry, is, Minister, is that they exist a, a, and w we're not deploying them in New South mm -hmm. Wales the same as places are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like Victoria, for example, 
is way ahead of where New South Wales is. Why are we, why are we so behind in our system? Well, I, I, we do run a number of educational programs. I, I'm not saying we don't. At our, our um, intensive learning centres in across, you know, Lismore, the North Coast, South Coast and Wellington, um, and also using a TAFE as, and a partnership with that as well. So I, I do think we, uh, or we the, the department does actually um, provide opportunities to learn, both vocational and higher education, but balancing with the constraints of the system. So what are those constraints? What, what are you suggesting? Like why, it's just, it's just so wrong when you have people who are accessing education and then all of a sudden they can't because the secured laptops aren't mm -hmm. able to be used for education purposes. They can be used for legal purposes. Okay, can so I just say, I'll, I'll take it up. I will, take it up. I will definitely take it up. To, um, can I just so ask you with my yes. final 31 seconds, um, what, are, what are you doing to assist the staff uptake within Corrections New South Wales, given there are so many people out of work on mental health leave and on stress leave, and there are positions that are just not filled. What are you doing to change that position? Well, look, certainly um, creating a, a safe workplace is a high priority for the Department for Corrections. Um, staff relating matters are best answered by the Acting Commissioner. I'm, I, I'm happy to ask him to uh, answer those questions now. I'll if, take if it. I will wish, definitely take it up with the up. Acting Commissioner um, later. Thank you, Minister. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Opposition, the Honourable Aileen MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Minister. And I, I'll, I'll continue on the uh, corrections line okay. since, since we've started. And I wanted to, to turn to um, the machinery of government yes. changes. Yes. Minister, who initiated the proposal to separate corrective services from the Department of Communities and Justice? Yep. So, so um, on the 16th of August, uh, the New South Wales Government, the Premier and I, announced that Corrections New South Wales would be a standalone public agency from the 1st of October. <coughs> the main um, uh, reason, one of the main reasons behind this was that to make corrections consistent and similar to other frontline agencies like fire and rescue, um, rural fire, and also the SES. So it's about consistency in, uh, um, uh, in the structure. And of course, um, that is part of the government's reform of corrections to ensure that it uh, remains contemporary and delivers um, the outcomes that the government is seeking to Thank as you. part of the Thank reform you. agenda. And, and when this decision um, was made, was the change, has it been costed? It, it's just a, a, a change in machinery of government, mm -hmm. um, which is a, I suppose it, it's just a legal and corporate structure. Um, and. It, 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 that's all, all it is, is about keeping it consistent with other frontline agencies yes. in terms of the way government um, uh, frontline agencies are actually structured. Mm -hmm. but, but, but what will the, what will it cost? Oh, look, I, I'm advised it's cost neutral because it, it's just a, um, a, a, a restructure of the reporting lines and to make it consistent like other frontline agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, or will there be any additional roles that will be created to facilitate um, the functioning of this as an independent agency? Well, the, the, the corrections, as I said, we've just gone through the mod changes um, and, and the government just wanted to make it consistent. And at this stage, there are no cost implications around the mod changes that have been enacted. And so no additional staff? will be required to manage the administration, administrative roles? Well, there's no cost impact. Okay. It's a separation of um, the administrative um, processes or the structure right. of, of corrections. And um, has the position for a commissioner been advertised as yet? Uh, we've, as part of the MOG changes, um, we are currently going through the process of recruitment. Okay, all right. Well, I might turn to the Astle inquiry. Um, so under recommendation 31, or, or the recommendation 31 of the, in, of the inquiry was yes. that um, every executive of CSNSW should complete the entry level correctional officer training as part of any onboarding for their respective role. Yes. 
and prior to any substantive uptake of the executive position. Um, do you, how many executives are there within CSNSW? Uh, in terms of the SCS numbers, is that is that where you're... Yep. Look, I, I'm happy to take that on, take notice, on notice, or I can even ask okay. the Acting Commissioner. He might have an answer All for right, you I, now. I can ask later. Uh, yeah. Um, so, do you know how many have completed the entry-level correctional officer training then? Yeah, well, my expectation um, is that all senior executive services uh, executives within corrections undertake all the appropriate training um, to ensure that we deliver the reforms that have emanated from Judge McClellan's uh, special commission of inquiry into the, um, the, the, the crimes of the former officer. Okay. And um, what do you have a date in mind that, that um, the cohort will complete the training? Well, I know you said it's your expectation sure. that they would. Um, do you have a date? Well, I, I said um, the reform uh, uh, journey um, is both short, medium and long term. But certainly my expectation is for those in senior positions should undertake all the appropriate training that's required to deliver on the government's reform agenda and to bring greater trust and confidence back to the corrective service system. I'm, I'm happy to ask the Acting Commissioner um, who may have more information on this. No, no, it's okay. I can come back to that in, in the afternoon. Um, I might turn, because we did spend a bit of time last estimates talking about the, the Juni Correctional Centre, and I understand that you have now visited um, the uh, centre in January of this year, according to your diary um, disclosure. <coughs> what is the current cost to the state for running the um, Juni Correctional Centre? So, uh, as um, uh, our members were well aware, uh, the government uh, put Juni back into yep. uh, public operations mm -hmm. um, as become part of the wider network of CS um, corrective services. We have a dedicated team at the centre working with staff at, uh, at, at the facility, but also engaging with the wider community about the change in its operation. I'm happy to ask the Acting Commissioner um, to provide more details um, um, uh, on the around cost. The work around, around June. Right. I'm not sure. I think we might have covered the cost in last estimates, but we can get that on notice. I don't have those numbers okay. in the on notes notice. today. Okay. Do you know how many inmates are currently held at Juni? Uh, at at, at Juni? Mm -hmm. um, look, I, I'm happy to take that one on notice. Okay. I'll take um, that on notice. That's quite a specific it's around 740. Yeah. Thank you. 740. Thank you. And, um, I might turn to um, earlier the, the bail and other legislation amendment domestic violence bill yes. was um, finally passed and it did three things or it will do three things. It will amend the test um, for the grant of bail, yes. introduce electronic monitoring yes. for some DV offenders given bail and ensure that yes. magistrates not registered make <coughs> bail decisions. So. I'm interested, have the numbers on remand increased since the 20th of June, which this is the date of assent of that bill? Uh, so do you, you want to... Uh, I want to know, have, yeah. you know, from the, the ha, people on remand, have, has yeah, that yeah, number so, increased? So, yes, in short, um, but I think you, I understand your question to be connecting those on remand, specifically those who have come under the changes yes. in the bail legislation. So I think mm -hmm. there are two questions there. Yes. So in terms of the remand numbers, I understand there has been an increase mm -hmm. in the number of those on remand. I specifically, um, the secretary might be able to um, provide more details. Just, on just by way of uh, clarification, <coughs> if I may, I think there are three relevant uh, provisions in that legislation mm -hmm. that are effectively being turned on at, at different times. Um, so electronic monitoring, uh, which is the corrective services uh, component, uh, is yet to go live. We anticipate that going uh, live in early October. Okay. Clearly the show cause uh, provision, which I think is material to your question, uh, yep. has commenced. Um, and thirdly, the um, 
the move to have registrars out of the process of bail determination. Uh, that is a provision which we anticipate uh, will go live when effectively all of the changes have been completed by the end of uh, the year. Uh, there has been, which we can perhaps take on notice unless the Acting Commissioner has the numbers, there of course has been a, um, a movement in the numbers. Okay. And the, um, it's the around the Molly Ticehurst tragedy was on the 21st of April, mm -hmm. so from that date there have been an additional 34 offenders remanded on domestic and family violence charges on average since that date. But if I may just chime in and say though there are probably two uh, drivers for that. So as we saw uh, after the Lint siege, we saw an uptick in uh, remand determinations of the courts, notwithstanding the fact that there was no uh, amendment to the law. There's both been the um, show cause provision uh, going live, but there also, ahead of that, I believe, was an uptick, a small uptick in remand numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's only a small one. So do you think, um, Minister, uh, if the remand population is not increasing, are the new bail laws working then in protecting women? Well, I suppose the, the role of corrections um, in this uh, uh, reform is to accommodate those that are sent through by the court um, and we'll do that in a way that assesses the risk of each particular inmate that comes through to create a, a, the safest working environment, mm -hmm. not only for the inmates, but also for our officers as well. Okay, I might um, return to those questions in the afternoon sure, session. Sure. Okay. Um. <coughs> Minister, how many correctional officers are currently suspended on full pay within the correction system? Uh, look, I I'm happy to defer that to the Acting Commissioner. Um, well, what I would say is that, um, as Minister, my expectation is that a safe workplace is a high priority and that any allegations of misconduct and misbehaviour needs to be thoroughly investigated and the appropriate action to take place. I might hand over to the um, Acting Commissioner for those specifics. Uh, there um, are so currently 82 corrections staff suspended. I don't have the split between on pay and without pay. The without pay number is a small number. I'll, um, I'll try and have that answer this afternoon. So, Minister, just on, on the previous answer that you provided, yes. um, can you explain as to the reasons why a correctional officer would be suspended on full pay within the correction system? Well, I, I suppose um, each... Uh, allegation of misconduct and misbehaviour will be very different. Those that are much more uh, egregious, of course, will be handled uh, differently to those allegations which are um, assessed as being of lower risk. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult to apply a universal rule given there are different variations of what those allegations are when it comes to the type of misconduct and misbehaviour. Okay. Minister, I've had um, an officer who is yes. currently suspended uh, and she's, uh, so her name is Leanne Cameron from the yes. Francis Greenway Correctional <coughs> Complex. She's been suspended on full pay since the 20th of October 2023. Yes. Um, and she was recently advised her case had been reviewed and that she remains suspended on full pay with ongoing reviews to take place every 30 days. <coughs> Minister, do you know how long she will remain suspended and um, why she has been suspended? Well, well I think, I, as I said um, earlier, I'm really reluctant to talk about specific cases, yep. mainly as um, a courtesy to the privacies of people, yep. um, their own privacies, but um, as I said, there's got to be a process of procedural fairness in any investigation and that investigations that are undertaken um, are taken with the full light of information um, and to ensure that any um, findings obviously gives the particular individual mm -hmm. um, um, an opportunity to respond 
um, accordingly. So I think it's a case of these are really operational matters, staff matters that are that. a matter for the acting commissioner. Thank you, Minister. Um, he can either answer it now for you no, or I can you ask can later. do that this yeah. afternoon. I, I just, um, so if you yes. said that, that there's 82 staff yeah. suspended, um, assume that they're all on full pay, mm -hmm. accruing annual leave, long service leave, sick leave, 11% super. Mm -hmm. How is Corrective Services accounting for this in their budget? So, so you know, I just take you back one step around um, uh, staff allegations against uh, misconduct and misbehaviour. As part of the mall changes, uh, uh, Ms McDonald, we are reforming the um, uh, investigation, professional standards investigation unit mm -hmm. to make sure <coughs> that we're able to more efficiently um, investigate and produce an outcome as quickly as we can. This is actually part of the reform agenda and also <coughs> um, one of the issues that was highlighted by Judge McClellan mm -hmm. in his report on ASTL. So uh, certainly um, we've got a, a big agenda yep. when it comes to corrections to try to, to address some of the issues mm -hmm. that were identified um, through Judge McClellan's process. So and said uh, operational matters specifically on any Staffing matter is, is not appropriate for any no. minister to intervene individually. Mm -hmm. It's operational matters that well, if are best I, if I managed do it by the um, by the uh, acting commission. On, on the, the number, I just wanted, just if I can go back to my question, yes. how much, um, or, or sorry, is corrective services accounting for this in their budget unit? Uh, well, well I, I said it's difficult to say um, financially because each case will be different yes and the jet no i'm just saying as a, i'm not saying leanne in of the the to mm -hmm. i might i'll come back to that question sure i i also um am concerned um the officer has had no contact from senior management no welfare checks or updates regarding her case is this the usual process for suspensions in corrective services? Uh, sure, um, that's a staffing matter. So the employer function rests with the acting commissioner. So I'm happy to ask the acting commissioner if he's able to provide um, some information on that. Yeah, look, I'm happy to take and uh, take Ms Cameron's case on and, and have a look at it. There are supports in place, including people's line managers, but also professional standards has its own uh, support um, team. So. We engage with suspended staff in, in different ways through either managers or that support team or our um, our wellbeing team. So um, I understand certainly... that um, this officer hasn't had any contact from her line manager, hasn't been offered any support throughout um, her suspension. Oh, it would concern me if there's been no support, so I'll yeah. take advice on, on that. Yes, Secretary, if I may augment the... Um, Acting Commissioner's comments, the PSI model uh, is being restructured, it's being redesigned. Mm -hmm. It would be absolutely conceded that the process needs to, subject to uh, principles of natural justice and procedural fairness, uh, move more quickly. That is absolutely our focus. If I can also add that um, in the commentary of uh, Mr McCollum's report, Special Commission of Inquiry report, uh, he spoke about an independent uh, line of oversight uh, and responsibility to the Secretary. The Commissioner and I work closely and in lockstep. However, under the MOG, there is a degree of uh, independence and distance to ensure that where there are cases uh, which um, are not meeting the threshold uh, in terms of speed of movement, determination of outcome or the like, uh, that there is an extra filter, an extra means of accountability to improve the quality uh, of uh, decision making. I should also add that there are some officers that are currently suspended without yep. pay. So, in, so you just mentioned then on the restructure and, and um, you know, trying to make it more efficient. When will this come into effect? Because, I mean, this it appears that the review is taking so long. Uh, the government last week responded to the 31 recommendations. There is a task force uh, which is working through all those recommendations. There'll be a timetable which will, now that that process is complete and now that we have an allocation of uh, $30 million, that will allow us to have certainty and to schedule all of those changes. In terms of the uh, PSI change, that has been 
designed and we are working closely with corrective services to implement that now so we're actively into the implementation over the coming months. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, in the absence of, um, you know, when, when an officer is suspended, obviously uh, temporaries or, or other people have to be brought in to backfill their roles? Uh, well, that, that's an operation, certainly, where um, there are, because vacancies happen for a range of reasons. Uh, people take um, personal leave or they'll have maternity <coughs> leave or parents parental leave. Um, and also if they're unwell. So certainly, where possible, I know um, the Acting Commissioner and um, the governors of the specific um, facilities will seek to uh, obviously make arrangements for staffing to fill those vacancies mm. where they occur. Yeah. And um, so you did acknowledge then, so how can, um, like with, we have staff shortages, yes. how, can, how can this situation be sustainable if you've got Officers that are suspended, and then yeah. Well, I, I'd also say, um, Ms. McDonald, that uh, corrections has over ten thousand employees, and certainly where possible, it is a flexible working arrangement in terms yeah. of moving um, officers to fill in vacancies when they occur. And I said they occur for a range of reasons: um, a personal leave, parental leave, being unwell. Yep. service group. So Thank you. when these situations occur, um, the respective um, uh, corrections as executives will make the appropriate arrangements. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have, are, you are you aware of a shortage of female sanitary products at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre? Uh, look, I, I think um, certainly when it comes to our female inmates, um, the, the care and the welfare and their well-being of female inmates is important. But certainly if there are issues around that product, well, we certainly want to make sure that our female inmates have all um, the products they require um, for, as part of their wellbeing and their welfare. Uh, thank you. Minister. Um, yes. Uh, in regards to the recommendation from the Special um, yes. Commission of Inquiry report, um, there was a recommendation that a women's strategy be implemented to oversee the strategic and operational issues for female inmates. <laughs> Um, have you begun work on this strategy? Uh, yes, I, I can advise, uh, Chair, that when it comes to addressing the recommendations for our female mates, um, we've actually allocated um, $3.2 million for mm -hmm. an external women's advocacy, which has been designed by Legal Aid New South Wales, and also a further $1.2 million for staff training, um, as well as change management, which comes with the recommendations around uh, the women's strategy. Thank you. Um, and when will work begin on that? I understand that there's funding, but when will we start to see things implemented? Ah, look, I'm happy to defer to the Acting Commissioner in terms of so its that, implementation. That strategy covers the things that the Minister mentioned, but it's also much broader than just the operations of Dilwini. It's the management of women uh, across the state. We're seeing a substantial increase um, more recently in the population of um, women in custody. Mm -hmm. um, so that strategy will be more than just still winnier. Um, either now, perhaps this afternoon, uh, Assistant Commissioner Galusis, who will be working on that strategy through her team, there's already substantial work happening in that space, will lead that work. I don't mm -hmm. think we have an end date for that work, but it's, it's certainly started. We need yeah. to get it right. And there's, there's lots of people that we need to consult um, through that to get it right. There's lots of good models in other places that we want to look at. So um, we certainly don't want to put an artificial date that, that means we don't end up with the right model. Um, having said that, we don't want it to take forever and you know end up uh, not improving um, the conditions for women in custody, which is a priority for us. Thank you. Um, on the 21st of August, Minister, the New South Wales Ombudsman released its report on inmate discipline in corrective cent correctional centres. Um, and it makes some quite damning findings, including the systemic failure to follow legislation and policies and relate to inmate discipline, unjust and potentially unlawful outcomes, maladministration through the disciplinary process. Um, given this report, um, on top of the report into uh, Mr Astle, um, do you accept that there are major problems within our corrective systems um, that need to be addressed urgently? Well, look, look certainly uh, the government has inherited a, it's got a number of legacy issues when it comes to corrections. And part of the 
foundation for reform is through Judge McLean's Special Commission of Inquiry. Um, I do welcome the Ombudsman's report. I actually had a meeting with the Ombudsman and with the Acting Commissioner in uh, at the meeting to discuss the findings. I am aware of the management process in terms of um, disciplining, uh, disciplinary actions um, between officers and inmates, and we do have a remediation plan already in development to address some of the findings from the Ombudsman's report. Thank you. Um, can I ask specifically what actions you've taken um, you know, since that meeting that you had with the Ombudsman? Ah, look, the, the, the meeting with Ombudsman was only very recently, okay. um, but um, I, I said the engagement at that meeting was very useful um, to ensure that we actually um, take the steps. So some of the things that we have, uh, that we've already instigated are about including a communication training to, to our staff as they interact uh, with inmates to also <coughs> understand the uh, limits of their statutory uh, authority, so really I suppose um, making it clearer what um, process they need to go through as part of their um, the procedures in disciplining inmates. Um, there's also um, um, the work done around to provide uh, at the executives with the options for a, a, a much more uh, broader, much more robust uh, interdisciplinary uh, system. Um, we're also examining um, use of behaviour management as a potential alternative to apply it as instead of of actually going through the charging process of inmates. So in other words, as an alternative to discipline, perhaps we can try other alternatives like behavioural change. So mm. this journey of addressing the Ombudsman report is important to the government and, and I've made those expectations clear to the Acting Commissioner and that all staff involved um, will be uh, provided with the appropriate information to continue the journey of reform when it comes to corrections. Uh, Minister, as a former psychologist, I was particularly concerned to read that um, inmates whose behaviour would more appropriately warrant referral to mental health support, um, for example, um, self-harming yes. behaviours, um, are being dealt with through a disciplinary process. Um, obviously, there's some aspects of this that are, are urgent, such as that. Um, what interim steps are you taking now to ensure that um, where an issue where an inmate um, is in desperate need of help, that they actually get that help? Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. We already started the process to review how inmate discipline uh, is actually applied. Um, um, Chair, you may be well aware corrections has part of the option, but when it comes to uh, mental health issues, we work very closely with Justice Health, which is um, under the ministerial responses of Minister Park. But that collaboration between corrections and Justice Health is an important function where we continue to collaborate and uh, work together to provide specific care, in particular those inmates who have um, uh, challenges around their mental wellbeing. I just want to know, and I understand you're saying that you're reviewing it, but you know, while this review is going on, I'm concerned that you know this is quite an extreme mm -hmm. issue. Um, are there any sort of really specific steps that you're taking in this interim moment while that review is occurring to make sure that? Um, inmates who potentially uh, have uh, mental health concerns, yeah. that they're treated for that instead of disciplined? Well, look, as I said, uh, we do work closely with mental uh, justice health, and I think they are really uh, much more uh, qualified clinically and, and, and professionally to assist um, corrections. But if you're after specific programs that we've done, I can either take that on notice mm -hmm. um, or ask the Acting Commissioner to elaborate, but certainly, um, we are aware, we've actually taken on board the Ombudsman's report. Mm -hmm. We've begun the journey of changing the way um, inmate discipline is managed and also equipping our staff to better understand their statutory um, obligations returning to, um, in regarding to inmate discipline. Look, in all fairness, it's also a very complex environment. Of course. Um, and inmates will have a variety of needs and challenges and corrections working with Justice Health will ensure we try to do that as best as we can. 
Thank you. And I might come back to the Acting Commissioner this afternoon. I'm keen to hear from you, but um, as I've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, Minister, it's been reported in the media that you are looking at legislative reform around the correction system. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the reforms that you're looking into? Uh, well, as, as best reforms we could, will be based on the recommendations of um, uh, of the uh, uh, the special commissioner required from Judge McClellan. We are looking at some legislative changes to the CAS Act, um, but that will go through the process of our consultation, both internally and externally. Um, and we're also looking at uh, issues, for example, around the firearms and the use of firearms by our corrections officers, given the recent judgment on the officer A issue. Mm. Um, one of the recommendations in the Ombudsman report is that the government introduce legislated internal and external review and appeal rights on both findings and penalties. Um, is that something that you're looking at including um, within legislative reform? Uh, look, I said we have a broad set of legislative reforms. Um, there are, I said, changes to the CAS Act which we want to make, and I just mentioned in terms of, um, of the firearms, we are also looking at making some legislative changes on that front. So, but in terms of um, the specific issue around inmate discipline, we're also trying to um, investigate, and the department has um, given thought to how that can best be changed through uh, legislative um, reform. Um, and can we expect to see reforms in Parliament sometime this year, or do you have any kind of idea of a timeline on this? Oh, look, look, look certainly, you know, the, the principle, I also, we try to do these as quickly as we can, but bearing in mind, we want to make sure that we go through a proper engagement process with our officers, um, with other DCJ um, uh, departments, and also the external stakeholders, that what legislative reform that is proposed will actually um, um, uh, work and work well to reform the system. But yeah, so sorry, so are you expecting it to come before the end of this year or is the timeline more likely to be sometime next year? Well, I, I, I think certainly we will try to work as quickly um, as we can um, to bring legislation reform uh, regarding <coughs> corrections. Thank you. Um, I now throw to uh, the Honourable Kate. Oh, sorry, Ms. Kate Fairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. So, Minister, uh, what additional measures uh, are you taking as a result of last night's Four Corners investigation, which found that those uh, high-profile uh, global firms are indeed charging millions yeah. of dollars to uh, consumers, to uh, owners? Um, what are you, and taking kickbacks, yes. undisclosed, what additional measures are you putting in place? Well, well look, certainly, um, uh, Ms Fairman, the report or the investigation report like, does raise a number of concerns for sure me. Sure does. What uh, additional and, measures? Yep, so, so the journey uh, for the government since, uh, uh, since it was uh, elected has to really make significant reform inroads into strata. As I uh, mentioned, phase one, we dealt with improving the governance of uh, strata schemes. Uh, we've actually ensured that there are multiple quotes on uh, works that's done to common property over $30,000. And as you're aware, as members are also aware, there is a bill before the parliament um, which specifically bans commissions on insurance products where those strata managing agents have not had any role. Um, we're also requiring um, the breakup of invoices around commissions and brokerage fees. So, sorry, to just to go, go back to the banning commissions uh, uh, bit, where you said banning <laughs> commissions where the strata uh, mm -hmm. what, hasn't had any role, did you say? The broker hasn't had any role? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the, um, uh, the, the currently before the parliament is the strata management bill or the strata bill that will ban commissions where the actual strata agent has not played any role, and that is a way. Why? Of what <coughs> are you aware in last night's Four Corners that the A Triple C chair has called for a, a insurance commissions to be banned entirely? Uh, yes, I, I did watch that report, but I'd also say, I suppose, uh, uh, firstly, um, the banning of commissions is. Uh, it's a policy option that the government is considering, but that's also part of a broader policy development. Uh, we need to be mindful that the, the, the commission structure within strata has been around for decades, and there are 
inbuilt business models that are but they're um, the problem. Yeah, those well, those inbuilt yeah. business models are literally the problem. It's the financial incentive uh, that is creating this multi-billion dollar industry that is now offshore, that 2,000 people, uh, when ABC Investigations asked about strata issues, 2,000 people uh, responded. That's the nub of the problem, and it sounds like your government doesn't want to break up that business model. No, no, well, as I said, uh, the banning of commissions within the strata industry is a policy position that is on the table and I've instructed the Fair well, Trade the Commissioner... the legislation is before the Parliament. As you said, that draft legislation we've got now, wouldn't it make sense, Minister, to deal with this, to improve people's strata fees, which uh, New South Wales has the highest portion of bankruptcy as a result of strata fees. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, this investigation last night it's now in your court, the ball, to fix it. Wouldn't it make sense yeah, look, to I, put it into that bill? Well, I said the, the banning of commissions as a general um, business model is a policy option that's on the table for the government. Why? And I've asked, I've asked the Fair Trading Commissioner to um, closely examine the policy options that will work. Now, the bill before the parliament is specific to uh, an insurance product, because this is a much broader conversation. I, I'd also um, make the point, uh, Ms Fanning, watching the investigation report, last I said, I am concerned, and that's why the government is on the strata reform agenda. But it also highlight the fact that the ACCC commissioner does admit that the, perhaps the ACCC could have had a much closer eye in the competition of this particular group. So um, within that bill also, uh, Ms Fairman, is the need to provide disclosure to owners, owners' corporations and residents. Now, I would say that empowering um, consumers, if we can just use that general term, with information actually allows them to ask the tough questions of their agents ask the, uh, uh, why this is happening. So th th it is a journey but Minister, in strata reform. But Minister, uh, the consumers are already saying how complex these uh, strata laws are. They're actually asking yeah. for more simplified uh, strata laws. They've also uh, been saying that strata managing agents can't even comply with the existing provisions for disclosure of commissions and related party transactions. Um, so they're not even doing that now. Uh, why wouldn't you make it much simpler and fairer for people of New South Wales, increasingly in apartments, who are really challenged in terms of cost of living? I don't understand if a policy option is before your government, why you just can't do that. Don't you side with the uh, apartment owners, not the insurance, these these fat cats that are making, uh, getting kickbacks mm -hmm. off ordinary uh, people in New South Wales? Look, good policy and that works with the industry does take time. Um, it's not a, a simple um, uh, process as adding a one sentence in, in a bill. It does take time. And as I said, the government has made significant inroads into strata, and part of the bill that's currently before the parliament increases the penalties by 400% um, for those strata agents that are non-compliant with their disclosure obligations. We are now requiring in this bill that's before the parliament that real-time disclosures and any conflicts that a strata agent may have or has needs to be disclosed to the owner's residence. Empowering uh, residents with information is an important tool um, uh, as we continue the reform journey. I mean, in all fairness, I wish some of these things uh, had, been done in, had been done in the last 12 years, but nevertheless, we are moving forward is, with thanks, strata Minister. reform. It is, it is concerning, though, then, that the Owners Corporation Network, the independent voice of strata owners, who you're very aware of, uh, essentially doesn't uh, support most of the bill. It does uh, support the bill in so far as it provides enforceable undertakings um, as a regulatory enforcement alternative to prosecution for breaches of the law, but it doesn't support the bill other than that because it fails to prohibit strata managing agents 
as fiduciaries of the scheme, they manage, putting themselves in unmanageable conflict with the interests of their clients by taking insurance commissions and engaging in related party transactions. That's the nub of the issue. So why would you bring the reform to this parliament after last night's investigation, after what the ABC has uncovered, uh, again, it seems in the, in the face of inaction by uh, your department, why wouldn't you just lance the boil and uh, put this into the bill before the parliament? Look, the current bill deal, deals with a number of issues um, that are, have been investigated by the ABC, increased disclosures, uh, extra informants doesn't go far enough. Increased penalties, but this is a journey um, that we're going through, and that's why I've tasked the Minister, Fair Trading Commissioner Minister, the, to the examine. People who own apartments don't want to hear about your government's journey. They want action. You've been here for 18 months now. Uh, there is a there is something on the table that clearly could be done. I don't know what else uh, needs to come from the department. I mean, is it good for consumers and people who own apartments and uh, people who are in strata apartments or not? Uh, clearly it is bad for the big fat cat insurance brokers, but great for everybody else. Why wouldn't you do it? Well, and that's why the, the bill before we have before the panel, which I do hope uh, members of the House will support, increased disclosures, increased penalties, increase uh, real-time uh, uh, disclosure of any conflicts of interest, more powers for enforcement and compliance, and certainly, as I've said, uh, the banning of commissions is a significant well, policy change, and I always believe Thank you, Minister. that policy of this nature should be done carefully will, and in a considered way to ensure to you, that it doesn't um, impact. Considering um, the Greens will an, an play a key invest. role in supporting yes. that bill and getting it through Parliament, I, I, your I will talk to you about whether we can get those further reforms sure. through very quickly in 35 seconds I've got left. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask, there's an organisation called the uh, Link Foundation Alcohol and Other Drug uh, organisation. They have been providing free counselling and support. This is uh, related to you because they are, are dealing with 50 new referrals each week directly from community corrections officers across New South Wales. So they provide alcohol and other drug counselling. I've met with them. Uh, they're fantastic. They've received no funding, though, for those referrals. Um, they're they're um, dealing with them themselves, mm -hmm. uh, usually with their range of uh, qualified, trained <coughs> counsellors that they have. Does it seem fair to you um, that they don't receive um, funding for that? They do say that most of the funds go to organisations, you know, Mission Australia and mm -hmm. uh, Lifeline. Uh, but they're doing this and they're really running off the smell of an oily rag and I hear they may not be able to continue. Um, would you meet with them at the very least to hear the, about the work they do and the fact that they are dealing with these referrals each week? Well, look, certainly I'm aware of the organisation you refer to, Ms Fairman, and, you know, Corrections does fund another, a number of not-for-profits. not these And, and what we will consider all funding requests through the normal budgeting process and, and I said... I do value every organisation that is involved in the social justice system um, and every application for funding will be uh, assessed according to other funding requests that the government um, receives. Thank you. Thank you. The Honourable Jackie Munro. Thank you, Chair. Minister, could you please tell me what departments or agencies or offices you're responsible for within your innovation, science and technology portfolio? Uh, that's the Investment New South Wales and the Office of the Chief Scientist. And what about your industry and trade portfolios? Um, they come under the same, the same um, uh, arrangement. Okay. And previously, these were all housed within the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade? Uh, that's correct, yes. And my understanding from a media release which was issued on Friday the 12th of April, um, it was issued by Premier Minns, it was 2pm on a Friday, announced a significant departmental restructure that is that Investment New South Wales and the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer were to join the Premier's department. Did Cabinet approve that change following the announcement? Did, did, what, sorry, I missed that last Did bit. Cabinet approve that well, change following well, the announcement? The, uh, I, I, I don't talk about Cabinet decisions, but the change, the MOG changes in moving um, industry and trade into the Premier's department is a good one. Okay. Centralises but, but that's, no, no, sorry, sorry, that wasn't my question. Did the Governor approve that change? Well, 
the change, the mob change is done by the, the government yep. regarding um, moving industry and trade to the Premier's department. Is so it was one. approved? No, no, it, I'm not it, asking if it was one. good or not. I'm just making it's sure that I understand correctly. So were any amendments made to that announcement? As in what do you mean by amendments? Were there any amendments to the announcement was made, that was made in April? Well, the, the amendments that were made to the administration orders... Yep. Uh, which came to effect on the 1st of July, okay. actually moved um, Investment New South Wales and the Office of the Chief Scientist to the Premier's Department yep. to play a greater centralised role yeah, I'm just when trying it to comes understand. to its functions. Thank you. I presume you've read the budget papers, Minister? Well, what's your question? Well, have you read the budget papers? Well, what, what's your question? My question is, have you read well, the budget I, papers? I said the budget papers are handed out by the, the Treasurer. I know, what, but... What, what's your question? My question is, have you read the budget papers, well, Minister? Well, I, I read all range of papers. What, what's your question regarding them? Well, I'm... Well, the first question is, just yes or no, have you read the budget papers? Well, I, I said, you know, the government... This wasn't supposed to be a trick question, Minister. Well, well I, I said the, the ones... I, I read the budget papers that are relevant to my portfolio. OK, excellent. So, could I please take you to um, budget paper two? Um, page Roman numeral four. Could, I, I don't have what, what... You don't have budget papers. Well, well... well it's budget well, estimates. I, could, I said, could the Secretary said, well, well, please well, well, provide the Minister with budget papers since he didn't bring them himself? Well, Is I that said, possible? <laughs> did, did you not think that you would be asked questions about the budget? Of all the things that would take my time today, I didn't expect point it of to order, be this. Yeah. There's been a point of order taken, yes. Mm -hmm. um, could we please ask Ms Munro to cease mm. the confected incredulity which seems to precede every it's question? Not confected. And could she just ask <laughs> legitimate mm -hmm. questions? Absolutely legitimate. But if we could just refrain from yeah. the <laughs> continual commentary, it's... Yeah, I, I will remind uh, Ms Munro about the commentary um, and you. I suspect we'll continue to have points <laughs> order if it continues, so, okay, let's, so let's keep that in mind. Thank Minister, you. So what page was it, Ms Munro? Uh, Roman numeral four, da -da. budget paper two. I'm in budget paper two, yeah. Yep. Roman numeral four. Uh, specifically, what page is, is that? I've Roman got. numeral four. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So there it says that the budget papers at the very top line have been prepared based on the new administrative arrangements announced since the 2023-24 budget. Um, you, you would agree that that includes the announcement from your media release? Well, the, the mob changes came into effect at the 1st of July this year. So could you please uh, turn to the uh, page 8.2? which is, I'm sure you'll see the um, statement for the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade. Yes. Is there any money on that page allocated to your area, to areas within your responsibility? And what, 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 what as in specifically, well, the, the, the government well, has allocated, the government has allocated um, for the office of both the chief scientists and the um, Investment New South, we have a current expenditure of $150.5 million for Investment New South Wales. And when you say um, recurrent, and for can, I, can I just clarify that? You said $150 million of recurrent expenditure. Five, that's so, correct. So that's over the forward estimates. Well, the 150 that's correct. And, um, and, and that's sorry. In this year. That's, that's in, in, that's in this, this year. year. Sorry. This, in this oh, this financial year. And of course, And, Ox and could you just confirm, is that within the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade in this statement here? Uh, no, that's within the Premier's Department budget. So, so, Minister, can I just take you back to the Roman numeral page five? Because it says there that the transfers are anticipated to include the Investment New South Wales and Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer transfer to the Premier's Department. So, this budget I'm just trying to understand where where do you think your money for investment in New South Wales and the Office of the Chief Scientist well, and Engineer so is? The budget that was prepared was done prior to the mold changes 
And this current year, we've got $150 million for investment New South Wales. But where is that and reflected the, in the and budget? For, and for um, the, uh, the Office of the Chief Sciences budget. Okay, so whereabouts is that um, in about 40, the budget? Uh, just under $43 million. So, um, sorry, sorry, can I just understand though, where is that in this budget? Well, I said the budget yeah. um, that Investment New South Wales has is $150 million. No, I understand million that. That's not my this question. Year. I'm asking and where we um, can interrogate that in well, the budget. It, it's, I said the budget, the, the MOG changes for Investment New South Wales and for Oxy were done uh, uh, after the budget was handed down. So they're not. And, they're, and therefore, the budget that's allocated to the current portfolio response would have been in its former departmental arrangement, which would have been in DEET. So you're saying that the money is in the Department of Enterprise, Investment and Trade, according to this year's well, budget? Well, 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 because the MOG changes don't come into effect until uh, July this year. So the budget that was prepared, um, the current notes on there, was prepared where the agencies were actually um, allocated, so which is under what, DEET. So what's the point? So you're saying between April and June that the Treasury couldn't update the budget according to the announcement that the Premier made? Well, Investment New South Wales has a, recurrent, has a budget of $150 million. I know the Office that. of the Chief Scientists has an allocated budget, I said, of but, over $40 but, okay, million. My, dollars. my question, so, Minister, goes to uh, clarity and to accountability and to transparency, which is why I'm trying to understand where the money that you're responsible for is housed within the budget that your well, government delivered. Well, the budget, when it was prepared, it's, it, it, I said when um, both Oxy and Investment New South Wales came under DEET, its budget was reflected in the DEET department and that next year, when the budget is prepared, um, the investment in New South Wales industry trade portfolio will be reflected in the Premier's uh, department budget. Are you concerned that this is unclear and that actually it prevents people from scrutinising the budget? And are you actually doing this to hide cuts? Not at all. Um, um, uh, we moved uh, investment in New South Wales industry and trade to the Premier's department in a centralised agency to make sure that it works across government to ensure that we continue to restructure our economy towards a diversifying, okay. uh, to make sure that we try to uh, access so different investments um, into did, New South Wales. Did you know that the budget didn't reflect the media statement that was released by the Premier? Well, I, I, the more changes like happened after the budget was prepared. But you're telling me that it doesn't concern you that this budget doesn't reflect the reality of your ministerial well, well, portfolios the, at the moment? The next budget will reflect the MOG changes that have actually occurred. So, so what you're suggesting is that um, a budget should be pre prepared, uh, obviously earlier this year, um, for an event that actually hasn't been enacted yet. Actually, what I'm suggesting is that a government should be transparent and clear about their budget responsibilities and where money is housed within the budget. That, that's well, actually what I'm well, saying. That, that, in it's in there? the budget. So, well, I was clarifying. Thank you for your commentary, but I was actually clarifying oh God, because the minister was making assertions about what I said. So look, I'll, I'll move on. In March, you said to this committee minister that the innovation blueprint, this is a quote from you, the innovation blueprint that I've designed is about the four eyes quadrant and quote, the four eyes quadrant is the strategy that I will be pursuing with our stakeholders. Are you still pursuing the four eyes strategy in the innovation blueprint? Absolutely. And you so that's going to be so a structure look, 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 this, uh, in the innovation so blueprint? Absolutely. You know, it's somewhat prescient, I have to say, with the four eyes. If you actually read the IPC report, have you read it, by the way? The of IPC course report? I have. Of what course I've think? read it. Have you, Minister? Because I actually have. What did you think? I, I am point so of pleased. Order, what did you think of it? The Minister is very uh, uh, yes, sorry, there's been a point so, of order. So, so, point, so, sorry, sorry, of, sorry, there's been a point of order. A point of order, Chair. Once again, we see sort of the theatrics of Miss Munro overtaking the questions, please. I mean, I'm, the questions, are, I'm sure there's some legitimacy the somewhere in them. Uh, if you could stick to them. To the point of order. Um, this was just absolutely ordinary conduct. There Thank was you. nothing disrespectful. There was a light 
contest in Kabul happening, this is budget estimates. Yeah. I, I mean, in, the, in this particular instance, I think that uh, Mrs Munro's um, response was, was somewhat positive <laughs> compared to some <laughs> of the other commentary. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't uphold the point of order in this instance. Um, Ms Munro has the call. Thank you, Chair. So, Minister, my understanding is that the innovation blueprint has been written and it's sitting on a shelf. Could you please explain why, after it was due in July to be implemented this year in July, to be announced in June, you've had 18 months to deliver it, why the innovation blueprint is not public? Look, the innovation blueprint is part of the government's integrated policy approach. Um, to support the industry policy which the government is pursuing. The state's first industry policy focusing on specific uh, missions. So, so when can people expect this integrated policy? Why hasn't it been delivered yet? What, yeah, what so, part so, of it has not been integrated? Okay, so the first point that I make, uh, Ms Munro, is that I don't know where you're getting your dates from. Uh, um, I'm, the, I'm the getting them from Cabinet Office submissions. So well, I think they're fairly um, accurate. Yep. So, so, but you can tell me dates, please. So, so good policy always takes time. Um, I, I don't know whether in your. But we don't uh, have any policy. So, minister. so I don't. Like I said, good policy it requires good collection of data, both qualitative and quantitative. You'd be well aware that the government held a, a number of uh, so roundtables with stakeholders. Minister, is the innovation in blueprint finished or not? So. The, gov the government conducted a number of roundtables with stakeholders, both in Sydney and also in regional New South well Wales, done. to yes, make sure that we order. only... Yes, there's another point of order. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, I suggest Ms Munro is not being courteous to the witness with the snide interjections. I, I, look, I, I only uphold the point of order. I know, I know that that was only a small comment, but just because there has been a lot of comments throughout the day, um, I'm just seeking again to remind Ms Munro um, to avoid points of order um, to keep the commentary to a minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Minister, is the innovation blueprint complete? Uh, well, it said the innovation blueprint um, is, is being developed based on the collation of the qualitative data which we collected with 370 stakeholders. And in addition to that, We've also started commissioning work on the quantitative analysis of the innovation sector and the cleansing and the analysis and the understanding of that data will certainly form part of the government's integrated policy approach when it comes to the innovation blueprint, connected with our trade investment strategy and of course supporting the state's first industry policy Focus on, on Minister, our strategic could you tell me priorities. when that's due then? Because you've already missed dates that you said yourself. Could you please tell me well, when well, the innovation it, blueprint will be it, made public? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say that good policy always takes time. You've said and that. I'm going I'm to do not the, the analysis are waiting. that's required, both qualitative and quantitative, to deliver what I consistently hear from stakeholders for long-term policy stability. Minister, have you consistently heard from stakeholders that they would like to see the innovation blueprint and they would like to know when it will what be delivered? Is, see, what I consistently hear is what the industry really wants is long-term policy stability and clarity and the government is going to deliver that with an integrated approach when? and both with when, industry Minister? policy with the trade and investment um, strategy and policy okay. and also the innovation. All right, These Minister, things thank you. are I, interdependent I think, I think you've repeated of yourself each often other. Enough. Thank you. Minister, what's the future of the Sydney Startup Hub? Uh, the Sydney Startup Hub? Well, mm. I said the, the Sydney Startup and the Scale Up are both in Sydney, so we'll continue to um, liaise with uh, the tenants of the startup to ensure that we deliver a model um, that works for the very people we are actually trying to help. So what is that? Pardon, sorry, Miss. What, what is that? Well, I said we'll continue to liaise uh, with our, our tenants of the Sydney Startup and Scale Hub to ensure that we deliver a model um, that works best for those who are actually going to be utilising that area. Okay, so is the future of the Sydney Startup Hub at York Street secured? Uh, the future of the startup hub uh, will continue to be a point of discussion with uh, the residents and the tenants of those startup hubs. 
So we want does to that mean you will continue the operation of the Sydney Startup Hub or not? We will continue to work with uh, tenants and residents of the Startup and the Scallop Hub to deliver a model that works for them. So, Minister, have you met with fish burners? Uh, I, I actually think, I understand we're actually organising a meeting shortly. So you're 18 months into your term, you've just told me that you're liaising with the tenants of the Sydney Startup Hub and you still haven't met with fish burners, which I asked you in the very first budget estimates that we had. Well, we got a request from fish burners recently. So and you a didn't all reach out organized. to them? Well, fish burners uh, requested a meeting and that's been obliged. Minister, what about Stone and Chalk? Have you met with Stone and Chalk? Well, I, of course I have. I, I met with them when well, I visited these in... startup and scout-up hubs. So they're not in your diary disclosures in the last well, at but least these, these six are months. At events. But they're at events. They're at okay, events. Okay, so, so you're having passing conversations. I mean, honestly, this is like the questions that I was asking earlier in the year and last year. Are you telling me that you have not made any proactive engagement with the key tenants of the Sydney Startup Hub, which you're telling me <clears throat> you're consulting with? Well, it's a the government and in through investment in New South Wales works closely with the sector as evidenced by innovation, our innovation blueprint. But as there's our no continued innovation blueprint. Of order. Uh, sorry, there's been a point of order taken. Sorry, mm. Chair. If, if the Minister could be allowed to complete his answer before the next round of questioning from Ms Munro, that would be in accordance with the procedural fairness resolution. Yeah, I'll, I'll allow the Minister some time to answer that last question. Uh, Investment in New South Wales works closely with the industry and will continue to develop the long-term policy stability and clarity that the industry has been crying out, out for for more than a decade. Okay, but I've so just we, asked we, you two specific questions to give the industry clarity about their future from Sydney Startup Hub, where you've not proactively engaged with them, mm -hmm. and the date of the release of the innovation blueprint, because the original date has already been missed, and you're not providing them any clarity whatsoever. Well, we are absolutely providing the level of engagement, which they have not had uh, over the last 12 years. <laughs> genuine, sincere engagement, genuine, sincere engagement, uh, looking at ways to better the innovation sector. You know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed that you continue to talk down our innovation I, sector. I have not it done any the such number thing, one Minister, sector and for you to impugn that is Southern incredibly Hemisphere. rude. Order, order, yeah. I mean, rather than the debate mm. yeah, that's occurring at the moment, the Honourable Member continues to ask essentially leading questions full of yeah, invective mm. and then doesn't give the Minister the opportunity to respond before immediately asking another question. It, it's a serial offending that's going mm. on here. I'm just clarifying. Call it to order. Ask, you actually call the order. Uh, look, uh, I think in this particular instance there was um, um, <laughs> insinuations made on both cases and I think that that sort of obviously heightens yeah, yeah. the problem. Um, noting that there's only one minute left, um, I invite you to, to move on to further questioning. Thank you, Chair. Minister, I'll finish off by asking about the CFMEU's new New South Wales wage deal. It will add 10% to the cost of new apartments, more than double the rate of inflation. What are you doing to ensure that building costs aren't passed on to consumers? in light of this CFMEU wage deal? Well, look, like I said, you know, the, the, one of the best ways that government has reformed um, in terms of ensuring to reducing the cost pressures within the sector, which everybody knows a lot of its macro factors, factors rather, um, whether it's our financing, access to finance, materials and skills shortages, uh, these are all part of the core uh, inputs that have actually created the um, challenges that are within the sector. And our building reforms are in particular about improving quality standards to ensure that um, builders don't have to spend twice to go pick up defects. This is really a significant, important reform um, that will continue to bring trust and confidence back to the sector so that the industry does not have to spend twice on a particular site. Thank you. Uh, the Honourable Tanya Mihalik. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, can I just ask you a question about um, the Fender Management and Programs, inmate classification placement, uh, classification and placement of transgender and intersex inmates? There's a publication yes. that your office or you um, have carried over. 
Um, given that there is currently um, legislation before the House Equality Bill that's looking at altering um, the way an individual can adjust their um, um, sex and gender by the birth certificate, by making a change, are you involved in the discussions with that? Uh, who, uh, as a minister, you, have you had any briefing from either the Premier's office or indeed the Attorney General in relation to that? All, all, all government decisions, uh, Ms Mahaga, are, are part of the normal uh, discussions we have within the government. Yeah. But the bill proposes 80 amendments to, um, to legislation, 52 to the ADA Act, of which a part falls into um, an area of um, uh, transgender discrimination, and you obviously manage um, prisons and the correctional services for New South Wales. This publication gives the information that you need for uh, transgender um, prisoners to determine which prison they'll be in. And it says in here, for example, that you will have um, whatever sex is on their birth certificate essentially is, is how they're assigned their particular yeah. prisons. Is that right? So uh, all inmates are, are classified and risk assessed individually mm -hmm. um, and that this is A, an operational matter that the Acting Commissioner will determine where best to place a particular inmate, taking into account um, to ensure that there is a, a safe environment for both the inmate and the surrounding inmates and also the staff. I'm happy to ask the well, Acting Commissioner yeah, to... Minister, you actually, uh, in here, the document specifically says that a person is recognised as transgender if, in accordance with Section 32 um, DA of the Births, Death and Marriages Registration Act, they actually certify what or, or you know, indicate what their gender is. So they can, and we know that legislation is proposing they can change their gender at whim without surgical... Um, or without any particular operations and, and so forth. So I'm just I'm just asking, what does that mean for your operations well, for that, prisons? That means that, like, um, regardless, um, um, uh, inmates are classified according to their offence, their criminal, their behaviour whilst in custody, and other factors. So that actually def decides which prison they go well, to, uh, not said, which, so, which so sex all, they indicate so on the birth all, certificate. All classification risk allocation of inmates is an operational matter for the acting commissioner, and I'm happy to ask him to <coughs> elaborate on the uh, risk allocation process of inmates. So our policy around transgender <laughs> inmates. Um, we haven't updated it considering, you know, possible legislative change. But so this is the current report, the one from 21? That's your, your basis that you're Sorry, making I'm decisions about our policy. on? Yes. Well, it's what I could find online as your most... Our policy brief. is to manage transgender and intersex inmates yes. in custody according to their identified gender. So that Which is a report that is from 21, right? That's the last yes, that time that you've policy. assessed yes. this, right? Um, okay. And then the placement of the inmate, whether that be in a male correctional centre or a female correctional mm. centre, is a different decision that is made on an individual basis, um, considering a whole lot of factors by a multidisciplinary team that includes corrective services and... and but you oversee health. that team, right? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, how widespread is the issue of sinking homes across Western Sydney? Um, and, and when you say sinking homes, what, mm. how do you, what are you defining that as? Are you familiar with the Seven News investigation that was conducted a couple of months ago? The building commissioner had been investigating a number of the sites and now there's a concern that there are literally sinking homes across Western Sydney. Are you aware of that issue at oh, all? You look, I think I understand. I think the report that you are referred, the media... I think it was around Jordan Springs. Is that is that? That correct? was one of the suburbs. Yeah, that's one of the suburbs. That was one now, of the suburbs. The I know the former building it. commissioner has been working very closely to ensure that a we protect the consumers. I might ask the acting building commissioner to further elaborate on this particular issue. Well, I'm just mindful of time. Do you have any opinion or understanding of the issue, Minister, that you'll be following it up? Are you well, concerned well, about well, it? I said. We want to make sure that we will always uh, deliver quality building standards across New South Wales. Um, um, the sinking homes, which I, you're confirming for me, was really about issues similar to the one at Jordan Springs, which I'm advised, or I recall, that the developer is actually meeting all the costs. Is that correct, I think, Ability Commission? So there are further concerns about poor fill and compaction in the area. 
Are you concerned about that well, more broadly well, of in course, Western Sydney? Of course, any, any. But are you, um, are you looking uh, into it? it, it we will, we will uh, of course, consider any issues that um, do not provide the quality of building standards and development for the people of New South Wales. If you have specific issues, I welcome um, that information, and I can certainly uh, ask the building, I think building commissioner, to investigate. Um, but as a general principle, of course, the building commission um, would investigate issues of. Um, low quality uh, building standards and construction. Could you please confirm uh, why there have been zero recipients of the Tech Central scale up accommodation rebate in 2024? Uh, well, so the, the, the Tech Central uh, is an important part of the government's innovation ecosystem and will continue to deliver a model um, that works for those uh, tenants in, in that space. Okay. When will the Jobs First Commission be established, Minister? Uh, that's a question that's best answered by the uh, Minister for Finance. Okay. So you're not involved in that at all? Well, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, a question uh, to the Minister for Finance. I might ask the um, Deputy Secretary. Well, it's, it's okay. I can investigate that further later. Uh, Minister, I just want to go back to the Sydney Startup Hub because actually this is incredibly important for startups, entrepreneurs, founders across mm -hmm. New South Wales. So could you please confirm what kind of timeline you're looking at for contract renewals. I mean, it sounds like you're not going to give any certainty about the actual future of that site being used as a startup hub. Well, look, as I said, the, the, the government um, provides um, the Sydney Startup Hub to ensure that we continue to grow the innovation uh, ecosystem. So is there money... OK, three quick questions. Is there money in the budget for the innovation blueprint for the trade strategy and for the continuation of the Sydney startup. Well, well, as I said, the government uh, allocates resources as part of its policy development and process to ensure we have an integrated policy with both the innovation blueprint, the trade and investment policy strategy, connecting it with the state's first industry policy. Thank you. Are there any questions from government members? Fantastic. Well, that brings us to the end of our morning Thank session. Much, Thank, you, Thank you, Minister. Um, the rest of us will return um, at 2 p.m. after lunch for further questioning. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, and uh, welcome back. Um, we'll start with uh, questions from the crossbench. Um, so I'll start questions myself. Um, I've got a few questions uh, for the Rental Commissioner. Um, my first question is about um, the 24-25 budget, um, which um, included 8.4 million to establish um, a new New South Wales rental task force. Is that 8.5 million over one year or is that over four years? That's over the four, it's, yep. The four years, yeah. Can you provide a breakdown at all on what that money is planning to be spent on? Yep, so there's about $2.1 million per annum with the majority in employee related expenses and a small amount allocated for operating costs. Um, at this stage, that's looking like a about 1.7 million in employee related expenses with the rest allocated for operating expense. Great, thank you. Um, and will there be more um, employees and additional staff sort of added as part of that rental task force? That's that part of it? Exactly, that's the intention of the task force to help us to increase our capacity to issue compliance outcomes and to get more um, frontline staff. Thank you. Um, how many people do you anticipate will be employed as part of the rental task force in total? So we have 11 vacant positions right now for the rental task force, um, a number of which are in market, and the task force will also help us to recalibrate efforts across New South Wales Fair Trading using existing positions. So 11 new and vacant positions, but also coordination of existing roles to help to deliver outcomes. Thank you. And you said 11 new and vacant positions. Have, has there been any like people hired into any of those positions so far? Not yet, but we do have the Rental Task Force Manager interview scheduled for the 17th of September. Great, thank you. Um, the government has also said that the task force will conduct targeted inspections um, and work with Fair Trading to act on breaches. Can you talk a little bit more about this and, and just what, what the plan is going forward? So the Rental Task Force is focused on regulatory priorities and preventing and acting on breaches of the Residential Tenancies Act. So Fair Trading launched our strategy this year and as part of that strategy we have 12 month or annual regulatory priorities. Under the rental priorities in the regulatory priority section there are three areas of focus. The first is improving compliance with solicited rent bidding. The second is ensuring that we can implement um, the reform around unfair evictions mm -hmm. and the third is around repairs and maintenance and that's because this is one of the major issues that people contact us about. Now that's the focus of the task force but the way in which the task force will work is using intelligence led um, and sort of a harm driven response. So what we're doing is we're collecting all the data that's available to us, we're doing a comprehensive risk assessment which we've done to identify where are the greatest harms, what do we know the most about and how can we make sure that we can work smarter across our agency to deliver outcomes with what resources we have available. Thank you. Um, um, in regards to um, the rental task force, I'm just wondering as well, like if the work will, um, that's already been done in, in regards to fair trading or respect to breaches, will this sort of funding sort of work within that and then how will that sort of increase that particular workload? The focus of the last couple of months has really been about what will the operating model look like within New South Wales Fair Trading to enable us to bring on the task force um, and for that to not to just sit as an isolated team but for that to actually enable us to create uplift across the whole agency to improve rental regulation. So that's been a big focus of the work chair and what we're looking at doing is not only what will the task force deliver on but how can fair trading actually draw in all of our resources? How can we have an improved governance model to make sure that we're working smarter to deliver on those outcomes and those regulatory priorities? So imagine that as a whole end-to-end -end solution. The task force obviously has specific operations, specific taskings, but every resource in the agency is drawn on to help drive past those solutions. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, it's also reported the task force will use intelligence and market analysis to inform its work. Um, can you explain a bit more about how that's going to work um, and what we mean by intelligence in this in this context? So I'll, I'll explain this in two parts. Some of the work that we've been doing over the last 12 months is building this intelligence base on rental in fair trading. So that looks like um, working with CoreLogic SQM 
and bringing in those data sets so that we understand what all the listings are, what's happening with those listings, what price points rents are being advertised for, um, but also looks like drawing on in Intel from open source data like Shit Rentals, Don't Rent Me, all of those providers and they're actually providing us particularly from the ship rentals platform they provide us with the csv file so we can actually see where all the complaints are we are cross-referencing that with our own complaints data so including that with bonds data and also with information on the listings to start to say what properties are on the rental market that have had high complaints who are the agents and what are the issues great thank you um I also have some questions um, uh, for Mr. Press um, in regards to the fire doors um, and active bolts. Um, on the 29th of April this year, Fire and Rescue New South Wales issued a position statement raising concerns about the use of fire doors with active bolts um, in buildings around New South Wales. Um, I, first of all, I guess I wanted to sort of hear, um, you know, if you're aware of the problem and, and what the work is currently underway in regards to that. Um, and if there's been meetings um, with New South Wales Fire and Rescue in regards to this issue? Yes, so Fire and Rescue brought this issue to our attention. Um, essentially, it's a new technology, um, a technology that uh, uses a bolt which is activated through a set of circumstances to essentially lock um, that fire door in place and therefore compartmentalise the space. Um, there's concerns about whether those um, devices um, can cause unintended consequences. For example, um, if that uh, bolt activated and there were people yet to evacuate that space, um, that would obviously be a concern. The technology is not intended to operate in that way and meant to have a threshold of heat, um, for example, but there are concerns because it's an innovation. Um, currently, we understand that it does um, comply with the, with the relevant standards for, for those type of installations. Um, but it is new and it's something that we see as an emerging issue and are working closely with Fire and Rescue to make sure that um, if it is deemed unsafe by them under their, their uh, requirements or anyone else, that we, as the building regulator, respond accordingly. Uh, do we know how extensive that this, prop, this concern is? Um, look, it's not an installation that we, through our own inspections, have observed, um, but it is a product that we understand is available in the market and... Um, but I, I couldn't tell you how many are installed. It's not something that we've observed um, significantly. Yeah, that's all right. Um, is anything being done sort of in this interim um, by the department, um, you know, in regards to sort of um, ensuring these doors aren't installed in New South Wales buildings while we're still sorting it out? Well, well currently they are a compliant device um, and they do, they, do meet, they, they do meet the standards. Um, but Fire and Rescue has, has taken the lead as the appropriate authority and put out a position uh, paper statement quite recently on them. Thank you. Um, and Mr Press, I might ask you as well about the um, interior designer issues as well that I spoke a, a, at length about with the Minister um, this morning. Can I get an update from you in regards to where we're up to um, on this issue and sort of what meetings have taken place in this space? Yes, so... Um, Interior design was not um, included under the, the 2021 reforms. That was the design and building practitioner legislation. Um, that's probably the point at which that part of the industry maybe felt left out. Mm. Um, I think that's probably an unreasonable characterisation. Um, the reforms didn't include interior designers because they were primarily focused on uh, building designers and architects as the people they were dealing in the common property which that design and pro uh, building practitioner regime regulates. Going forth, um, we've had a number of uh, discussions with the Design Institute of Australia, trying to work through how um, their views on, on becoming recognised under the DBP and or in, in regulation more broadly. And I think that's the point that we've landed um, with that portion of the industry, that really the conversation is less about whether they should be considered design practitioners under the DBP and more about whether um, in modernising uh, New South Wales' building regulation and licensing framework, that interior design might be a, a, a trade category or category of um, practice that should be recognised under the framework, and that's the proposal which is included in the current building bill. Um, but at the moment, because they're not in the, in the current act, that kind of excludes them from being able to um, do a lot of the work that they were originally doing, is that correct? That's your understanding? No, so um, so they, they, they can definitely do work that is exempt 
um, from the design and building practitioner legislation. So um, that's work that is supplied as exempt under the, uh, the SEP yeah. planning instrument. Also work that would I be... I think uh, that's... I mean, sorry to interrupt just because I've only got a few seconds. My understanding is that exemption won't apply to most things because once there's something that's structural, um, like a sink or to fix a ceiling, um, that exemption wouldn't apply. And I think that that's still cutting this industry out of the majority of work that they currently so were, were doing. There, there's a design and building practitioner review on at the moment. So any further changes to that, I think that's the most appropriate forum for it. But in getting to the point that we are now, um, the view was that interior designers did not have the suitable qualification skills to be considered design practitioners under that, under that framework. Thank you. I'll, I've got a few more questions, but I'll come back to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Suhigan. Thank you, Chair. Um, Secretary, can I please ask you about the document I was referring the Minister to earlier um, and the corrective service, it's apparently a corrective service strategic document and looks at the transformation of prisoner rehabilitation through uh, digital technology. Can I just ask what the status is in terms of yeah, the project? I, if you want to take it on notice, no, I'm I okay. don't need to take it on notice. Okay. Uh, it is a, a very important piece of work. I believe that um, through the commissioner that um, Assistant Commissioner Galusis is the full bottle uh, yes. and she can, her <laughs> evidence I believe can guide the committee. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just looking for an update on what, what's come from it and where yeah. we're up to. Thanks, Secretary. Thank you for the question and thank you for um, I guess reading it and, and recognising its value. We commissioned that project. Um, we commissioned the Designing Out Crime team at UTS to, to consult widely to construct that document because we knew with the introduction of the tablets we had an opportunity to really think about how we did things differently and we knew that the tablets in and of themselves wouldn't revolutionise our rehabilitation approach. We really had to, to be quite proactive. So uh, from that we established a... Um, a research and development fund. So we have $150,000, $50,000 um, cash and $100,000 in-kind support. And we put out an EOI to uh, interested people who wanted to respond um, to put forward an innovative way to, to transform the way we do rehabilitation in custody via technology. So we had four applications through that R&D process. We're still going through the process. We've, we've narrowed that down through the panel review to two applications. Um, I can't give you detail on the projects because we're still going through that procurement process. Um, but at the moment, that's the key thing to come out of that document, as well as the development of an LMS system for people in prison. So at the moment, again, we're in a procurement phase, but we want to establish a system on that tablet where people can access uh, all of their learning. There's been a range of discussions around uh, how else we can use the tablets to um, engage people in the process of change. It's obviously been very transformative in how people can access their family. Um, the capacity to contact their family of an evening um, has also made uh, a huge change. So they're the main things to come out of the document so, so far. So with the LMS through this, are we looking at access to university mm -hmm. stu university level study through sorry i missed that question it's okay um with the are we looking at how we can access university course studies through these systems i might take thanks that, Ms. Higginson. so the lms is well developed the trial of learning management system on the tablet will commence at wellington in december uh -huh. so the, the learning management system is essentially focused on vocational training and short courses and um, those type of um, training that inmates might be able to do in their cell. The, the broader question around distance education, if you'd like me to come to that now, is, is one that has perplexed us over a number of years um, and I think we're starting to come to a, a good landing. Our, our education in prison is deliberately focused on vocational training and you know last year we had over 4,000 courses completed in vocational training. Distance education, particularly ter tertiary education, is a small offering and what I am particularly careful in tertiary education is the worst thing we can do for someone in custody is enrol them in a course, they get a hex debt which they don't get for vocational training and then not have the environment 
with which they can complete that course, so they exit custody with a debt and no qualification. Universities, as the committee would appreciate, are becoming far more electronic in their, their delivery, and, and that is a challenge for us. Years ago, most courses, and when most people in this room would have gone to university, it was very paper-based and it was much easier to deliver tertiary and distance education in, in custody in a paper-based world. So um, the case that we, the, the, the gentleman that we spoke about the, this morning, whilst located at Bathurst, was keen to do a, a course at Charles Sturt University, and to do that course needed a laptop with email and you know able contact lecturers and you know tutes and all the normal um, kind of interaction that um, that someone in the community would have in that course. And that environment is just not something that we can repl replicate in custody. But we are working particularly with two <coughs> universities, uh, USQ and Curtin, who are particularly well set up for offering um, university courses for um, people in custody. So we have, and only received two weeks ago from USQ, 10 laptops that are pre-loaded with about a dozen, um, or maybe less, maybe eight or nine um, courses, university level courses that are pre-loaded and inmates can participate in the USQ qualifications with laptops that are provided for them by the university as part of the HEX fee. So the way to scale um, distance learning is to partner with a small number of tertiary organisations that can offer um, at scale um, tertiary qualifications for inmates that we know we can support for the duration of their, their study. I get um, I get inmates write to me all the time and say, look, I've, I've come into custody, I'm an accountant, because of my offence I want to become a psychologist and I want to do psychology at you know, some university somewhere. And it's difficult for us to support courses at you know, many institutions all over the place because when we do that, that comes at the expense of being able to offer at more scale vocational education and training. If we're supporting someone through a university on a bespoke basis. The so is it is it a matter of you don't have the resources to accommodate that? Like is that is that the issue? Oh, there's the security side of it as well. So it's it's being able to access. So what about in other states? Like other states do it and they're doing it. I think USQ and Curtin are the two universities, perhaps. That yeah, you're, WA is doing it. Yeah, and yeah, Curtin, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Perhaps we've been a little slow off the mark to partner with those universities. Is it something that? Having served your term so far as acting um, mm. commissioner, is it something that you think really we should be doing? Oh, and, look, and it's been a focus mm. in my, my substantive role is in this space. Yeah. So I am passionate about yeah. expanding the opportunities for inmates to do education and to further themselves. Really focus on vocational training. Mm. Um, people come into prison, want to get them trained and get them their first job, not necessarily a better job, but that doesn't mean that people that that want to come in custody, engage in tertiary and university education, that those opportunities shouldn't be provided either. It's providing the right opportunities that we can support at scale and support through their journey of custody because I can't guarantee that an inmate at Bathurst isn't going to move to Juni tomorrow. And if that means I can't continue to support their education, which they're getting a debt for, that's something that, mm -hmm. as the head of the agency sure. at the moment, a really you know, can't have that situation. Can I just ask you about uh, just following up with the phone calls? Yep. It, um, the minister has said that he's asked you to look yeah. into the cost, and you know I've been going on about this since last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, where are you at with it so, in terms of just, uh, and you know that the yeah. motivation is just free, accessible phone calls? Oh, uh, I, yeah. I uh, get your position and look the, the environment around phone calls has changed so the the current contract came in in 2018 we're just about to enter the last 12 months of that contract so right. um, notwithstanding uh, the commissioners the uh, the ministers uh, request of us to have a look at what we can do we we're about to enter that phase of looking what the next iteration of the contract looks like mm -hmm. and I think from 2018 to now I think telephony has changed for all of us right um, yeah. And so what does the future look like for I don't that? think there's any such thing as a landline well, anymore, realistically. We've still got one, but I don't think it ever yeah. rings. So, yeah. but, um, and one of the issues is that, you know, we perhaps need to fix through this next phase is, so 
sentenced inmates get one personal call um, a week and unsentenced inmates get three. But that was set up in the time that you referenced when you were making a call, 25 cent call to your home phone. So the reality is that very few calls get made to um, landlines now, they all get made to, to mobiles. Two, um, your comment earlier around lift go and the free calls, we just in the break looked at that as an example. So at Lithgo in August, there were 548 free calls that inmates made, but I expect they're not aware of it because it's a 25 cent or 75 cent, depending on their status kind of flag fall on their account and probably gets washed, lost in the wash of, you know, the, the charges that they pay to, to mobile calls. So look, what we're looking at is, um, as we work through the new contract with the vendor, that the big change that happened around phone calls was not that the costs increased, the costs actually went down, kind of from 33 cents to 23 cents. About a year, 18 months ago, the engine number option that inmates used to be able to access, for security reasons, we discontinued. So as part of the work we're going to do now to see if there's something that meets our security requirements that can replace that function, um, so that's something that we're looking at and there may be an option for corrections to replace that capability with a, a forwarding service that we kind of manage and contain. Do I need to stop, Chair? You can finish your own. Yeah, right. you're allowed to finish. Um, so I'd there's like a whole... My, I'd like my own budget estimates with corrections, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Keep it, yes. Well, we like to get. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, look, there is work to be done. I mean, it, it may not satisfy... New South Wales, other than Western Australia, have the lowest calls for mm. costs of the, of the jurisdictions that will tell us. Um, South Australia and WA, we don't know, but of all the other jurisdictions, um, the issue we have is the access to tablets has exponentially increased the opportunity for inmates to make calls and connect to their families, which is a good thing and was one of your points mm. this morning. The issue is that increases the cost, right? So the mm. exercise we are doing and the Minister is required of us is how we can make um, the cost better for inmates. And maybe there's, I mean, there's a policy decision that government can make around free calls, and that will be a policy decision. But there's also with the vendor, you know, can we put a, can we increase the entertainment by a dollar to reduce the, the cost of the phone call? So we will, we will put all those options ultimately up and um, put those before for the Minister. And just the, on that, when is the timing? What, what is your expected timing to have something? So the contract to, ends in a year. In but, a year. But um, you'll have something we'll before. We'll have something well and truly. Before then, yeah. and there are people kind of working on the options now. All right. Well, I, I will Thank come you. back. Sure. <laughs> the Honourable Jackie Munro. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chair. I have some questions about the trade statement. Who's the best person? I am. Thank you. Fee. Thank you. Do you have uh, an idea of the overall goal of the trade strategy? So as the Minister mentioned this morning, the trade and investment strategy is under development as part of that broader suite of documents that includes the industry policy and the innovation blueprint. So I can't speak to the document fully until it's finalised. However, I think I can reaffirm what the Minister said this morning around a focus on trade diversification away from coal as our predominant export and into areas of priority for the government, like clean energy. So what does that suite of documents include? So an industry policy, the innovation blueprint, and the trade and investment strategy. So it's three documents. OK. What's the targeted dollar value of the New South Wales export economy this financial year? So we, um, this financial year, as you will know, also last financial year, the exports were $150 billion. There are no um, new targets in place. However, we did meet the interim target from the previous strategy, which was $130 million. Billion. Okay. So there's no, there's no target this year, this financial year? So for, for the state, no. Okay. We'll obviously seek to continue to grow exports <laughs> and diversify. Good. That's good to know. Okay. Uh, do you th no, this is, sorry, I can't ask for an opinion. In terms of Investment New South Wales, is its role to coordinate trade across all departments? Like obviously like regional New South Wales, for example, has a trade component. There are other um, trade related elements to different departments. 
Is Investment New South Wales the coordinator of all of those functions? So we have a role supporting trade and investment for the whole economy. And clearly, as we pull together things like policy documents, we'll engage extensively with other departments to ensure that all of the different policies and activities and um, you know, programs that they have on foot are properly reflected and coordinated within those documentations. And I think the, the move for Investment New South Wales into the Premier's department gives us a good position to do that coordination, but I would describe it more of a coordination role. How much money has been put aside in this year's financial um, statements for both the development of these three documents and the implementation of those documents? So there's a, a small amount of money set aside for the development of the documents themselves. Do you have a dollar figure that you can provide on notice, please? So for the Innovation Blueprint, we have spent a total of just under $315,000. I don't have a consolidated figure yet for those other documents. Mm -hmm. In terms of any additional funding that might flow as a result of the policy documents, that would be a matter for future budget. Okay, so nothing's in this budget for the implementation of any of those documents? Nothing incremental to what is already a significant investment that the, the government is making across various spaces. So what's that significant investment? Well, so to use, to provide some examples, if you, if you think about a priority like green energy, this year's budget included $3.5 billion towards okay. the But this is not being energy. done, obviously, without a strategy. So the, the strategy will wrap what are some clear priorities for the government and significant investment that's been made in some of those spaces already. Okay. And that 315000 uh, for the innovation blueprint, how much has been spent on external consultants out of that money? Um, if you don't mind for more detailed comments relating to innovation, I might ask my colleague, Ms Noonan, who is our lead for um, fostering innovation to, to join me at the table. I, I think Ms Noonan probably will have those figures. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with regards to the Innovation Blueprint, we have spent $315,000, as um, um, Ms McPhee just mentioned. Um, part of that was approximately two thirds, I would say, would be external consultants. Um, we have used um, consultants to support the facilitation of an innovation summit, um, eight round tables. Uh, we've also used a consultant to help us with a quantitative assessment and framing um, that quantitative assessment of the innovation New South Wales, so, sorry, innovation systems performance. Um, and we have used, and they've worked alongside the department. So some data scientists, policy designers within the department to work, um, to draft the blueprint. Okay. So that 315,000 is last year's budget as well as this year's budget? The majority of it would have been in last year's financial, last financial year's budget, mm -hmm. but there was, was some consultant spend in this financial year's budget. Okay. And is there, how much more is budgeted for that process for this financial year? There is no, the, in terms of spend on actually developing the blueprint, that spend is now complete. That's complete. Okay. The, in, de, in developing the blueprint itself, the, the recommendations as a, that will come as a result of the blueprint or within the blueprint will be separate to um, um, budget budget um, submissions in, in, in the usual cycle, in the usual process. Okay, so that will be done towards the end of this year in preparation for the next... For those incremental, incremental program spend, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, have you had any feedback? This is back to Ms McPhee. Have you had any feedback from stakeholders about um, the fact that there is no trade title in any department titles or, I mean, we, I know we have Investment New South Wales, but the fact that the trade department as such has been abolished, have you had any feedback about that? So I haven't personally received any feedback about that, nor am I aware of any having been provided. Um, as you're aware, Investment New South Wales is the title of the, the department. However, it includes trade, international, industry, as well as innovation. Mm -hmm. And 
could you please provide me and maybe on notice the uh, budget breakdown for Investment New South Wales from 2018 to this year, 2024-25? So I can give you a couple of years data now. Mm -hmm. So the budget for this financial year for Investment New South Wales is $150 million mm -hmm. recurrent mm -hmm. and $3.2 million capital expenditure. Um, last financial year, so 23-24, the budget was $212,000. So th those sorry, are the years... $212 million. Sorry, $212 million, yep. absolutely. Apologies. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the prior years with me, so I can see what I can get for you. Thank you. Could you please tell me what functions have been reduced given the cut of almost $65 million? So the um, expenditure review looked across the department and I believe that there were cuts across all areas of the department. So how many, how many fewer staff, for example? So we have at the moment 220 staff in mm -hmm. the department. I would have to, to take on notice what that was prior to my joining. Thank you. And in terms of, I mean, you say cuts to all aspects, um, perhaps you could provide on notice a list of grants that are currently available through Investment New South Wales and their value. I'm happy to provide that now if you would like. I've got that information with sure. me. Thank so you. the aggregate grant list of grants for Investment New South Wales this financial year is $16.8 million. Okay. That includes the Boosting Business Innovation Program, which mm -hmm. includes tech vouchers at $3.4 million for this financial year. Mm -hmm. um, many of these grants are funded over multiple years, so mm -hmm. that one is $11 million over four years, mm -hmm. $3.4 million this financial year. The Female Founders Program, which mm -hmm. is in its second year at $0.28 million. The Fostering Innovation Sponsorship Program, which is at $0.88 million. Mm -hmm. The Glowing Global Export Program at $0.7 million. The Industry Capability Network, which had its funding boosted this year to $2.3 million. The MVP Ventures Program, which is $12 million over four years, $5.5 million in this financial year. Textiles. 5.5 in this financial in year? 5.5, yes. Okay. The Techstars Accelerator Program, which is $1.2 million in this financial year, $6.6 .6 million over three years, and the Westmead Innovation Ecosystem Fund, which is $2.5 million in this financial year, $7.8 million over four years. Thank you. Could you also please provide me with a list of grants available in the last, let's say, three years? with their values in terms of the, the spend associated with them. I'll have to try and come back to you later with that. Thank, Thank you. you. That would be helpful. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the Minister's trade mission to Thailand, Vietnam and Singapore. Did the department provide advice about this trip to the Minister? Yeah, the department provides ongoing advice about various trade missions that we're supporting and various opportunities internationally for, for him to potentially participate. That did include this trade mission that he undertook earlier this year. So were there KPIs associated with this trip? So we have um, KPIs associated more broadly for the department to deliver and of course a mission of, of this scale with the quantum of events and meetings that the minister took would help contribute to those broader departmental targets. But there weren't any specific targets associated with this trip? Uh, not broken down specifically. A, a number of leads accrue, as you know, over time, and we pursue all of those leads, which can take six to 24 months to come to fruition. So it's, it can be quite tricky to, to take a, an investment win or a trade win, for example, and trace it back to one single origin. We'll have multiple points of contact with various exporters and investors. So were any like MOUs signed, for example? So a, a number of leads were identified that the department staff in, in the relevant areas are following up on. So in terms of the way that the department seeks to advise the minister, uh, do you have priority systems, for example, in terms of countries? 
We absolutely have priority markets. That's correct. And were Thai- was Thailand, Vietnam, and or Singapore part of that priority list? Like, are they in the top five? So Vietnam and Singapore are both places where we have um, local staff. Yes. And um, as the minister spoke to this morning, the ASEAN region more broadly is a priority for government, given the level of growth that's happening in that area. Um, so Thailand, for instance, is New South Wales' ninth largest two-way trading partner in goods. OK, but in terms of the priority countries, are they in the top five priority countries? So they are. We have a, we have a, a list of priority companies that includes... Countries countries that include six hubs and 13 spokes I haven't seen them ranked okay so there is no rank or you just haven't seen them ranked I am not aware that there is a rank no beyond the hub the six hubs and the 13 spoke countries so what are the six hubs and the 13 spokes let me just get that you you. can take it on notice no that's okay I can answer it I've got it in front of me apologies I am only a few weeks into the role so excuse me if I have to refer to my notes so the six hubs are San Francisco London Mumbai Singapore Tokyo and Shanghai Mm -hmm. and the spokes yep sure um I don't think I've got those written down apologies I'll bring those back to you thank you I appreciate that Is is there any plan to set up a trade office in Thailand? We don't have, not that I'm aware of, no, we don't have any current plans to establish a, an additional office in Thailand. Okay. But we are, of course, always looking at that network and assessing that we have the right priority markets. We do that based on importance in terms of trade and investment. Mm. Uh, so, okay, so there's no KPIs for this trip. So how do you approach evaluating the success of a trip like this? So we look at it based on the quality of connections and the quality of leads that are coming out of those trade missions. And there were a significant number of um, you know, important people and important contacts that the minister made whilst he was on. So is there a, some sort of quantum of expected trade that is, I mean, a goal for something like this? Like when you say the quality of leads, are we talking about deals that will be worth over a billion dollars or how, how do you judge so that? As, as I say, we, tr- we track those KPIs at an organisational level and we do track direct exports facilitated by our team as well as investment that is directly facilitated by our team. So what are those KPIs? So, um, and look, I am pleased to say that we did meet those KPIs last financial year. Congratulations. So um, so in terms of, um, so this is last year's KPIs. So CapEx directly facilitated, the target was $1 billion and we achieved $2.6 billion last financial year, and for trade, the target was $130 million directly facilitated. So this is, this is us supporting typically small and medium-sized enterprises who would not otherwise have been able to export their goods and services. So the target was $130 million and we achieved $212 million. 205? 12. 12. Apologies. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, that honestly seems quite low to me. Are you, yeah, I mean, I can't. So, as I say, we're, we're talking about um, direct support to businesses that otherwise wouldn't have occurred. So, we obviously provide broader support to industry, but what we're tracking there is, for instance, through our programs like Going Global programs, the Minister's Trade Mission, where we've provided business with skills that they didn't have to help support with exports or facilitated in-market contacts and overcoming um, you know, any barriers in local markets to enable them to export where they wouldn't have previously or otherwise. Okay, so just thinking about this Hyundai visit that mm-hmm. Ms. Mitchell, or Mrs. Mitchell, I should say, referred to earlier, it seems like there weren't any, there was no ministerial representation 
there weren't any senior investment New South Wales representatives there. Like this is a deal that now the Victorians have jumped on and they have had leadership up to the Premier engage with this deal. Why, why isn't Investment New South Wales engaging more uh, proactively with deals like this? So Investment New South Wales representatives have met with Hyundai on a number of occasions over a number of years. And that includes a meeting just last week on the 6th of September with Hyundai Engineering, which is part of the group, has 5,000 staff, 30 international offices, um, and doesn't currently have uh, an Australian presence. So mm -hmm. that meeting was joined by their local representative, the managing director, and was talking about seeking to expand their expertise in renewables, um, obviously potentially in New South Wales. So that's just one example. We do meet with representatives both onshore and offshore of that important organisation. Mm -hmm. um, I can also confirm that a meeting was offered with the Premier's office, but it, it wasn't at an you know, agreeable up. time for Hyundai. Okay, thank you. So just on the offshore onshore, could you please provide me the numbers of offshore staff this financial year compared to the last two financial years? and um, also where they, were, where they were based. I absolutely can. So at the moment, um, as you recognise, we have our trade and international team comprises both onshore teams as well as those offshore-based teams, mm -hmm. and they work hand in glove together. At the moment, we have 46 members of staff in that international network who all report along with our onshore team to our executive director here in Sydney. Mm -hmm. I'll have to take on notice the prior year's numbers of staff. Excellent, and, and also where they're based would be helpful, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, there were reports earlier in the year about um, Vietnamese students disappearing, for want of a better phrase, from South Australia, and the New South Wales Department of Education informed partners in Vietnam that um, New South Wales would no longer receive applications from students in central provinces of Vietnam. I understand that there is a, um, there's now a, um, a partnership sort of situation happening with Investment New South Wales going over to some sort of Vietnamese education showcase. I'm just wondering if the, what's, What's the advice from Investment New South Wales or how is Investment New South Wales managing this when um, I understand that uh, tertiary colleges here have been advised to be cautious when reviewing applications from these areas? Like, is there a kind of conflict going on? So we do have an international education expo, which we are attending at the moment in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, the, the support that my team provide relates not just to attraction of foreign students to tertiary education, but is also extremely supportive of the transnational education system. So that is universities setting up um, campuses offshore, as well as the edutech, so you know, online learning, technical platforms for learning. So that education expo covers those areas as well. Okay, so there's no concern that um people might be coming to New South Wales and disappearing essentially as a result of uh, partnerships, I suppose, between the government and central Vietnamese province-based organisations? Not that I'm aware of, but let me take that question on notice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back um, to Mr Press, please. Um, just before um, the bell rang, um, you talked about suitable qualifications and the fact that um, um, people within the industry um, don't have suitable qualifications. Um, my understanding is that a lot of interior designers have completed several years at university to be qualified in this space, and some people four and a half years. Um, but I do understand that there is some variability there. How do we protect those people who obviously have got these really extensive qualifications who are in this industry, who are being affected at this point in time, being able to actually do their, the work that they have been doing and that they are clearly qualified to do? 
Yes, yeah, so the spaces that is uh, unaffected for them is uh, working in unregulated um, classes of buildings. So class one building work, for example, um, they can continue to operate there without um, holding any particular license at all. In fact, no license. It's only in the class two, the class three and the nine C where there's the, where there's the requirements in place. Um, if interior designers want to operate in that space um, and be the practitioner who is considered a design practitioner, that's the one who's actually signing off on that on that final declared design, which then goes to a builder to, to complete the work. Um, interior designers can only have the role of providing specialist advice and supporting drafting services, mm -hmm. um, along with a whole other range of similar type pr practitioners, um, building consultants, draftspersons, mm -hmm. um, etc. So they can still play a role. The only function they can't be is the declared designer at the end. That has to be mm -hmm. um, essentially an architect. There are pathways though, if interior designers want to become design practitioners, um, reflecting their, their many years of university, etc. Mm -hmm. There is a pathway for them to um, become an architect and therefore be recognised mm -hmm. under the DVP as it stands today. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, obviously there's, you know, obviously two different degrees at university and so people who have taken the degree of um, interior designers because that's what they wanted to become, um, it would be quite frustrating to sort of say, well, now you can't do that work anymore and you've got to either, you know, go back and do further qualifications and become an architect. Um, and I, and my understanding of the space, and obviously, um, you know, that there are there are interior designers who are working in people's homes and that, that may not necessarily be affected. But, you know, a lot of these What we're primarily concerned about is looking after the, the core DNA of a building. So, you know, mm -hmm. the structure, the fire safety systems, the lifts and those sort of things. And those sure. are aspects of the design that, um, without trying to be critical of interior designs, that are not as strong as others. And when that design and building practitioner legislation was set up, it, it, it placed, I'd say, a fairly hard line because at the time, of course, the concern was that let's make sure that these apartment buildings, we put quality first. Um, so it caused um, uh, challenges for a whole range of practitioners, even builders, uh, because builders had to go through a process to be recognised to have a class two building practitioners registration. Um, even architects for the, for the scheme required architects to have recent experience, not just experience from say 20 years ago. So interior designers have yes been affected, but also a whole range of other people in sort of seeing these new rules around building is there any evidence that interior designers have actually caused structural issues? Is that where that where this is coming from? Um, less so on interior designer being a cause of an issue, just more looking at from the from the framework of what are the skills and qualifications. Does that does that meet uh, meet the type of uh, functions that are performed as a design mm -hmm. practitioner under that regime? Because my understanding, obviously, is that you know the interior designers would still have to engage with engineers. Um, they'd still have to, you know, put upload any plan for the planning portal, um, where it would be reviewed by the council or reviewed by a, a, a private certifier. Um, were they not necessarily good enough avenues to make sure that, um, you know, some of these big issues around fire escapes and other aspects were dealt with, where you know the actual interior designers could still work within that system? Um, so they can still work within the system today. They just can't be that design yeah. practitioner. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I think uh, sorry, just to clarify with that, because my understanding is, you know, it's unlikely that someone's going to then hire an architect and um, an interior designer, whereas previously they could just get the interior designer. Um, and some of them were qualified to be able to obviously do that extensive work with the engineers um, without having to hire Well, I'd, I'd, I don't architect. know if they were necessarily qualified um, as compared to that's the, the function they played. Um, and that's, again, not a critique of um, interior designers. A whole range of practitioners before the legislation was set up were, um, I would say, going outside of their, of their skill set. And, mm -hmm. and that's why the legislation really had to come in to say, everyone's got to stay in their space and you do have to engage with an engineer, you do have to engage with other practitioners um, and a key tenet of that design and building practitioner framework is designs have got to be declared by the relevant specialists and integrated together um, so we have a complete and accurate um, set of designs, integrated set of designs before we start building. So, so it sounds like there was a decision at some point to kind of carve away what interior designers were doing and actually sort of change that um, in some way because um, 
because why really I suppose is my question like it, it sounds like I, I think it's there's coming been from a the decision that actually interior designers shouldn't be doing this and even though they are um, but it's just not clear to me as to why particularly when there are those um, other avenues already put into place where it has to be worked with an engineer where it has to go through the planning portal so that there's obviously these safety mechanisms already in place um, I'm just wondering why there's been sort of a decision to change what interior designers can and can't do um, within this legislation without sort of that, that um, consultation process? Look, there, there was a consultation process for the design and building practitioner framework. Um, I think fair with, to say. With interior designers? Well, I, so there was a consultation um, for that design and building practitioner leg legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the fact of the matter was the Design Institute of Australia and, and desi interior designers, um, I don't think. Um, uh, recognise that that consultation occurring, and and I don't think um, made made uh, many submissions through that uh, through that earlier process. That's uh, there's a but a number of stakeholders who have felt a bit like that. Um, the remedial industry as well um, were probably not as across the legislation as they could have been. I think is thinking it was all about new construction, but since that legislation has come in. Um, as Building Commission now and Fair Trading previously, we've been bringing those stakeholders in journey and particularly with the des uh, interior designers, mm -hmm. having I think quite good quality conversations about where they could potentially fit under that legislation, pros and cons, and also the general licensing framework. And that's where, in answering before, um, we believe there's a, there's a, a strong policy rationale for them to be um, a licensed profession under, under the, under, um, as a licensed trade, if you like, um, but still we don't consider them as suitable under the D DBP framework. Um, that's just our position, and no doubt the DBP review will consider that and any other um, practitioners doing design work as part of their review. Um, and when you say that, um, you know, the, the, that initial consultation didn't include interior designers and, and, and various um, any, any organisations that represent them, was there attempts made um, by the department to actually seek them um, to be part of that consultation? Um, I, I couldn't recall off offhand. I'd have to, I'd have to maybe check with others in the notice. department. Yeah, that's probably three years ago now. Um, so I'd have to yeah, check. If you could take, could you take that one on notice Absolutely. and find out? Yeah, if just if anyone um, had actually sort of sought their feedback as well. Um, I might move on. Um, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor, please. <laughs> um, we were talking before um, <coughs> about the Ombudsman report, um, and I know I, I was talking to the Minister as well um, about uh, the disciplinary process, and particularly for inmates who were self-harming, mm. um, and the problem, the problems around that. And he mentioned a review, and he said that you know you you would probably have some further information about that review. Um, can I um, go to you on that? If, if sure. There's so information, we obviously we've been aware of the ombudsman's investigation around inmate discipline well before he tabled his <coughs> excuse me the the final report. So. We've already been working behind the scenes on the important work that needs to happen around inmate discipline. So I can kind of explain where we're at and where we, we plan to head. Notwithstanding, you know, we recoil from, you know, some of the language that comes out in, in oversight body reports. The, the Ombudsman's report around inmate discipline is a really useful roadmap to head us in the direction we need to around inmate discipline. And the, the challenge in the inmate discipline process, um, and I don't think I'm going to offend anyone in this room, but the, the legislation is set up to be really informal, really flexible in terms of a process that's administered by correction staff. There's no rules of evidence, no representation, evidence isn't given on oath, there's no right of appeal, but then it's a judicial burden of proof, the highest judicial, judicial burden of proof um, beyond reasonable doubt. So there's a real disconnect in the legislative framework that the Ombudsman has called for a, for a full review. So that's that side of things, but there were policy failings that the Ombudsman uh, discovered as, as well and reported on, and we're already working on those, um, those elements. Uh, well ahead of the Ombudsman's report 
Okay, I'll keep going on that. Um, now we're good. Um, so what we've already done, we've spent a fair bit of time just looking at exactly what we're doing, consulting with our staff who undertake the inmate discipline process, also consulting with inmates about around how they perceive, perceive the procedural fairness. Um, we looked at a whole lot of compensation matters. One of the findings of the Ombudsman's report was uh, they found a few cases where inmates had been charged above the statutory rate of $500. So we've done a review to identify cases where that has occurred so that we can, can uh, remedy that. We've done an interjurisdictional scan of what kind of good looks like. Um, the UK um, appears to us to be a model that um, that is worth us looking more closely at. Uh, we've looked at our training. We've engaged with the Correctional Officers Vocational Branch, which is the commissioned officers that actually administer inmate discipline. So we've kind of done the groundwork for that. We have our um, our legal people through DCJ starting to look at what a new regulation might look like. Now that the Ombudsman's report has been tabled, there's a couple of things I'm about to do. I'm about to write to the chair, the, the chairman of both the Serious Offender Review Council and State Parole Authority. Um, what I'm concerned about is inmate discipline can ultimately affect um, people's classification placement and also um, be factored into parole decisions. So. So I will be writing letters to both those authorities, um, asking them to seek further information if a decision they are making around classification or, or parole or placement is hinging on an inmate discipline matter, uh, because we will take steps to look further into the... There are, so, there are a lot of cases, so for us to do a review of every, every matter as the Ombudsman ultimately concluded would be a job that would be enormous and under the statutory framework there is no places of review but I'm particularly minded where an inmate discipline decision may result in a parole decision, a particularly negative parole decision for someone that I will be writing to the SPAR chair and asking for them to defer back to us. There's a number of instructions that I will also issue to staff. Um, one will be around the statutory limit and just reminding um, staff of um, of the legislation um, and also the need for inmates subject to a disciplinary hearing to have support people and particularly translators. There was a, there was a number of cases that the Ombudsman identified um, where the right uh, support, particularly for inmates um, who didn't speak English or had a disability, those uh, supports weren't in place. Also gives some further guidance ahead of a regulation change around the, the, the burden of proof and and um, beyond reasonable doubt. And then ultimately there is, we have a lot of our officers that are commissioned officers at, um, at ranks below the governor that administer uh, inmate discipline. The legislation does have a, um, a reversal power of the governors uh, in correctional centres. So uh, I will be pointing out that to the governors so that they can have some better oversight um, around inmate discipline process that is happening under the current um, processes. Great. Thank you. Mr Higginson. Thank you. I might just carry on with that, um, the Ombudsman report if I can, um, just a little bit more. I'm, I mean, the, the Clarence situation and the report is really bad. It's so, such an awful situation and um, you know, what was it? It's unlawful, unreasonable, oppressive, and so on. The Ombudsman recommended that those inmates that were subjected to very, very cruel um, punishment, they were segregated, they were dehumanised through a kangaroo court, ultimately. It was such a horrid report to read, imagining what that must have been like for those inmates. There's an apology being suggested. But what about the real remedy? Like, what, how do those inmates then get that part of their life back and that degrading and inhumane treatment through a supposed, you know, system of justice within a system? What do, is, is there any suggestion that we might be able to look at? Uh, 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 and I'm referring to those specific inmates. They're the ones we know about in the Clarence. Um, is there some kind of remedy for them beyond an apology and having the false, awful 
maladministrative record expunged that they were subjected yes, to? So the recommendations of the Ombudsman's report for Clarence were accepted by the department and by Serco. I visited Serco soon after that report on, on site at Clarence. Um, met with, there's a new governor up there. He's a former assistant commissioner from, from Victoria. So I spent a fair bit of time going through that report with them, which um, satisfies me in terms of um, uh, that administration up there understanding the seriousness of the failings up there in terms of, of that matter. As for going back in time, that's a, you know, that's a difficult question uh, clearly clearly to answer, but I, I, have, I have absolute confidence up there now in terms of the lessons learned and the, and the, um, the implementation of the recommendations in turn, in, including the one you refer to in terms of individually you know, um, contacting each of, yep. each of those uh, inmates. It was a, it was an event. It was an awful event in that it was a, um, it was an assault of staff, yeah. um, no, it was, and it, it was, was it, was, it was the escalation or perhaps mm. overreaction. My words, not the ombudsman's words, in terms of the consequence of, mm. of that. So I was, we've been particularly focused on that with Serco in terms of having their administration of inmate discipline, notwithstanding the mm. the issues that the state has, so that state and the public have a consistent administration of, of, of justice because an inmate should have the same processes apply whether they're in a state jail or private jail. So my confidence is around where we're heading with the broader system and also that Serco in this instance are very much more operating in line And so with then the what state. about with the other Ombudsman report and I think the Chair referred to it in terms of uh, the practice of First Nations young, uh, First Nations young people being isolated um, in their cells, that particular finding, what are we doing about that? So, um, yeah, so that, that recommendation needs to feed into our, to and our policy approach. I mean, it, it's not the case that First Nations people are never on a cell by their own, on their own, but there are particular risks around First Nations people, which goes back to the 1991 Royal Commission in terms of, of, of cell placement. So if, uh, if an inmate um, is being placed in a cell on their own for any reason, they could be a, you know, a, a non-Aboriginal inmate who's, who's at risk, notwithstanding inmate discipline, it's not safe to, for a disciplinary decision to override, override safety. So we have alerts on inmates' profiles on their that will say an inmate needs to be two out for their safety or in a, in a camera cell. So an inmate discipline decision should not and cannot override a safety decision that's been put there. Often by Justice Health on their health problem notification will say inmate Smith needs to be needs to be two out. They have a different coloured card on the outside of their cell. So that supersedes any kind of inmate discipline de decision which could be confined to cell for a period. Okay. And you're satisfied that now across all the facilities and with the 14,000... Uh, I'm going to be more that, satisfied when I write to governors in, in the manner that I said I'm, I'm about to okay. and get me on the very report urgent. only just landed, but yep. that will be one of the, the features of my correspondence to governors, reminding them of, of that it's, obligation. It's a very urgent matter because it's obviously very systemic um, throughout the system and the OMBOS report, it, anyway... I just, you know, it's that thing, isn't it? How many more unbelievably bad reports need to be tabled? I think that's kind of where the state is. It's like, it's just, I mean, can we fathom one more report? Because there's likely to be another bad one. That's, I think that's the predicament we're in. Oh, look, we have lots of areas of reform and that's the territory we're heading into now with the ASTL recommendations. You know, we have some inspectors' reports that we need to respond to. You know, those those reports will can continue to come and recommendations from the inspector in the ombudsman's report. So, in terms of moving the agency forward, there is a broader reform piece that captures all of those. Rather than in the in the past, we'd respond to this and we'd respond to that and we'd respond to the other. So, from where you're sitting as the acting commissioner now, do you believe that you have a clear message from government that you have what you need to drive this reform? 
Yeah, look, I think the machinery of government change sends a real message to our staff and I hope to the community that um, Corrections is really heading into a new um, phase. I mean, we will be, we have to be a, a different organisation to the one that has existed um, to this point. I mean, we have the the Astle inquiry has been very painful and very refining, I suppose, for corrections. But for us to continue without the cultural change. Um, that that report calls for would be such a lost opportunity. And there are other things like the Ombudsman report that feed into that. So the, the, the answer to your question is yes, through the Minister and the ongoing support of DCJ and where we need to head, I think we are well placed to do that. Um, and we have very many good staff. There are, um, yep. and that's the disappointing thing in kind of the last 12 months that we've, we've had, but it's what encourages me and certainly encourages me to continue in this organisation that um, notwithstanding the challenges that we've had, most of our staff care as deeply for, you know, the people um, in custody as, as you do and as I do and as the executive do. There are some people in our organisation that honestly need to change their attitude or find somewhere else. And fortunately, those, num those numbers of officers in corrections are a small number and a reducing number of staff. So as we work through the necessary and painful cultural change, that will take time. Change, you know, if you go back and read the, the Nagel Royal Commission from 1973, four, whatever it was, um, it could have been written by Justice McClellan, right? Some parts of that in terms of culture. So culture is deeply ingrained, takes, takes time to change, but certainly I think we have the right executive and the people on the ground that I talk to are really right for that change, and I think we're well supported by government for that to happen. Thank and we're ready. For, you know, the, the commission will be appointed. The Astle inquiry has reported the mold changes are happening, so all those changes really set us up well for that continued Thank reform you. and change. Um, can I just ask you why you uh, can we go to Kelly Lane just in the last minute? Why? Why is she being so punished for another six months with no external I'm, leave and so on? I'm really reluctant to kind of discuss details around an individual. What I will say to you is, um, so I, the, the commissioner does all the serious offender placements. So I, I do about 30 of those a month and they are, I spend a lot of time on those decisions. Um, they come, so 30 decisions, about 1,500 pages of supporting documentation for those. The, the situation you talk about is quite unique. The first person that's actually been captured by the new um, regulation, I went and visited the um, facility and the manager of the facility where I approved the, the placement. What I will agree to do is I don't want to, I don't want to canvas here reasons around that placement that are not known to the individual, I will, I will go and sit down and I will explain that this decision. It will, it will be reconsidered by the Serious Event Review Council in six months, but my commitment will be I will go and, I'll go and explain that decision. But are you open to looking, like why are the Serious Offenders Review decisions just generally, like out of the 463 recommendations by that council in the last calendar year? 460 are just signed off. So will, will you also commit to having a look at what you oh, have? I'm not sure that, uh, there are lots of decisions that I know. That I will, I make. But will you commit, sorry, my time has run out, but yeah, will you commit to having a look at, at re revising the next six months of Kelly Lane's life? Will you just have an, commit to having an, another look at it? Um, I'll, I'll commit to explaining to, to Miss Lane the, the decision. Um, I, I'd prefer to leave it at that. Is that all right? Thank you. I'm incredibly opposition there. Thank you, Chair. And uh, if we can have the Chief Scientist and Engineer come up, uh, very mindful that you've been sitting patiently there all day. So if there are no other questions from the rest of the committee, we're happy to try to get through all of our innovation, science, and technology questions with you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, what is your budget this year? 
um, 42.657 million in our OPEX and 61 million in CAPEX. What is the 61 million for CAPEX? Uh, uh, it's the RNA manufacturing facility. Excellent. Is that solely for that? Yes. Yep, thank you. And what are the um, forward estimate budgeted figures? Um, I have to take that on notice. I can do it individually, but then I'll have to add it up, if okay. you see what I mean. Thank you. Um, but I can, I can also break it down by... If you, if you can break by, it down by year, that would be fabulous. Okay, by, um, by program. I mean. yep. That would be excellent. Yep. Thank you so much. So that's CapEx and also OpEx. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you released the quantum algorithm report earlier yep. this year. Congratulations. I'm just wondering if you're aware of whether the SQA ended up getting funding. Yes, it did. It did? Uh, it received funding in the budget. Yep. Um, but in addition, we are, we are able to commit to uh, it, its three-year funding profile. Three years. And how much was that? Um, it will end up being about one and a half million a year. Okay. Uh, and the universities also contribute in addition to that. Thank you. And that's the was it four universities that are associated with that program? Yeah, that's yep. correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, were there any other actions that will be taking place as a result? I mean, I'm not sure if SQA funding was as a result of yep. your report, but um, after the publication of your yes, report? Yes, I mean, um, we were successful, you may be aware, in attracting the federal uh, quantum growth center here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 18 million from the federal government and we contributed a million to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's was that, that was in last year's budget, or was that in this uh, year's? It's interesting, because they claim it runs over three years, but it's really one year plus a month of a year either side, if you see what I mean. Okay, yes. Uh, so technically it's this year is the, is the bulk of it. Okay, and okay. that's one million. Yeah, yep. correct. Uh, and in addition, yes, we are looking at supporting a software um, quantum network. Okay, and that comes from your budget? Correct, the, from the RAP program. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, do you have any projects in the Macquarie Park Innovation District? Yes, well, the RNA facility is one. Yep, are there others? Uh, well, Macquarie University re have received funding under a number of programs that we support. Okay. Um, so in particular, it's um, part of the Semiconductor uh, Sector Bureau uh, and is playing a big role in that. Mm -hmm. It received funding under the um, uh, a synthetic biology foundry, uh, which also won there, and that was in collaboration with a number of companies. So it's received a number of um, part, you know, partnerships and competitive grants, if you see what I mean around that. Okay. And we also support the, the Centre of Excellence in Synthetic Biology, as we do all our federal government centres of excellence uh, that we attract in New South Wales. Is there any concern about the rezoning or potential rezoning of that area having an impact on the um, the running of those programs? No, all the programs that we are funding at present are, are actually within the boundary of Macquarie University. Okay. Um, even if they're on the edge of it, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So they're not um, they're not in the district that's been that's correct. Marked out so the, the RNA changes. facility, for example, is on the north edge, mm -hmm. and the land is effectively provided almost rent free um, by Macquarie University for the facility. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, just back on the, this is back to Ms. McPhee on the investment New South Wales budget. I just wanted to make sure, could I please also get the forward estimate per year breakdown, please? I'll take that on notice. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to get a little bit more clarity. I mean, I know you said before that all parts of the department were looked at when referring to the cuts, but could you be a bit more specific about what actually was reduced in terms of the operation of the department? Yeah, so, so I've obviously been in the role for just four weeks now, so I can't speak to um, the previous cuts, but so I'll have to take that on notice. Okay, that would be helpful. I mean, any programs, for example, obviously we've already spoken about staff, um, funding for grants, any reduced capacity to um, I don't know, negotiate trade deals, for example, or I mean, I'm yeah, not negotiating trade deals specifically, it's probably more a federal government um, responsibility, but certainly facilitating trade deals, for example. 
I'll absolutely take the specific question on notice. I will reiterate that the department did continue to meet its targets last financial year and continue to do so. Yeah. So can I just clarify on that? There are, are there targets this year that have been... There are. And what are those targets? Okay, give me one second. So in terms of the, the two targets that I spoke about from last year, the CapEx target for this year is $1.2 billion and the trade target is $120 million. So um, they don't seem very ambitious given the figures that you spoke about earlier in terms of exceeding the goals. Why haven't they been given more ambitious numbers? So the targets have been set based on our priority markets, on the resources we have in market, and based on our expectations for this year. Based on your expectations. So you're not expecting to have the same kind of results that you, res you uh, saw last year? We would obviously always seek to exceed our targets like we did last year. I mean, you exceeded your targets by a pretty significant amount. So why, like, why not calculate and include that? So th there are some very specific circumstances leading to, to some of those um, that we may not expect to see replicated. This financial year, of course, we will seek to continue to exceed. So what are those conditions? Exceptional, exceptional circumstances. I'm talking about specific deals that may have been um, very large and one-off in nature last year. OK. I mean, why, why wouldn't you expect to have similarly valuable deals made this year? As I say, we will continue to progress those large-scale deals as well and seek to exceed our targets again. But what's the point of targets if... Point of order, Chair. Yes, there's been a point of order. Um, Ms Munro has asked a legitimate question. It's just that she's asked it three or four times now and the, uh, the question has been answered by Ms McPhee. I'm asking the same question. Um, do you want to maybe um, reframe the question that you've just asked and make sure it's a new question? Okay. Um, what kind of what kind of data is fed into the calculations that come up with those uh, trade figures and goals KPIs? Yeah, so obviously, as you've um, suggested, last year's performance have fed in, as are the number of leads we've got in the pipeline, as are the, the likely growth of those various different markets, as are the number of people in the team to support those deals, planned investments in programs like Going Global and our export advisory teams. M many different factors feed into development of those targets. So in terms of the resources that your department has available, what proportion of the calculation is that in making your final assessment? It is absolutely one of the factors. As I said previously, we've currently got 220 people in the department. I think it would be um, wrong of me to suggest I could provide a specific percentage associated with that factor. So how how is it calculated then? Like if there's not a percentage or proportion allocated to each factor, whether it's the number of people in the office or um, the markets that you're seeking to engage with, how, how is that calculation made? All if of those no factors are brought together mm. in order to develop the so There must be like an equation or an algorithm that is used. N not specifically. All of the factors are considered, mm. but not explicitly weighted. Okay. Okay. Uh, in terms of the uh, blueprint, the innovation blueprint, I know you said that two thirds of the three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars was spent on a consultant, or is it one consultant or multiple consultants? No, so that, that figure was actually um, not just about um, consulting spend, but also about data and data sets and data analysis. So the two thirds of the 315,000 that, that was spoken about? is correct. So yes. what, what is the exact figure that was spent on consultants? Okay, 
I will have to come back to you on that unless, sorry, Miss Noonan is no longer at the table. I, <laughs> Miss you. Noonan, do you have a breakdown of that figure? So I don't have, a, so we, we um, worked with two consultants. So one was Astrolabe, who helped us with the um, roundtables mm -hmm. and the design of the Innovation Summit. Mm -hmm. Another consultant was Kate Pounder, who mm -hmm. was engaged directly on the, um, to support us from the quantitative assessment, exploring, exploring policy options. Mm -hmm. We did do a direct labour hire as part of that $315,000, which was a data scientist. So I don't have the individual, because some of that is obviously commercial incompetence, because we only used kind of three elements of that. Um, so two, when I said two thirds, so two in terms of external consultants was Astrolabe and um, Ms. Pounder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But not the labour hire, sorry. No, he was actually, um, he was working inside the department. So he was a direct labour hire, he had spe spe specific data science skills. He worked alongside of our team. So we, didn't, we would not um, account him as a consultant spent. Okay, and I also just wanted to clarify um, on the um, on the four eyes framework that was referred to at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Is that a fundamental structure for the innovation blueprint? So the innovation blueprint has been obviously the consultation was informed on those four eyes. I think the feedback from stakeholders throughout the process was actually it's the integration of those four eyes that help support a productive and high performing innovation system. So the framework of the, um, the final blueprint um, will be informed by the four eyes, but we'll also be looking at key actions um, of key areas of actions along the likes of strategy, funding, um, people, places, practical engagement, um, which is what we've heard through the, the blueprint um, consultation process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the, I wanted to ask about the the grant approval process. Um, I've gotten some information that startups and founders are being approached for information about their, um, their startup without having their funding confirmed. And the department is saying that um, we are currently in the process of seeking formal internal approval for the proposed sponsorships and amounts. We anticipate this process to take approximately one to two weeks from today, but this particular message was, I believe, in early to mid-August, and there's still no resolution. I'm just wondering if it's normal that the department would be asking for information from potential grant recipients before actually getting formal confirmation that those recipients are actually getting money. So, Ms. Munro, apologies, but it, it's not clear what um, additional information was so, requested. So, um, you've got a contractual agreement um, details. So, you've got things like entity name, company address, ABN. Um, you've got like. So it, it may be that additional information is being requested in order to fully assess the application against the scheme's requirements. That, that's definitely not what is happening here. It it's explicitly says we, a departmental staff member, are currently in the process of seeking formal internal approval for the proposed sponsorship and amounts. Which and is then yeah. it says once the sponsorship has been formally approved, we will revert to you with the necessary contacts to finalise the agreement. So, so we would obviously try and keep people informed of how their submissions are progressing um, and give them an indication of the likely time frame before but, we're able to confirm why, or not. Why are they being asked to provide information and being told that they've essentially got the sponsorship but without internal approval? So I would imagine, based on what you've just read, and obviously I haven't mm. seen the correspondence you're referring to, that it would be the team attempting to give the, the applicant a, an idea of likely timeframes before a decision is confirmed to them. But these people are, are essentially being told that they get the grant 
if there's formal internal approval, what is that? What is formal internal approval? Uh, apologies, we, we obviously can't speak to a document that we haven't yeah. seen. Well, what could be the process of formal internal approval that is not undertaken before Whatever. startups are being contacted? Sorry, can you some more Sorry. Yeah, there's Sorry. been a point of order. Point of order. Uh, Ms Munro has just framed that as a hypothetical oh. question, which isn't appropriate. And um, yeah, response I has I been... And I think that the I witness was about to see Pat's question on that anyway. Well, I don't, I don't think it's hypothetical. I've asked you said what that would. process is. Well, there's obviously a process of seeking internal approval, but that hasn't been undertaken before startups are being contacted. Could I ask, is the program in question the sponsorship program? Um, it is, yes, it is. Yes, okay, so um, the process is obviously we have two rounds every year where we um, invite people to submit um, applications for sponsorships. They are then competitively assessed against a range of criteria, which is all available on our website. Um, there's an assessment panel of four people, three within Investment New South Wales and one person outside of Investment New South Wales. They, they rate, we had um, for this current round, um, just bear with me, I think I've got the data here. Um, for this current round we had um, 51 applications, so totaling over $2 million in funding requests for a budget of uh, $400,000. Um, 17 um, recipients have been successful. We, as the department, put up recommendations to the Deputy Secretary for her approval. And when we believe, when there is an indication that uh, of approval from the Deputy Secretary, we would then begin contract um, engagement with those recipients. So I, I can't so talk what's to the, the... But is there any further approval that's required? No, no. Once the Deputy Secretary has approved, we would then start to um, contract in contract negotiations, not negotiations, contract um, execution with those recipients. So, but, but what's the point of the mid point? I mean, we've- I can't, sorry, I can't talk to that. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of that particular engagement. So it says, while we are still waiting on formal confirmation of our offer, in, like, and then the amount in sponsorship for your activity, we wanted to get a head start on the next steps. Point of, I've got a point of order, Chair. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier that it's very hard for anyone to be able to give reasonable comment when they haven't seen the document. I don't know if Ms Munro wants to table the document. Might perform be of some assistance. Um, I don't want to table this document just because I think there's still some identifying feature in it. But the, the email says, while we are still waiting on formal confirmation of our offer of X dollars in sponsorship for your activity, we wanted to get a head start on next steps. So, I, 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 Sorry, if, if I may respond, look, we, we've, provide, we've tried to answer the question as best we can in relation to the process and the steps in the process. We, we don't have sight of the document you're referring to, so I wouldn't like to make it, any it does, more comment on it. It does create it. some complications. All right, so. well, I'll see if I can get a properly a redacted, redacted document mm. so that I can put it to you this afternoon. Um, could you please explain what the... Um, what the Sydney Startup Hub's future is in terms of contract negotiations with tenants. Yeah, so um, I will hand that question to Ms Noonan. Thank you, Ms Noonan. Sure, thank you uh, for the question. So the Sydney Startup Hub opened in 2016. Um, and I think uh, at a time when accommodation in the Sydney CBD for technology intensive startups was um, you know, to, for them to be close to their customers, to investors and partners wasn't affordable. So. When the Sydney Startup Hub uh, was created, it was a very different market environment. Um, and I think since that time, and feedback from uh, startup residents and also the anchor tenants would tell us that the market for good quality accommodation, co-working space for, for startups in the Sydney, BD, Sydney CBD has um, evolved quite um, significantly. Um, the New South Wales government, we are in monthly regular engagement with the three anchor tenants, so Tankstream Labs, Fishburners, and Stone and Chalk, um, to really assess is this, um, the accommodation model um, offered in the Sydney Startup Hub the best fit for the New South Wales startup industry. I can say though that it is budgeted, like the budget for the Sydney Startup Hub 
um, is there until the lease expires on the premises at 11 York Street um, in, on September 30th, uh, 2027. Um, so that we are looking at different models. We are in close consultation with the anchor tenants, but also importantly, the startup residents themselves to see what they value and what else is available in the market. And we'll be making some recommendations to that effect in the blueprint. So how much money is budgeted until 2027? So the Sydney Startup Hub budget, um, so the annual lease fees and the maintenance and services cost is um, $14.8 million each year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh my God, I have 12 seconds. Uh, will the department be using information from the 2024 startup muster to inform um, policy development and future work? Yeah, I think the startup muster provides important sort of um, sentiment based data, um, and we would certainly look at that alongside the consultation. Um, that we've also conducted this year. Um, I would expect a number of the stakeholders we, we consulted with as part of the blueprint consultation, given the extensiveness of that process, will also be respondents to the startup muster. Uh, so I hope we see some, I guess, some um, uh, confirmation bias in, in some of um, the startup muster report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now break for a short afternoon tea break and be back in 15 minutes.
Thank you and welcome back. Um, I'll throw it immediately to Ms Boyd. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon. So I just wanted to ask, <coughs> I've been going from um, estimates to estimates asking about the implementation of the National Construction Code's minimum accessibility standards. Um, and this is one of those where there seems to be responsibility across a variety of different ministers, but I believe that Minister Chan Fong is the right one for this. Um, what has the department been doing in relation to working out, I'm not going to say whether, but when it's going to implement the National Construction Code minimum accessibility standards? So we obviously follow um what's in the building code and the um, parts of the building code that um, the government chooses to um, implement. Mm -hmm. um, so the former government, as you know, made the decision not to implement all mm -hmm. of those, those aspects. Um, we're currently trying to engage with relevant parts of, of the sector, the industry, to um, see how New South Wales might reconsider its position and um, there's a suite of options that we're considering. It might adopt part of those mm -hmm. um, recommendations in certain classes. Um, particular area of concern is to, while we support um, accessibility in New South Wales, to think about the cost of some of those provisions on construction. I think that's um, been the concern that we just don't jump to recognising those. Mm. We think through what might be some alternatives. It could just be to accept all of those conditions, but you could think about um, some hybrid options, for example, uh, in class two, not having the walk up provisions, but having other aspects of it. So, so there's a lot to unpack there. I think um, one of the most frustrating things here is that this is not a, a new thing. This has been something that we've been pushing um, the previous government to, to accept and now the current government for almost 18 months. Um, with the previous government, I understand from the department's perspective there are no instructions to implement it, so that makes sense, um, even though we know that New South Wales Labor at the time also was backing in the stance of not implementing this. Um, at what point did the minister uh, instruct you, I guess, to start looking at it as a serious proposition? Um. That would have been before my time as acting building commissioner. That probably in the former building commissioner and the work yeah. done in the first six months of the year. So I'd have to take that on notice. Is it a building commissioner issue though? Or is it a like what is the well, who would have responsibility for implementing something like that? So the the department sits on the on the Australian Building Codes Board. Yes. Um, so in that role, it's the building commissioner is the organisation. Um, mm -hmm. But me personally, I don't I don't have visibility unless oh. Mr. Head has anything through that period. Well, the Building Commission is part of the department. My understanding um, is that uh, it, uh, that part of the department's been leading the discussions about this. Really, there's a policy group within the Building Commission, so, mm -hmm. um, and that is the part of DCS that focuses on these issues. So when I raised this in previous estimates a couple of years back with, um, under the uh, former government, there was a suggestion um, based on, I think, industry figures at the time that there was a certain cost um, to implementing these standards, and that was then thoroughly debunked in the years since. Has there been some new modelling that indicates that there would be some impact on the cost of homes from this? I'm not aware that there's been new modelling to debunk the, mm. the, the, the views that there are costs involved. Um, mm -hmm. I think our position is to try and put good advice to this government so it can make a decision about whether it might recognise all of those new provisions or a uh -huh. portion of them. Um, so in, in being able to allow the minister to make the right decision, where is the information being sourced? So we're sourcing that information through our discussions with the industry, with the build builders right. and developers and designers. Yep. And are you aware that the... Um, I forget the acronym, the uh, the one you just mentioned, the Australian Building Codes Authority, is that ABC. right? The ABCB? ABCB. Um, that uh, they don't think it costs very much money at all. They're saying between 2700 and 4300 I think it was, I quoted the other day. Um, that's a very small amount of money to add to a new build. Um, is this government's position that that is that the 
amount that you're relying on to make that assessment well, and I'm advice to the I don't have a government minister. position. All, all, I'm, all, all we're doing is that we'll continue to provide advice to the, yeah. to the minister on what this government I'm just, might want to do. So, and again, I, I appreciate your, you may not see it this way, but um, some might say that the, 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 you know, the building industry or the, the property developers are perhaps self-interested in this in some way and are, are perhaps inclined to um, inflate the cost. Um, of this, which is why the ABCB went to such great lengths to um, to cost it all out, with as you know, industry participation on that board. Um, so I guess my question is, I f and I, to be to be honest, I find it very difficult to understand the government's position in not adopting this. So I'm trying to find what's gone wrong. Um, is the advice going up to the government that this is going to cost a lot more than what the ABCB is saying it's going to cost? If I can, I guess, just reinforce what Mr. Press is saying, uh, and again, uh, I'm a relative newcomer to the department, and this has been a, a, a lengthy discussion mm. that's been going on. Um, but I think what Mr. Press has said, and this is also my perspective, is that the Building Commission is seeking to understand the range of viewpoints and what is influencing those viewpoints. I mm. don't think we would be putting advice forward to government where we weren't uh, confident uh, that we understood uh, the reality mm. of the assertions that people are making about costs and that we'd actually tested those assumptions ourselves. It's pretty... Chris Boyd, if I could just, just recognise a point of difference that we have in mm. New South Wales. Obviously, ABC data is, is national. Mm -hmm. um, one particular point of difference in unpacking this is the smaller lot sizes that we have in, in New mm -hmm. South Wales generally for yep. class one. So if we talk about, and they're smaller and have more stories. So we're talking about a class one yep. tip, typically being two stories or even up to three. Mm -hmm. And so- um, And that makes us very different, does it, to Well, Victoria it doesn't necessarily or? very different, but it, it's a point of difference. And so again, we want to make sure that in considering From this, we, cons we consider it. Because Victoria and Queensland have implemented this amongst you know the ACT well, and a whole bunch of other. Are we that different to? I'm just saying, in terms of the context of ABCD data, which is which okay. is obviously a national average. Yeah. Um, and not saying that, that, not discussing the magnitudes of the costs involved. Again, mm -hmm. in terms of making sure we give quality advice to the government, considering the New yeah. South Wales specifics, so it can make an informed okay. decision about whether it should follow those others. So or not. the Disability Royal Commission made a clear recommendation that all states and territories. Um, sign up to the NCC as a matter of human rights for people with disability. Um, and the New South Wales's response, so New South Wales is the only state other than, the w and other than WA not to sign up to this. Um, the New South Wales's response to the Disability Royal Commission was that it needed to determine how it could impact the New South Wales's delivery of affordable homes. Um, puzzle me this. If you've got a ABC telling us that this is around $3,000 if you put these things in at the construction phase, as opposed to the 27000 to up to 22 times as much to retrofit it once you've bought a house. When the New South Wales government's responding with worrying about how it impacts on the delivery of affordable homes, are we only talking about affordable homes for able-bodied people? I can't talk to the government's response, sorry, Ms. Board. So does that make sense to you, though, that if we are not signing up to something that everyone else is signing up to, that's a fundamental human right, and we're doing it on the basis of some sort of market analysis of affordable homes, that we're not considering the cost to people with a disability or with mobility need? I, I can't speak to, to government's position. All I can okay. say is we've got to make sure that we give well-rounded advice to consider all yeah. of those factors. So I'm just worried about this position. I appreciate you already just coming to this role, but where is the government getting its advice if it's not getting it from the department? And if the department's giving advice, why is it not giving advice that this is something the government should do? I don't understand where the hold-up is. Well, I think, uh, as Mr Press indicated before, uh, the, the Building Commission is involved in discussions about this issue with the intent to put advice forward to, to government. And I think beyond that, uh, it's, 
I mean, he's indicated that there's a lot mm. of consultation uh, going it's just, on. It's been 18 months since I this government's that. been in, and people, you know, mobility needs are waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I may not have a full 10 minutes if, if Ms Boyd has further questions, so I'll see how we go with that 10 minutes if she wants to hang around. Um, I've just got a couple of follow-up questions uh, for Mr Taylor um, in regards to our um, discussion before around the Ombudsman report. Um, the Ombudsman has requested that Corrective Services New South Wales provide its final response to the recommendations uh, made in the final report within two months and provide updates every three months. Uh, regarding its process on implementing the recommendations. Um, do you know if Corrective Services New South Wales um, intends to comply with that timeline? Yeah, we will table a response in October next month. Thank you. Um, and um, will there be those um, updates as well every yes. three months? Yes. Great. Um, will they be public, those three monthly updates? I'll take that on notice. It'll be a response to the Ombudsman. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the convention around that. That's right. Yeah, if you could take that on notice, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, and so I just had another follow-up question uh, to Mr Press um, in regards to our discussion earlier um, in regards to... Um, um, in regards to interior designers. Um, I was just wondering if the department has had any feedback on the effect on architects as well. Um, my understanding is it's quite difficult to get an ar architect now and they're quite stretched. Um, have concerns been raised with the department around that? Um, so I, I think you're talking about the context of remedial work rather than new construction. Do you have any particular so space that you believe the concern is coming from? So my understanding is that now that um, in, um, interior designers um, are sort of cut out of a lot of the work that they used to do, and it relies almost entirely on architects to have to fill this space, um, and particularly, you know, we were talking earlier about how interior designers can work with architects and, and, and work collaboratively. Um, that that's nearly impossible to do because architects are so stretched now because they're having to also fill the space of the work that was originally done um, by interior designers, um, which means that now there's almost like a shortage, I suppose, of architects um, across the whole field. I'm just wondering if that... I mean, that, that's a concern that's been raised with my office, and I'm just wondering if that's a concern that's been raised with the department. That, that type of concern hasn't been raised with us, no. Um, has there been any consideration of that? Um, based on the information we have at the moment, there are enough uh, registered design practitioners to do to do building construction work in New South Wales. Um, there are there's obviously been um, challenges in certain parts of the sector, um, particularly around remedial work, because um, the regime caused quite a change in how that work was happening previously. Um, but we haven't heard any, any feedback to say that there's insufficient numbers of architects um, or consultants generally to do the work. If there was feedback, um, I'm assuming then that would sort of go um, from the department to the minister in regards to sort of the impacts of, of the changes to the Act as well? Absolutely. We, if, you know, we have information where... Um, there's activities happening across industry that um, cause friction with the with the legislation and opportunities for policy reform. We definitely would provide that advice. Um, but I also note probably the best space for that sort of discussion is the DBP review that's ongoing because I think that's going to be a very or it is a very thorough process to have all of those conversations. Um, do you have a timeline on on that review process? That's the review being run um, by the by by committee. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of the, the timeline at this moment. OK, thank you. Uh, Ms Abigail Boyd? Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, it still doesn't move. Um, I'll just come back to this. And I think you can tell I'm quite frustrated because I have been here for years asking this question. I've seen the data. Um, and I think that if, even if it was a, you know, a small amount added to the cost of construction at the outset, we would be doing people a favour. Um, for anyone who wants to age in place or, or wants to 
um, have somebody around for a cup of tea who happens to be in a wheelchair, um, it would be great for everybody if we had um, this level of accessibility that everywhere else has. Um, are you able to give me anything in terms of, I guess, timeline for expectations? It would give comfort if there was a process that the, the department was following through with that it had a deadline where it would then hand a, a, a bit of advice or something to the minister. Is there something going on? Well, I can't at this stage. I mean, the, the government has committed to further stakeholder forums to consider uh, this issue. Uh, I can take... I can take it generally on notice and see if I can come back mm. to you with something. I think it would be helpful. I think also um, in the estimates this round that I've um, asked these questions in, people keep talking about stakeholders as though it's only the industry. Yeah. Um, and I just don't believe that the New South Wales industry is so much weaker than every other bit of um, Australia that we need to consider them exclusively. Um, and I hope that we're speaking with not just people with disability, but also seniors and, and anyone else who wants to, um, or anyone who's a human, I think, um, and has somebody coming around who's not necessarily able to go upstairs. Um, can I also ask then, just coming back on the discussion I was having with the Minister in relation to weapons manufacture, um, is there something at a, I understand that the innovation blueprint's still under um, consideration, I understand that there is a bunch of other documents yet to be revised, but is there something somewhere that gives guidance as to the extent to which we would invest in that sort of activity and where we would draw a line if something was being exported that we thought to be particularly dangerous? So I think it might be helpful to put my response in, in context of the defence industry. So the defence industry in New South Wales is, which is very broad, as you know, is currently worth 3.4 billion in GVA. Now that's 0.5% of GVA for the state. So whilst important, it, it pales in comparison to industries like construction, which yes. is currently sitting at 53. The website says we're trying to grow it. Billion dollars. So we, we provide support to a range of different industries, including defense, but if you're looking at priority industries, mm -hmm. um, clearly areas like minerals extraction, green energy, modern manufacturing and local manufacturing are very clear priorities for government where we are focused and there is significant expenditure ongoing. Mm -hmm. There's very extremely limited direct investment in defence from the New South Wales government. Okay, what about the Western Sydney Airport development? and the cluster around that now of um, agreements that we have with different weapons companies, an advanced manufacturing facility to help those companies. It seems to all be very defence related around that project. Is that going to increase our percentage of what we're, I guess, what's, what we're churning out in terms of product? I'm extremely sorry, but I'm going to have to refer any questions to the Bradfield Development yeah, okay. Agency. Yeah. Apologies. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's all I have. Okay, in that case, I move to the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Going to uh, building uh, and just on the strike action that the ETU is undertaking, is there any uh, <laughs> Is there any work being done to ensure that public safety and welfare is not at risk? There were media reports that there might be risks to network security and potential blackouts resulting from industrial action. So is, is there any work to ensure that this isn't going to be the result? So our, our focus is building commission um, is on the electrical work essentially if I put in simple terms on the metre side of the connection um, and to my understanding a lot of this action is is more on the distribution side so that's not a, not an area that, that we regulate um, that's for uh, DQ mm -hmm. um, so we, we really don't have much um, interaction with that issue from, from our perspective at this point in time but obviously we're keeping a watching brief mm -hmm. and uh, to, to see if there's any impacts that we should be aware of. And the same question, but for the CFMEU action? So um, that's primarily more of an issue for, for safe work. Um, our concern is that regardless of who the constructor is and, and whether they might be a union member or not, that they're doing that work 
properly. Um, and so if, you know, if we have any evidence that, that a site becomes high risk because of um, CFME related events, we can consider that. Um, but in, until that point, we just uh, continue as normal. And so has work that is in estimates tomorrow, so. Um. Thank you. And, and has that occurred? Have there been any high risk situations that have emerged? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, thank you. Um, on fair trading, I did want to ask about the um, automotive repairs, which is somewhere in here. Thank you. Uh, so there's been concerns raised that because of the complexity and high costs associated with motor vehicle repairs, there is a shortage of fair trading inspectors who handle these disputes. Is that something that is going to be addressed? Uh, thank you, Ms. Munro. So at Fair Trading, we have a pool of inspectors uh, and we look at where the highest need is and the highest risk is, and then we will deploy the inspectors accordingly. So we're, we're sort of looking at that issue currently and looking at how we resource, resource it. So are there enough Fair Trading inspectors to handle the disputes that are arising? Um, so to this point, yes, there are. Um, but as I said, we're keeping a watching brief on that and we can uh, redeploy people into the area if required. So what's the time frame that you like to resolve disputes within? Uh, in the automotive mm -hmm. industry. Um, I'm not sure whether we actually have a KPI for automotives in particular, but I can certainly take that on notice and come back to you. Thank you. So when you say... Do, do fair trading inspectors have a specialty within the department? Yes, they, they do. So some, some of them have specialties. Um, others of them uh, can work across multiple areas and we can deploy them as, as we see fit. So the automotive um, specific inspectors, how many of those are there? Um, I may have to take that figure on notice for you. Let me have a look. <clears throat> uh, yes, so I do have that figure. So we currently have um, 10 dedicated automotive inspectors. Mm -hmm. And how many have been dedicated automotive inspectors over the last three financial years? Um, I can get that on notice for you. Thank you very much. That would be helpful. Um, is there any recruitment happening at the moment for those roles? Um, I believe there are some, maybe a couple of vacancies that are being recruited for. Okay. Yes. Do you know how many vacancies? Uh, I don't have that information. Could you me. please provide it on notice? Thank you. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the solar rebate, the battery rebate that was recently announced. Um, there's been some concerns about the regulation around providers. Is that something that the that Fair Trading are examining at the moment? Is there any focus? So it doesn't primarily sit in our space, although I am aware that we have been having discussions with IPART on the issue, so it is on our radar, Okay. Um, but it doesn't sit squarely in our space. So where would it usually sit? Um, so IPART has been sort of taking the lead on that. Okay. So when you say they've been taking the lead, they've been engaging with stakeholders? Um, they have been engaging with stakeholders. They are aware of, of some of the issues that you raise and they have sort of been talking to us about whether we can do something in a combined way. So I know that my um, inspector and investigators are dealing with the IPART um, counterparts. Okay, and can I just understand why it sits with IPART just from like a functional point of view rather than fair trading? Um, so... It, it, I'll have to sort of take that on notice, I think. So I know that they have been the lead on it and have engaged with us, but it, it is sitting with them. Okay, that would be helpful to understand that. Um. 
Thank you. Uh, on back to innovation. Is the department advising the minister on options to create some sort of venture capital type fund like Breakthrough Vic or Main Sequence? So a um, number of different options are being considered as part of the innovation blueprint, including various different funds, not necessarily modelled on other jurisdictions which have had their own share of success and issues. But yes, we are providing advice in relation to those types of funds. Okay, and is any work happening with other departments to create that advice? So we're engaging more broadly across government on the innovation blueprint, including with colleagues in other departments, absolutely. Which other departments are involved in that? So I will have to get a full list. Um, clearly departments like um, customer service, treasury, um, I, I, think the, I think the work is actually engaged very broadly across mm -hmm. government departments. I might ask Ms Noonan to join me if she's got a, a broader list of, of engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Ms Noonan. No, thanks for the question. Yes, yeah, so we are um, consulting extensively across government um, because uh, there, the innovation blueprint um, is relevant to many sectors and much of the work of government. So there is a very extensive list which um, all of those agencies which uh, Ms McPhee just referenced are included um, in addition to health, transport, um, and I won't do the list justice, but I'm happy, happy to provide it. Thank you, that'd be helpful. Um, just on tech vouchers, my understanding is they haven't opened this year, is that correct? Uh, there's been no expenditure in tech vouchers this year, but they have in terms of the contracts between ourselves and the delivery partners. Um, that should be, let me just check, um, I'm sure that's close to being finalised, if not already. So in terms of like the funding going to um, the delivery partners, so the mm -hmm. way it works the, yeah. the Boosting the Business Innovation really. Partnership Program, there's the 13 delivery partners. They all receive um, uh, an equal allocation of funding. So just specific amounts. So sorry. that full list got every... Every, um, every university resistant. and publicly yeah. funded um, research organisation operating in New South Wales. So that includes CSIRO and ANSTO. Mm. Um, so each um, receive of the $11 million, $786,000. Yeah. $511,000 of that goes to boost activities, things like incubator programming, um, promoting the value proposition of the research within that organisation. So can and I then just, there's, sorry. I just wanted to ask specifically about um, those organisations. Do they, do they have to apply or like, do they seek that funding or no, like, it's, how it's, are they selected? No, it's um, the guidelines is that there's an equal distribution across the, the, the eligible um, PFROs in New South Wales. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I spoke last budget estimates about um, a grants measurement framework. I'm just wondering if anything has been completed or worked on to have some sort of grants measurement framework in, in terms place. of the impact of the grants, the evaluation of the grants. Yep. Yeah. So, um, with all of the programs that we administer, mm -hmm. uh, we have an evaluation framework as part of those programs. Um, so, for things like measure um, the minimum viable product MVP Ventures program, mm -hmm. BBIP, Westmead, Female Founders. There is a we have a program logic which each one of those programs which have targeted outcomes. And we have a, ded a dedicated evaluation team that we work closely with on assessing what's the, who's applying for those grants, um, who's receiving those grants, what happens to those businesses after they receive those grants. And it's an area where we're continuing to work on and improve so we can see the impact of that funding. So could you please provide me with a breakdown of the regional, I say remote and regional versus urban recipients and also the proportion of men and women who are receiving grants? Uh, across all programs, no, but I could for something like MVP. Okay. So I have the Why data. Not across all programs? Well, not just with me at the moment, but happy to, <coughs> to get that information yeah, for you. That, yeah. that would be fabulous. But um, would you like me to talk to MVP? Uh, I'm happy for it to be taken on notice with, with the other um, aspects. I mean, there's been some reporting, for example, about the regional aspect of MVP, but I'm just happy to have the figures um, sure. on notice. Thank you. 
Uh, I also wanted to note that the female founder dates on the website seem not to have been updated. It seems like they've been, um, it doesn't say that they're open. And uh, I don't think it's got for any For the, the program administered by Tech Ready Women? Yeah. Okay, so, I'll, I'll have to look at that. I would. Yeah, I think the Tech Ready Women website is correct, but the Investment New South Wales one isn't. I know that we're, sort of, we're, we're halfway through that program um, mm. with 50 females in each cohort um, and we're due to... Yeah, due to start another one shortly, so I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with the international landing pads, do you have the number of international organisations that have made use of that since last year? So we have one um, business currently in residence at the international landing pad. So just for context, we have the capacity to host five mm -hmm. um, firms at any one time. Um, we have, um, yes, one currently in residence, and we also have three approved um, for residency once they enter, Australia, um, enter Sydney, enter New South Wales. Um, there was also, as you might have noted, um, MOUs recently signed with um, Living Labs in Jakarta and in Indonesia for up to four months of residency for startups coming into Sydney with a reciprocal access arrangement for New South Wales startups to go into their um, um, facility in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. And there's intention to sign MOUs with Sci Hub in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and also Common Grounds in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia for those reciprocal arrangements. Thank you. And how were those companies selected? Uh, the, the eligibility is um, on our website mm -hmm. and um, they, they have to apply and they're assessed against that eligibility. So are you, I mean, you've got five spots, but are you receiving more submissions than you can take? At this point in time, no. Okay. Um, and we, this, this first year is very much a, a really a, a test on the demand and the mm -hmm. types of services and connections those startups seek when they come into market. Mm -hmm. And if we see demand and value for the New South Wales innovation system, we'll look at that program and, and put forward recommendations um, to the government. So are those companies actually proactively seeking the space or is Investment New South Wales going out and asking for expressions of interest? No, we're not, we're not actively going out. The, the information is available on our website. Mm -hmm. We promote it, obviously, when we're having events, um, that, 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 that is something we offer. Mm -hmm. But the, where we have sourced um, typically has come from our offshore network. Mm -hmm. um, so our um, senior trade commissioner in um, Singapore has um, done some work with those um, countries in Vietnam, Indonesia and um, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have an MOU with NASCOM in India, which Business New South Wales was part of. Mm -hmm. So those organisations really are the sources of lead generation. Are they involved with Gift City? Is that I'm not, not no. aware of that, no. Okay. Uh, thank you. The, um, what investment money is allocated in the budget for the space industry, growth and development of the space industry for Investment New South Wales? Yeah, I, I don't have a specific um, dollar associated, but I can talk to the, the space industry and work that we're doing with the industry more generally, if that would be helpful. Um, I think there's a fair bit of public information about that, so that that's okay. Um, can I just confirm, is the Space Research Network's pilot research program and student program fund still active? It is, yes. So the Space uh, Research Network has awarded $2.3 million mm -hmm. through their research pilot program and student project funds, and those activities are ongoing. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go back to Mr. Press. Um, could you please outline what the Building Commission has done in relation to answer homes? So, um, answer first uh, came to my attention in around April this year. Um, a concerned customer of answer reached out, um, and at that point, I was concerned that I hadn't heard about um, answer issues generally, mm. um, and it turned out because they were. They were a builder that didn't necessarily have a high number of complaints in a particular period. It was a period of prolonged action. And mm -hmm. so and our focus in just establishing the Building Commission at that point in time had been focusing on the most complained about builders and trying to take um, affirmative action there. Mm -hmm. So from that point, um, we uh, 
did a review of answer, I could say, um, by doing proactive inspections on um, a number of their active building sites. And through mm -hmm. that, it came to our attention that there was some uh, relatively serious compliance issues. Um, and then in about June, um, July, we issued a, a temporary suspension of both the answer uh, company license and, and that of their, their single director, Mr. Maloney. Um, that was taken because we had concerns about the um, the conduct that we'd seen and we're also concerned that there could be a possibility that new new consumers or, or new customers could be signed up and therefore also exposed to the types of harms that we'd already, already seen in that historic performance. Okay, and you mentioned it was temporary. Is there a time frame on that or what's, when does so that it was a, So that was, a, that was a 60 day um, suspension initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then we followed that up in August with a further 60 day suspension at the same time we issued both of those parties with a notice to show cause. Mm -hmm. um, that, that commences, I guess, the, the formal disciplinary process where we give both of those parties an opportunity to respond to our, our investigation findings. Mm -hmm. um, and then we assess that and determine what action um, we would take, whether that be um, reprimands, caution, um, suspension, etc. So when is that show cause deadline um, in place? Is it within the 60 days? So we're currently within the 60 days. We're about... Um, roughly halfway through that through that period. And so what's the date for their show cause um, deadline? Um, I'm not sure if I have that specifically to, to hand. Um, yeah, I won't guess, but I, I'm pretty I'm fairly certain it's some it's some date in this month of September. Mm. Could you please take the date on notice? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So from that from that point, then we determine what action is taken. Um, yeah, I understand. Is that a public process? Like, will there be some announcement made as the assessment is occurring, or is it once you've made a decision that the announcement's made? So the the standard process for if there is a disciplinary decision, and let's presume. Um, just for argument's sake, if it, if it was a suspension or, or something of that nature, mm. or if there was any disciplinary conditions issued to the license holders, then that information would be reflected on the public register, um, essentially in real time. Mm -hmm. um, because there are a number of homeowners affected by this process, we have been trying to really lean into communicating with them regularly as much as we can share. Obviously, we can't share all parts of the process because of maintained procedural fairness, but we have been mm. trying to share as much as possible, um, including writing to them to let them know what's what's going on. Um, and so I'd expect we'd, we'd also um, inform them of the, of the outcome. Thank you. Sorry to jump around. Um, I, I also wanted to clarify, with the Advanced Manufacturing Research Facility, what is the role of Investment New South Wales in that? So that isn't part of my portfolio of responsibilities. So is there, I, I understand um, Professor Durant-White is on the Investment Committee, I think it's called. Is that, um, do you have any reporting lines related to the AMRF? I'm afraid we'd have to pass that um, question to the chief scientist. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Thank you very oh, Ms. much. Ms. Hurst, did you want me to? You asked a question before that I wasn't able to answer regarding the DBP review. Mm -hmm. um, so it's being run by the Public Accountability Works Committee. Um, Ms. Boyd is the chair of that committee. The submission's closed on the 2nd of July. Um, and I wasn't able to advise you on a timeline, and I've checked the uh, committee's website information, there's no timeline listed, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Ms. Sullivan? Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, this. I'm back on corrections, if that's okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could tell me what the potential or actual use of the um, devices or the video access to mental health services. It's a concern that um, I think, I mean, I think it goes back to the audit office in 2017 when we became aware that 
75% of inmates are not receiving access to therapeutic programs and also the degree 62.9% of inmates have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. And one of the things um, was about whether or not inmates could access counselling from inmate tablets. So whether that's happening or whether it's possible or we're looking at that. There's a big part of that that is justice health, but there's, there's certainly a corrections component. Maybe my colleague, all the psychologists work for Jen, and there's, there's certainly a corrections um, component to that answer. So that is something we've been looking at, particularly around the remote counselling for psychologists. People mm. can currently access private psychologists um, in that way. One of the challenges we have is around the continuity of care and how we ensure that we can um, keep people safe when there might be two different clinicians providing that service. We do have a situation at the moment where psychologists do provide remote service into correctional centres and we're utilising technology to do that. So for some of our locations where it's hard to recruit psychologists, we have uh, metro-based psychologists who provide those remote services. We haven't looked at the delivery of um, the programs um, that you mentioned via tablets for a number of reasons. One, the tablets at the moment are largely um, given to people when they go into their cell at the end of the day. It's not really conducive to be running therapeutic programs in that setting. Um, we do have other options where we've used uh, laptops and we, we do that in the community where people can um, access group-based programs via laptops rather than in person. We're also looking at technology that's more like a booth so people can sit in a booth and participate in a program um, remotely rather than having to be group based, but not via the tablets at this stage. And then as Commissioner Taylor said, um, we have been looking at mental health apps uh, via the uh, digital strategy that you referred mm. to earlier. And one of the proposals that we're considering is to develop a uh, mental health application um, specifically for those tablets. So we're looking at all options. We were looking at um, other available apps, but uh, again, it comes back to the continuity of care um, and the safety of people in custody when they're receiving psychological services from people independent to corrective services. So there's some, some policy and uh, information sharing aspects to that that we need to work through to make sure that we can keep people safe. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, there's, um, I keep, there's this recurrent theme about, um, you know, confidence versus risk and where you um, find yourself on the pendulum of those mm. things. Mm. And some, yeah, it's an interesting, it seems to be this reoccurring thing. Risk seems to be the prohibitor, whereas it may have to be in certain circumstances. Yeah. Addressing that is how we'll actually move to mm being able to provide the services that we really need to. Mm. Um, I was just wondering, I think this might be for you, Acting Commissioner, and that is um, possibly Secretary, I'm not sure, but um, the, uh, the closure or, or the mothballing of some of those uh, part, parts of the prisons, I, I know that Goulburn and Bathurst were both having wings closed due mm. to various reasons, low inmates and ageing facilities and that staff were promised to be relocated if needed. Um, and I'm just curious whether that's happened or what's happening there, given they're quite remote. Yeah. What, what are we doing with the staff? I, I, at high level, um, and as I've been very quiet this afternoon. Yeah, it's um, your turn, um, Mr. Tibble. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, just in terms of uh, consolidation, so 130 beds at uh, Cessnock. Uh, How many was that, sorry? 130. Yep. Stop me, Acting Commissioner, if I'm wrong. Uh, 209 at Bathurst, 170 at uh, Goulburn. Uh, and they're just components, clearly, mm. of uh, both Goulburn and Bathurst. And just, you know, calling out that Goulburn, for example, is, you know, 1884 uh, infrastructure. Mm. I don't think it's a, uh, it may be heritage in one sense, but I think mm. Mm. it is um, it is good consolidation. Um, yep. uh, and then um, obviously 140 beds uh, at Oberon and 146 at um, Dawn de Lois at uh, Emu Plains. And that I think tallies out at uh, 
how many beds? It's about a thousand. No, so we that program that you referenced mm. were beds that we mothballed at Christmas time. Yeah. The inmate numbers have risen by about a thousand, um, from kind of twelve thousand just before Christmas to thirteen thousand today. So, um, so those beds remain um, mothballed. Mm. But our ability to um, continue, you know, we're, we're constrained at the moment by the, the growth of numbers, which was, was un unexpected. So um, there's, there's no plans at the moment to um, close And what about, so what about staff that Oh, were, sorry, your question was about yeah, staff. No, no, yeah, I mean, my question, thank you. My yeah, question yeah, was sorry. broad, and, uh, but it was starting with, so with the... the get, I'm also curious. You've raised the increase, you know, the extra thousand, the increase in numbers. But in terms of the stuff where we have mothballed or closed down, have staff been transferred and moved around? So those, or? those we had vacancies. Um, mm. We had vacancies um, on all of those sites that right. staff were just relocated into. Particularly vacancies called by you know long time, long term leave, sick leave, workers comp. Um, so no one was relocated. No, no one had to be. Okay. And just, and just yes. if, I, if I may, clearly quantity is one mm. awful word, but numbers are one thing. The other aspect is the qualitative aspect of what is actually going on in Miss mm. Higgins, and I think you're probably aware of this, but the ratio of sentenced to remanded inmates is yes. yeah. uh, increasing, uh, and that is a, um, a pressure point uh, and a challenge to which corrective services must uh, rise and adapt and, and it's very focused on uh, doing that because it appears to be a sustained trend. Mm. So with the increase, so what is the, is there a feed in system? So the, so corrections is notifying the government that obviously this big increase in remand numbers is happening. Um, are we, and then is the, you know, is, is the advice to government, that's okay, we can deal with this increase in remand, we've got the places, we're, we're, we're business is good. Is that, is that the In terms the of bed loop? numbers, we, we are still, the prison population peaked in March 2020 when the pandemic yeah. um, came along at over 14,000 inmates. So we are still a thousand inmates below where we were in 2020. Um, you know, four years down the track, so um, so bed capacity isn't an issue, but we are having to adjust and adapt the system for yep. the rise of remand inmates. Remand inmates are um, a very different cohort with um, so different likely, risks and challenges than exactly. a cohort. Are we likely to see existing facilities that aren't remand purposed facilities having to convert part of their it's more adapting or? what we we do and so we have a growing cohort of, of remand as the secretary mentioned so um jenny in her area is looking around the programs offering for remand inmates in our work and education area we're looking around further um, offerings for remand inmates they remand inmates are a less stable more unwell cohort so our Unscheduled escorts to the hospital, uses of force, you know, assaults, and some of those things are increasing as well. So there are decisions that we need to make around the network just to adjust the way that we operate our centres with that change in mix. Less so than we need to operate these beds rather than, than those beds. And whilst I would not claim to be an expert on it, I was reading last night acting commissioner about the range of programs that are being developed for uh, remanded prisoners so I think the historic mm. thinking has perhaps been that as uh, most prisoners on remand or those purely on remand uh, you know are entitled to the presumption of innocence and their matters are before the uh, the courts that uh, the options for programming were were very limited uh, there is more program development work, ha work happening uh, with an eye to ensuring that there is um, there is a level, level of occupation and activity through the day that is uh, meaningful and focused um, 
on an outcome and dare I say it, some hope for the future as well. And so what are we talking about? What sort of, or sorry, more to the point, who's developing those programs, those remand? Are they within Gen seen as existing yep. programs that there's, there's new mm -hmm. areas that we're moving into? Yep. So we've always, well, we for a number of years now, we've delivered a domestic and family violence program yep. that's adapted for people on remand and an addictions program for people on remand. Uh, we now offer what we call our dialectical behaviour therapy programs, which is, which is more about that emotional regulation type skill development, so completely agnostic to offence. Um, so we have two programs uh, on offer for people on remand where they can learn um, those skills. Um, and we're also very focused at the moment on the need to address trauma for people mm. in prison. So we've just uh, launched a new program called Seeking Safety, which is a trauma stabilisation program, which is for everyone in custody. But certainly uh, we're looking at how we can offer it very early in that reception phase, because as uh, Acting Commissioner Taylor said, that initial period of remand really needs to be focused on stabilisation. So what health needs do you need? Do you have a, a, an immediate substance abuse issue that we can address straight away? Um, is there trauma that we can support you through to make the process of incarceration um, slightly easier? And then, uh, you know, when people receive their sentence, they're in a really good place to then move on to the next phase, which is looking at the drivers of their offending behaviour and how we can support them to learn skills can in that I, and space. And can I ask, so who has developed the Seeking Safety Program? Like, who's designed that, sorry? So it, it's, we've, it's, we've adapted it internally, but um, it's an off-the-shelf program that we've purchased and adapted. When you say off the shelf, is it possible to find out, you know, whose shelf it came from? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I probably have that here, but we have a, a whole discussion paper that we can provide on the history of that paper, of that program and why we selected it Thank and you. how we adapted is that, it. Would you be able to provide that on notice? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd be very grateful. And in terms of how that program is delivered to people on remand, mm -hmm. how is that done? Is it done in a group set group setting? Based. It is. Yeah. And are there people that, are, do the, are there people who lead it? Yes, there's facilitators mm -hmm. that are and corrective services staff. Okay, yes. and those staff members are trained in how to deliver the program. That's so, right, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you. Um, can I just ask, on the, on the recommendation 16, I mentioned it very briefly this morning to the minister, about um, the telephone system, the recommend Astel inquiry recommendation 16 about the safe reporting line. Um, how many how many operators are currently working that system? Do you have this detail? I you, don't. You, uh, you can take I, it on notice. I think I might. What? Just while um, the, the, the acting commissioner is finding that, can I can I just say? Having been close to uh, the Astral Inquiry, where we actually outsourced some of our services for reasons of independence and uh, heightened security, to put it bluntly, directly, uh, look, we would be open to, if, if there are concerns uh, around confidentiality uh, or seeping of information, those are those are serious matters, mm. uh, Mr. Kinson, and we would be both applicable, by the way, to staff as well as um, staff who we, we absolutely want work to be a, a safe mm. environment. With the uh, assurances about matters that should be reportable, uh, having the appropriate mechanism, but very importantly for prisoners as well, if they're inmates. Uh, if there are concerns, we are open to uh, receiving those and looking at them very, you know, in a, in a highly focused way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to write to you and talk to you about this, but I'm just curious yeah, as well course. about what the um, what the setup is. I've, I've, yeah. I think it's I can I can speak to you. that. So there are six staff that man. Yeah. We, we have two lines. So we have the corrective services support line. Yes and the sexual misconduct reporting line. Yep. It's the same six staff that sit at the end of those okay. two uh, numbers, which are free numbers on the 
on the inmate telephone. They're not recorded. They're not listened to. But yeah. and those those staff have a different process that they run through if they're receiving a call to either one of those lines. The SMRL line was stood up pretty quickly, and so those staff were trained in trauma informed practice. It's it's a report. It's a line to report, not necessarily to provide sexual assault counselling or trauma counselling. That yes. would be referred elsewhere. It's a reporting line. But to the secretary's point around concerns for staff and avenues to report on the inmate phone system at the moment, which for many inmates and most inmates includes their tablet in their cell, they are, can report to those two lines that I mentioned. They can also um, phone the ICAC, the Law Enforcement Conduct Condition, Commission, the New South Wales Ombudsman, the Commonwealth Ombudsman, Justice Health and the Healthcare Complaint Inquiry line. So all those lines are available as well as, you know, talking to staff, writing letters, official visitors and, you know, contacting anyone, including parliamentarians. So, um, but any feedback that, you know, might come through you in terms of that line, I, that line has taken a number of calls and there's been a number of calls that have been responded to. I've not had any concerns raised with me around confidentiality. I know that was a particular feature of the inquiry. Mm. Um, that that be the case and the important part of that service is it reports outside of the correctional centre which was uh, which was obviously a focus of um, the special commission of inquiry but happy to thank you are your you able to indicate how many um, how many calls they've currently received or how many you know what is there a yeah I'd, we'll, I'll do that on notice, on notice thank you yeah. thank you yeah I'm interested like if there's a breakdown of calls per day or calls overall. I'd be really interested to know what yeah, the volume that those, we're yeah. looking at is. Um, just when the, um, I, uh, it slipped my mind at the time, but when we were talking about programs, the remand programs, and we talked about the couple that are available, are there First Nations pro program, programs specific for First Nations men and women on remand? Um, not that are uh, in that uh, suite of programs that I discussed, no, but there are supports that are provided by staff within centres. So we've got identified SAPOs and our regional Aboriginal pathway officers who do provide support to people on remand. I must, I just, I got some questions returned on notice in relation to that, you know, how many uh, SAPOs are available, etc. There's a very low number compared to the number of inmates whether you know I, that was I think both remand figures and inmate sentenced inmate figures mm. um, I'm just yeah curious is there a plan do we have are there plans perhaps secretary for you are there plans to to be able to have more culturally appropriate you know cultural programs operating within the systems mm. and I don't necessarily mean by um, correction staff, whether it's external providers, what is the system? I know that we were talking in other budget estimates about co-design programs and so on. Is is anything happening in that space in terms of corrections? Look, I would uh, make the point that the thematic review acting commissioner is due for completion. Uh, Very soon, and Jen's leading that work and that's around really looking at the 1991 Royal Commission, but yeah. probably something that I might point out in answer to that our Aboriginal Mentor Program is an area that we're really focusing on. So notwithstanding the work we're doing to connect with um, um, Aboriginal control organisations, increase our employment of our Aboriginal staff, which is nudging 4%, which we still got a long way to go, but we've, we've come a long way, almost 200 staff now, I think, that are... Mm -hmm. uh, that identifies Aboriginal, not necessarily in Aboriginal identified roles, but so we have 12 Aboriginal elders now that are employed by corrections that come into from community into correctional centres and mentor inmates. They work alongside the program staff, but they just you know like down on the the, the south coast, I um, was able to have a chat with one of the elders that come in there, and they just provide that cultural connection and support that ultimately um, assists inmates culturally and makes them better connected there, with the other interventions we have. Just very quickly, there is clearly um, more to be done. Mm. Uh, and the focus around um, closing the gap, target mm. 10, uh, for those who 
and the many challenges are there, changing offending profile, the challenges arising from DV mm. are very real, the, the shifting uh, sentence to uh, remand ratio is a very real challenge. Uh, all of us sitting here today um, from close to corrections would say good things are happening and I think we have some remarkable staff doing good work. Mm. Is there more to be done? Is mm. the work incomplete? It is absolutely and just a need of, uh, <laughs> of new initiatives, but I mm. think there will be opportunities with things such as the thematic review to, uh, to look at um, more and new things. Mm. And I will put, obviously, SUPS on, supplementary questions, but I'm just... The mission isn't to just increase First Nations employment and corrections, is it? it the mission is to be having community. Yeah, and it's... It, that's the mission, I've, surely. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw the Secretary's comments, I think, in Minister Washington's yes. um, estimates, estimates yeah. around DCJ mm. learning how to partner yes. better, and I would echo that for corrections. We've come a long way, mm. and probably some of that is just the epiphany that we've had mm. around... Which First Nations people have been telling us for a long, long time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Um, <laughs> But it's how we learn. And, and there have been learnings in youth justice, the place of healing, yeah. uh, and um, yarning circles, all those sorts of uh, things. There are learnings from a much more, smaller system that we need to apply to mm. a, a much larger system. And if, if I could just, uh, in response to the question around programs, so we don't have programs that are specific for remand, but we do offer a lot of cultural strengthening programs that are designed and implemented through our Aboriginal Strat um, Strategy Directorate. So we run a number, a didgeridoo making program in St Helier's and Cessnock. We've got a cultural immersion program in Cessnock. Um, we've got a number of programs across the state that we can provide you detail on um, that are very much focused on cultural strengthening, but they're available to everyone in custody, uh, remand or sentence. Thank you. Thank you. Opposition? Yep. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I might um, also stay on corrections if you like. Uh, well, so can you advise, and I'm trying to rephrase my question so I'm not asking for opinions, so <laughs> bear with me. So can you advise what the allocation of sanitary products are distributed per inmate at correctional centres? So, um, so for women, so sanitary products aren't available on our buy-ups, not available for purchase. They are provided to women in the quantities they need when they need them. Mm -hmm. That The complaint that came to you also came to me and I spoke to the governor at the centre where the complaint mm -hmm. came to try and get to the bottom of it. Um, and I've not seen any evidence of women not accessing the sanitary products they need, but I'd be more than happy to it would concern me were that the case. Yeah. Um, so I did look into that straight away. Okay. And uh, I actually learned something that you... Yeah. Because a lot of things on the buy-up, there's the soap you get for free and there's the soap you buy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but that's not, the, so that's not the case for, um, for you know, hygiene products. For They're yeah, available okay. free of charge. All right. So then... Um, So, commissionary is also buy ups. Is that what you're talking about? Like yeah, yeah. That's okay. More so they're not term. available on on the buy ups. No. No. Okay. And so, um, why would this um, be circulating the story that, that that there's not enough sanitary products and that they're using tissues and toilet paper or pieces of clothing yeah, to? I'm yeah. I'm not sure, Miss McDonald, but um, if you have more information that, than I have, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to take okay. that. It would concern me yeah. greatly as you would expect. Yeah. Um, I might just turn now then to um, so Ju Junie, I asked a question before um, and I just wondered when it was under the um, GEO group, the total cost was approximately 60 million per year. Um, now that it's going to be, or it's under com community, so, sorry, corrective services, uh, what 
um, measures would you put in place to obtain metrics uh, so that inmates can they'll have better results, um, less recid recidivism, um, better community integration, uh, those kind of things. Yes, so um, do you need transitions to the state operation on the 1st of April okay. um, 25? And the metrics that Juni will operate under will be the, the, the same and reported in the same manner as for other state uh, state managed correctional centres. Mm -hmm. so and would you expect that it would be under that sixty million? I'll take that on notice. I'm not okay. sure so take that what we have. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what we... I know we, we canvassed that in, in detail in, in the previous estimates, mm -hmm. so I'll, yeah. I'll take that on notice and Okay. Respond. And we also um, talked about, uh, with the GEO group, um, in supply contracts, uh, about 7.5 million to local juni businesses. Do you... Uh, will these arrangements be continued once the transition happens? Yes, so there's... Um, some of those local arrangements that we spoke about at the previous estimates that um, will be different. Some of those will continue, mm -hmm. some of those will um, be discontinued. I remember at the last estimates we spoke a fair bit about the Meals on Wheels, which I know is slightly different to your, yeah. your question, but I can inform the committee that we're continuing that service um, in the community. Some of the, um, some of the businesses that the GEO Group purchase directly from, um, the arrangements will be different when the state's there because we, we purchase on a, on a statewide basis. Having said that, we are, we're a long way into the transition period, there's seven months to go, so we are deeply engaged with the community and finding new ways and different ways as, as a state-run operation that we can engage in that community. I've, I've approved an additional role in terms of a community projects role down there in June to make sure that we can we can realise some of the opportunities that have been identified there in that community. So I think my evidence last time was that we will engage in different ways as the state to a private enterprise and we are just um, making sure that we are true to that commitment in our in our staffing. It will be different but it will continue to contribute to the community. Um, both the, the council and um, to the, you know, yep. the, okay. the local Thank economy. And, and I did ask before about the bail and other legislation amendment domestic violence bill and um, indicated that in October the EM monitoring will come online. No specific, it, will, it is anticipated to be October. Yep. Uh, the precise date we, I cannot um, advise yet that it is it will be early october yep. still nice to pass the parliament yeah so on that um i'm just wondering is the parole service uh, going to engage in training the police in the use of the electronic monitoring or how how will um, that happen so the electronic monitoring is very similar well it's it's the same as the dve it's the same it's so we have around 1200 people in the community at the moment on electronic monitoring so yep. it'll be the same device operated by um, our, our same staff mm -hmm. so someone on bail who is on electronic monitoring they will have schedules around them which will um, either come out of an ADVO or they'll be a bail condition and that yep. may be a particular address mm -hmm an area, an LGA that that um, person is excluded from, or a type of location, like a school. Yep. So if a person on bail breaches those exclusions, our staff will report that to police, and then it's over to the police to respond. So okay. they may choose to respond, they may choose not respond, they may talk to a pin-op. Um, the obligation of corrections under the bail EM is to monitor people in terms of exclusion zones and yep. then report to So it'd be fairly police. similar to what's already in operation for community corrections? Similar, albeit breach, breach action mm. in yep. terms of bail is a police matter, whereas so for parole and... From that ESO. I understand that um, community corrections has had a lot of um, input 
into? Yes, so there's a, there's a bail monitoring implementation task force that's chaired by the Cabinet Office. Oh, good. So that's corrections good. are on that, police, legal aid, Aboriginal affairs, Boxar, Treasury, courts, DCJ legal and, and policies. So mm -hmm. it is a well-represented group and done some pretty good work in a pretty short period of time. So subject to trance two of the legislation passing the well, parliament. It's just going to be commenced. Yeah, early October. Commenced. Yeah. 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 It's passed, it's just got to be commenced. Okay. Yep. And so you've clarified that the electronic electronic monitoring devices will fall under corrections. Um Okay. And so who will, will it be community, see, sorry, I'm getting a corrective services that own and operate the equipment or is it Yeah, so a, the, a the, the equipment is, we have a private vendor that operates the um, equipment. There are, yeah, I mean, we own the equipment, but there, there, there's a contract in place. So it is the same equipment as I mentioned uh, a minute ago. So it is it is corrective services equipment the equipment is fitted by corrective services officers yep. um, and the journey that the task force went on so so people that are subject to bail em will um, be bail refused and then come to a corrections facility either a court location or a or a remand center corrections will fit, fit the, the monitoring device, device yep. mm -hmm. check that it's it's working and all the schedules are in place yep. and then that person will be released so it's it'll be a bail condition as soon as that condition's met they'll be released from custody and, and what do you think is the uh, like what's the average life of the em equipment electronic monitoring equipment, equipment? it needs to be charged every day oh, yeah, but no, in but terms of yeah i've not heard of one they, they you know they yeah. last for years they so last, okay okay hopefully no one's on bail that one no <laughs> um and on that, but but just a change of tact. Do you? Th what is the expected increase in the the, the um, remand population? Well, the bail population. So yeah, we. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So Boxer. Boxer have modelled it at around fifty one people. So in terms of our twelve hundred. How many? Sorry. Fifty one. Fifty one. So it's yeah. quite small in terms of we yeah. got twelve hundred people already monitoring. So the volume is not a large increase for us. So we've modelled it on 51 defendants and because 88 at any one time because people come on and off. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was really around getting the processes right rather than it being a huge volume issue yeah. for us. Yeah. And, and what do you think is the estimated cost of housing um, the bail uh, offenders? That's not an issue for us bail offenders are on bail so oh, sorry. Um, the ones that are that, that aren't subject to em but are oh on sorry the remandees <laughs> oh, so yeah i mentioned in my evidence earlier there's around 34 since the molly tyser's tragedy there's an additional 34 people come into custody we haven't actually done an exercise on how many of those actually um get bail um, further down the track, but mm -hmm. the cost of someone in custody, the the rolls, it's about three hundred dollars a night. And just just on that, on the um, detail of the numbers, uh, you need to distinguish between a change in the practice of the court uh, imposing uh, in someone being placed in custodial uh, remand, uh, which could be effectively the practice of the court as distinct from the application of the show course provision. Yep. So that they are two different numbers that, yeah. that lead to that high number. So yeah. the Secretary's point, the numbers went up to the level that I mentioned pretty much the next day after that event. Yep. The bail reform came in some point down the track yep. and it didn't then spike again. It just, it, it appeared the practice of the court changed and then the, the bail I was. think that is what the, um, and there's not, um, intricate science in what I'm saying, but yep. I think that is what we're seeing that the show cause uh, provision will, will kick in uh, and there will be an impact of that new provision. We would, we would expect, and it's what we saw after the, as I mentioned in this morning's evidence, in the Lynn Siege, we would expect the courts to go back effectively to, 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 where, to where they were, subject to the fact that the um, 
the processes of the courts will be will be different with bail, obviously with registrars being backed out of hearing those matters yeah. and them all being heard by magistrates. Okay. And um, with the machinery of government change, um, and now I think it was the 16th of August, the announcement, when do you expect, uh, I thought it said that there would be a new commissioner in place by the 1st of October, is that... No, they're, they're, so the, um, you're right with 1 October in that that is the date that uh, the, the change uh, happens with the standing up okay. of the All new right. uh, agency. Mm -hmm. There will be a, the, the recruitment uh, process, which is uh, a different process, will we'll, uh, we'll begin anew. Yep. Um, and obviously is, the Minister has been very clear uh, that it is a, a priority for that to uh, to, to proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and I might just go back to an earlier. Um, we were talking about uh, officers that are suspended, and you said that there were approximately 82 staff, um, four that weren't on full pay. The mm. rest were. Um, when a person is suspended. Are they told at the time of suspension um, the reason for the suspension? Not, not always. Not always. Um, not always. And at what time um, would an employee be advised of the reason? Well, that's subject to the process of the investigation. There's, there's not a. There's not a one answer to that. As the, I think the secretary said this morning, we, through the MOG corrections, becomes a standalone agency in the professional standards um, branch, remains in DCJ. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been a lot of work on what that model is, and one of the 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 criticisms is around the time frame that matters are taking to resolve so yep. there's additional resources that yep. will be in that model and also a streamlined process where mm -hmm. more serious matters head, head down one route and the the, um, the less serious matters head along a different path to deal with the issue that i think you're going to around the timeliness of um, resolving yeah. matters and that's an important feature of the new model i think the question was about the uh, advice at the time yep. uh, my answer to that would be that we would there would be transparency subject to any uh, exigencies of an investigation yep. that might be underway, uh, and ensure that 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 investigation, which may be a criminal or police investigation, not being compromised. Yeah. And some of the strong feedback from the PSA is around the timeliness of giving um, allegations yep. to a to someone on suspension okay. or even someone that's just subject to misconduct. So that's certainly a feature of the new model to mm -hmm. be more efficient in terms of putting matters to people. I might just mention, you asked this morning how many were without pay of that 82. It's five. Oh, five, okay. Um, so, the Leanne who, who is suspended um, back in the 23rd of October has indicated that she still doesn't, or hasn't been advised of a reason. Is that a long period of time? Yeah. Sounds a while, but look, I don't have an answer to that question. I, I might answer that yeah. on notice or on at notice? least talk yeah. to the. Okay, yeah. and when the person is is suspended, and are they allocated a support person, or do they um, ask for a support person? So, I mentioned the evidence this morning. There was a there's a support uh, group that sits within professional standards. I'll mm -hmm. just correct my evidence that that group now sits in a new director that we have, um, Cultural Support and Wellbeing. So yep. they're dedicated people that are not actually part of the group that are doing the investigation to kind of have that separation between the issue and the care for the person. So it's mm -hmm. that group that reach out proactively to, to you know, yeah. to, to and people that are in that situation. Is that group advised of... Um, 
what the why the person is suspended no, so no, that they can no, order. No, no, no. no. It's, okay. it's about the person's welfare. Yeah. Less of, yeah. Less, okay. Yeah. Less All about right. you know the circumstances that finds them where they are. And are you able to provide, probably would have to do this on notice, um, the number, like you said, there's 82. How many have been, say, three on suspension, three months or less, six months, nine months, sure, we can, 12 we, months? We can, yeah, we'll give you And 12 time months frame. or over. And what would be the longest time that um, an employee would be suspended while the matter's being I'll investigated? I'll answer that on notice. Yep. There are some of those, some people who are suspended that are subject to police matters yeah. that are protracted and it's out, those type of matters are often outside of the department's hands. So in the information we provide on notice, we may just put a comment where, yeah, where that circumstance exists. But yep. the time frames are an area that we're seeking to improve. Mm -hmm. And are you able also probably on notice to provide a dollar figure on the annual cost of, of you know, like while someone's on full pay, um, the, what, that, what, what that annual figure would be? Yeah, we'll so we, on yeah, notice. We'll, so yeah. we can provide a notice, sure. And also, um, whilst those positions are temporarily backfilled, the person would be acting up in that role? Yeah, well, that's part of a cost, like any okay. absence from yep. the workplace for any reason. You, you backfill and it ends up, you know, there's a chain reaction and it does add a cost. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. And I have try and get you a good question now. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you're able to provide uh, an overview of the overall funding that Corrections provides in the form of grants to the community to deliver services to people leaving custody. Sure. So, look, there's a lot of work in that space that Community Corrections do, so that's just part of Community Corrections kind of business as usual work so that's not a not a figure that um, um, necessarily exists but our our funded partnership initiative is the area that we connect well we engage the non-government sector mm -hmm. so um, that is 8.6 million a year and we've got 13 agreements with 12 NGOs to provide the type of support that you mentioned in your question okay thank you Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go to two last things in the last few minutes I've got. One is about where we are in terms of ID and that very important issue around digital ID. And the second issue I really wanted to address and ask your views around is food. I am receiving an unbelievable amount of correspondence from inmates that are really, really more than displeased with the food, like really concerning letters about... Do you want to do ID? Um, I'd love to do ID. You know, and not feel, I don't food. Okay. Talk about food. Seriously, though, the <laughs> food stuff is like, how, you know, how many, how many cases of bowel cancer are we dealing with and what sort of food systems are we providing to the, some of the most vulnerable people in the whole state. There's, I, the letters I've got, some of them are really awful in terms of what people are experiencing. And I just want to see what your view is and where that sure. is on the radar. Can I, can if I you want to do ID, ID first, I, I, I first. Do thank you. Yeah, gather your thoughts and I thank will you. talk about ID yeah. briefly. So ID, as we know, digital, digital ID, uh, as you know, Miss Dickinson, mm. in terms of uh, the things that on that home stretch yep. uh, out out the gate uh, it's make it or break accommodation it, isn't it? therapy yeah. accessing a mobile phone uh, benefits the lot ID is crucial uh, we've had for uh, around two years work 
underway and, uh, and it has been difficult work but excellent uh, collaboration uh, within government between uh, transport and uh, Secretary Head's uh, department, mm -hmm. although we're at a point now where we had a number of this a very significant um, so it's gone well, although the number is not as large as I would want. We've had um, about 300 prisoners released, issued with uh, digital IDs over that period. We're at a point now where we need to make a decision about investment in terms of infrastructure, which is uh, with a recurrent component as well. The Acting Commissioner and I are talking about ways of uh, expediting that and then there, there'll be more coordination work to be done with other uh, agencies whenever I've spoken to my, my uh, colleague secretaries there's been very instant buy-in and support but um, I think at, at next, at next estimates uh, I was just going to say next I, estimates Mr Tipple I, oh. I will hopefully be able to talk about the permanent uh, structure that we're putting yep. Uh, around this because it's been it's been highly effective but it now move, needs to move to, to larger scale we use kiosks we have various workarounds which have been effective but we now need to to move to a permanent system there are some decisions which the acting commissioner and I are talking about uh, but we'll be able to report on that and it is something if we are really going to uh, with if we're going to uh, assist offenders as I say to, to walk out that gate with the connections in place so that they don't unnecessarily circle back. Digital ID mm. is um, vital for the future mm. and there is a plan developing to make sure that it is scaled now to mm. stretch across um, 34 prisons across the state. Thank you. And food? So food, <laughs> there is a, the Corrections Food Services Working Party is the group that mm. Uh, oversights uh, the meal production and nutrition within prisons. So, so we we serve and deliver 14 million meals a year. So yep. it is at some scale. So that group's chaired by an assistant commissioner. We have um, justice healther on there, dietitians, we have environmental health officers because it also looks after water treatment at a number of our our facilities. Official visitor is on there. Chaplains are on there and there's a whole range of people and they're responsible for the manual control plan that exists across um, corrections. So that is reviewed every two years against the Australian Dietary Guidelines and it's just getting updated as we speak and there's items that go on and items that, that go off and that review has just happened and I'm happy to provide on notice. It's mm. a quite impressive kind of menu. Yep. It'll be the, the one that's about to be superseded but just to give you an idea of what prison nutrition looks like. So they've just been through that. It involves an inmate survey as well. So there's some things, you know, cottage pies coming off and chili con carnes coming on and Mexican beefs off. And so, and I walk around with inmates and, you know, they complain about this meal and they say, this one's good. And when I sat on that working group and just to really get into detail, you know, that, that group, um, are really focused on getting omega threes into inmate diets, particularly for you know violent offenders. That's an important thing. So we were delivering a lot of tuna, tuna salad, and those types of things. Which, just because we were putting on the menu control plan, by the time they got to the inmates, they were sloppy and inedible. Mm. And so we were producing lots of food that was was going in the bin. So we've been focused on quality of meals, and ultimately delivering meals that are quality, not just quality. Then we make them when we deliver mm. deliver them. So there's a lot of work happening. I'd be really interested in what's coming mm. through your office mm. coming to me because yes. if I'm getting one story and mm. you know there's a different story, I'm I'm keen to understand it because there's been a lot of work go on in the food space to increase quality. We've changed the packaging, we've changed how we produce food, how we distribute it, and the area that we're heading into now is choice. So on the tablets. Um, one area, so Circo are ahead of the state in terms mm. of meals. So mm. up at Clarence, inmates on their tablets can choose their diet two weeks ahead. Um, and in the state at the moment, you can't do that. But ultimately, we, we should end up with a system where from a selected menu, inmates can 
choose um, their nutrition for you know the, the week or, or two weeks ahead. We're doing more self-catering options as well, particularly people in uh, residential settings, in, in open custody, can kind of um, make their own meals as a group. That's happening in Clarence as well, and it's also happening in a number of, of, of state facilities. So that's all part of the work that's been happening on nutrition as well, because um, what I don't want to have is, we, we spend a lot of money on food, mm. And, you know, I get reports that inmates are using their buy-up for their base nutrition. Mm -hmm. You know, buy-up should be the things on top of the base nu nutrition that the state provides. So that's why the focus has been really making sure that we improve the quality of meals. We've reduced the size of, of, of meals. We were, some of our meals were over 700 grams, which um, we were paying for, mm -hmm. and was outside of the Australian Dietary Guidelines. So we very much, we've automated some of our processes in terms of weighing meals. We now have a clear cover rather than a cardboard cover, so that we can provide inmates, you know, quality rather than quantity necessarily, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, make sure that the, the money that we're investing in meals is going to nutrition and not being thrown out, and then families are, you know, ultimately funding inmates' nutrition through buyout. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the opposition. Yep. Mm -hmm. right, can I just, um, sorry, clarify on the question on notice with regard to the dollar figure for people on suspension, are you able to do a breakdown of, say, what the highest salary is? Not not every single person, but just say what the highest and the and the lowest would be? And the ban the bands. Yeah, we'll... Yeah, we'll think. Yeah, we'll do something like that. Yeah. So we can't necessarily. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll work out. And on. I was just wondering um, whether, like, for best practice for for correctional um, policies, do you ever sort of look outside Australia, say maybe the Netherlands or Scandinavian countries, which have a much lower rate of recidivism? Really, I can't even say the word <laughs> at this time of the afternoon. <laughs> And which prepare people to become good neighbours when they leave? Yeah, the Nordic countries certainly, certainly are quite progressive in their mm. correctional systems. They are. Yeah. So, Let's um, be like them. Yeah, yeah. so we, we spend a lot of time looking within uh, Australia and New Zealand. We yeah. look at the US less and we look at um, kind yeah. of Europe, Excellent. particularly you know, the Nordic countries. Okay. I don't know whether Jen, you have mm. seen any space looking there, but... And yeah, okay. Just one more on notice. Um, are you, can you provide data on how many people leaving prison each year are able to receive post-release services that are run by community sector organisations, and also how many people leaving prison are released into homelessness? We'll provide on notice. The data. Yep. Yeah, whatever data we have that's still. Yep. That is, yeah. We're happy to agree to do our best. That's that's a challenging yep. okay. task, <laughs> and to do it with our curacy is going to be challenging. Yeah. No, no, yeah, we, I, the Australian Housing Urban Research Report 2022, 54% of inmates exiting custody expect to be homeless on release. So we do a lot of work beforehand and we've yeah, got time now that sits in, yeah. in, um, mm. in, in June's area around, we've got a new homelessness action plan that's yeah. been worked on because that challenge is not lost on us and yeah. the, the challenge of housing is one in all parts of the community that affects inmates yeah. more than you know most of the public. Thank you. Ms McPhee, I had a question about the uh, New South Wales Space Industry Development Strategy. It was reported in the media that the government was planning to review this. Is that happening? So um, the Space Industry Development Strategy, which was released in 2020, um, remains ongoing and hasn't, to my knowledge, been reviewed or replaced. So we continue to progress some initiatives under that strategy. Okay, so there's no plans to um, override that strategy? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a question to Mr Head. Is there a deliberate policy of hiring generalists in the public service currently? Not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, that would be a question for the Public Service Commissioner, but we hire specialists for specialist roles, we hire generalists for generalist roles. Uh, since 
Maybe I, think I should. 2012, there's been a capability based framework as the basis for recruitment in the public sector. So each role has a set of capabilities that might include specialist capabilities depending on the nature of the role. So if I can just finally um, ask perhaps Ms McPhee to put on notice the number of generalists in Investment New South Wales currently. I'm, I'm happy to take that question or notice, although obviously many of our staff have varied and myriad different skills and experiences mm. I suppose, rather um, than technical qualifications. Yeah, I suppose if there is a clause in the contract that stipulates that that person is allowed to be essentially redeployed anywhere across government. So that is a standard clause in the senior sector so employment. So every person senior has that? Employment. When the former government introduced the Government Sector Employment Act in 2013, one of the major provisions of that was around mobility and people being able to be assigned to roles for which they have uh, the relevant capabilities. So mobility, but it also allows for specialist recruitment. So everything depends on the set of capabilities required. Okay, so that remains the case now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any government questions? Oh, I'd like to ask if there's any matters anyone would like to clarify before we finish. And I won't put anything no. on that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Look, before we finalise the hearing today, I'd like to make a short statement about a reference containing personal information regarding Ms Kelly Lane, made immediately, immediately before the lunch adjournment today. After the hearing, the committee will be considering a request for redaction or expungement of this reference. I therefore urge members of the media and the public to refer to the published transcript before repeating or republishing this evidence. Um, and I thank as well our government officers for their attendance today and all their information and their time. Um, the committee secretariat will be in touch um, in the near future about any questions that were taken on notice um, or any supplementary questions. And thank you all for your amazing work and thank you for attending today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.